Everyone stay silent. Good morning and welcome to the 173rd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Mike Kaczynski and I will be helping facilitating today's meeting along with my colleagues and our guests. Uh, please note this is a live public meeting, so we will be we will be addressing any technical questions or any issues throughout the meeting. And if anything does occur, we will make a momentarily stop to make sure that this meeting uh, goes forth uh, successfully. But that being said, um, I'd like to hand the meeting over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Atreya. Uh, Dr. Atreya, if you are ready, let's have you take it away. Mike, I think uh, you need to give it to Dr. Ma Manto. Oh, my apologies. All right. So oh, let's wait. I'm going to bring both of you up here. And Dr. Manto, if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. There we go. Here I am. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to the 173rd meeting of the Vaccines Related Biological Products Advisory Committee of the FDA. Today, we are called into session to discuss one topic, emergency use authorization requested by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older. Uh, I'd like to welcome the members, the uh, temporary voting members, including uh, our new temporary voting members, uh, and uh, the interested public to this meeting. We're going to have a long and very interesting day as we move to our voting questions, which will be acted on at the end of the day. Uh, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our designated federal officer, Prabha Atreya, who will be making further introductions and handle some of our housekeeping issues. Over to you, Prabha. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Prabha Atreya, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer, that is DFO, for today's 173rd Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the Vaccines Advisory Committee, I am very happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss the emergency use authorization UA request by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on May 31, 2022. At this time, I would like to introduce and acknowledge the excellent contributions of the staff and the great team I have in my division in preparing for today's meeting. Ms. Christina Wirt is my co-DFO, providing excellent support in all aspects of preparing for and conducting the meeting. Other staff who contributed significantly are Dr. Susan Pedar, Ms. Joanne Lipkind, Ms. Karen Thomas, and Ms. Lisa Wheeler, who also provided excellent support. I also would like to express our sincere appreciation and gratitude to Mr. Mike Kazinski in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FTA staff working very hard behind the scenes, trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one, like all the previous Vaccines Advisory Committee meetings on the COVID topics. Please contact or direct any press or media-related questions for today's meeting to the FDA's Office of Media Affairs at FDAOMA, one word, at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionist for today's meeting is Ms. Linda Giles. And we will also begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and the temporary members. When it is your turn, please turn on your camera and unmute your phone and then state your first and last name. And then when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next person. Please see the member roster slide in which we will begin with the chair, Dr. Arnold Manto. Dr. Manto, can we please start with you? 
Yes, thank you, Prabha. Uh, I'm Arnold Monto. I'm at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where over many years I've been working on the prevention and control of respiratory uh, agents, influenza, in particular lately until the coronaviruses came. And uh, we've been looking at those over many years, and so now our attention is directed towards these agents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monte. Next is Dr. Paula Annunziato. Good morning. My name is Paula Annunziato. I lead Vaccines Global Clinical Development at Merck, and I'm here today as the non-voting industry representative. Thank you. Next is Dr. Adam Berger. Hi, I'm Adam Berger. I'm at the National Institutes of Health. I'm a director of clinical and healthcare research policy here. Uh, I oversee all of our human subject protections and clinical trial policies. Uh, I'm a geneticist by training. Thanks. Thank you. Next, Dr. Uh, Hank Benstein. We can't hear you, Dr. Benstein. Good morning. My name is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Hofstra Northwell. I'm a general pediatrician with a special interest in vaccines. Thank you. Next, Dr. Archana Chatterjee. Good morning. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I'm the Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Northern Franklin University in North Chicago. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist uh, specializing in the area of vaccines. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Captain Amanda Cohn. Go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Dr. Amanda Cohn. I'm a pediatrician and an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. Next, Dr. Captain David Kim. Good morning. This is David Kim with the Division of Vaccines in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy uh, in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Paul Offit. Um, good morning. My name is Paul Oppitt. I'm an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and my interest is in the area of vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Steve Fogum. Dr. Hutchinson. Fogum? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm this is Steve Pergam. I'm a professor at um, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and focus on adult infectious diseases, uh, specifically in the immunocompromised host. Thank you. Next up, Dr. Jay Portnoy, our consumer representative. Mike, is he available? If not, we'll move on to Dr. Eric Rubin. Morning, Prabha. Um, I'm Eric Rubin. I'm at Harvard, uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you. Next, we will do the roll call for our temporary voting members. Dr. Fuller. Good morning. I'm Avita Fuller. I'm Dr. Avita Fuller. I'm at the University of Michigan African Studies Center and Department of Microbiology and Immunology. I'm a virologist by training, and I do implementation science in the community. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. Next is Dr. Bruce Gillen. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Bruce Gillen. I'm currently the Chief of Global Public Health Strategies at the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm, I'm honored to be back to, as, a, as a temporary member of the committee. For 15 years, I was the director of what was then called the National Vaccine Program Office at HHS. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gillian. The next one is Dr. Janet Lee. 
Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeanette Lee. I'm a professor of biostatistics and a member of the Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. My area is uh, multi-center clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Alfred Levy. Hi, good morning. My name is Ofer Levy. I'm a physician scientist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, uh, and I direct uh, the Precision Vaccines Program, which uh, conducts research by applying precision medicine concepts to vaccinology. Thank you. Dr. Marasco, Wayne Marasco. We can't hear you, Dr. Marasco. Sorry, wrong button. Um, I'm Wayne Marasco, professor of medicine at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard Medical School. Um, I study uh, antiviral antibody immunity to vaccines and uh, natural infection. Thank you. Next, Dr. Pamela Mechanist. We can't hear you, Dr. McInnes. Good morning, Dr. Pamela There we go. Uh, retired Deputy Director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Good morning. Thank you. Next, Dr. Cody Meisner. Thank you, uh, Prabha. Good morning. My name is Cody Meissner. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. Uh, I specialize in infectious disease. And as has been announced, Tufts uh, will soon close the children's hospital at the end of this month, and I will have a new uh, professional address. But I, I want to state that I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the VERPAC meeting this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meister. Next is Dr. Michael Nelson. I am Mike Nelson. I'm president of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology, and I'm chief of the Division of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology at the University of Virginia. I'm an allergist immunologist, as you might guess, well, with special expertise in vaccine adverse events and immune response. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Stanley Perlman. I'm, yes, I'm Dr. Stanley Perlman. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology and of pediatrics and a pediatric infectious diseases specialist, and I've been working with coronaviruses here at the University of Iowa for 40 years. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Art Rainbold. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Art Ryan Gold. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Thank you. Next is Dr. Mark Sawyer. Sure, you have your Thank phone you. muted. Yes. You have your own phone muted. Trying once again, this is Dr. Mark Sawyer. I'm a professor of pediatric infectious disease at the University of California, San Diego, and my expertise is in the public health aspects of vaccines. Thank you. Last but not least, Dr. Melinda Watson. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm an adult infectious disease physician by training, and I currently work as Associate Director for Vaccine Policy at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Great, thank you. So uh, overall, we have 23 participants in the meeting today, uh, 22 voting members and one non-voting member, and uh, we have great expertise around the table. Thank you so much, uh, and I will now proceed with the reading of the conflicts of interest statement for the public record. Thank you. Hold on for a second.
The Foreign Drug Administration, FDA, is convening virtually today, June 7, 2022, the 173rd meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VERPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA, of 1972. Dr. Arnold Manto is serving as the acting voting chair for today's meeting. Today, on June 7, 2022, the committee will meet in open session to discuss emergency use authorization requests by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties. With the exception of the industry representative members, outstanding and temporary voting members of the WEPAC are appointed special government employees, FGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies, and are subjected to federal conflicts of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with the federal ethics and conflicts of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 U.S. Code Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE and FGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purpose of US 18 Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investment, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements or credits, teaching, speaking, writing assignments, or patents and royalties, and also their primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and concept of interest laws. Under the 18 U.S. Code, Section 208, Congress has authorized the FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and as regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interest involved or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there have been no conflicts of interest waivers issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members. Dr. Ovita Fuller, Dr. Bruce Gillin, Dr. Janet Lee, Dr. Ofer Levy, Dr. Wayne Marasco, Dr. Cody Meissner, Dr. Pamela McInnes, Dr. Michael Nelson, Dr. Stanley Perlman, Dr. Art Reingold, Dr. Mark Sawyer, and Dr. Melinda Wharton. Paula, Dr. Paula Ananziata of Merck will serve as the industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee only. Industry representatives act on behalf of all the regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as the consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. The guest speakers for today's meeting are the following. Dr. Heather Scoby, Deputy lead, uh, Team Lead, Surveillance and Analytics, Epidemiology Task Force, COVID Emergency 19 Emergency Response Team at CDC Atlanta. Dr. Uh, and Captain Tom Shimabukuro uh, is also Director in the Immunization Safety Office as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. They are the uh, guest speakers for today. 
Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers and guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that they may have with any affected firms and products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind the standing and temporary members of the committee that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FTA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from the discussions and their exclusions will be noted for the record. This concludes the uh, reading of my conflicts of the interstatement for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. Arnold Manto. Thank you very much. And Dr. Manto, take it away. Thank you very much, Prabha. Uh, first, we're going to hear from uh, the director of Seabird, uh, uh, Dr. Marks. Uh, take it away, Dr. Marks. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to uh, w welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, VRPAC meeting. Uh, I'm not going to say very much right now except to uh, welcome everyone. Um, and this is our, our first meeting of a, a series of several this month uh, to take up some important topics. Um, we'll look forward uh, to working through these meetings. Uh, we believe that uh, we have done a fair amount of work uh, to solve some of the technical glitches that have uh, essentially uh, uh, haggled us in the past when we've had these meetings, um, and they hopefully will not be an issue today, um, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully uh, have a, a, a very good meeting today. Um, I really look forward uh, to and thank uh, our advisors uh, for their engagement and uh, for our staff's hard work for uh, preparing for the meeting. Um, and for everyone's participation today. So I will turn it back over to Dr. Monto. Thanks, uh, Dr. Marks. First, we're going to be going to hear some presentations from CDC, which will serve as background for our further deliberations. First, we hear uh, from Dr. Heather Scobie, who is going to talk about the current epidemiology of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccination rates in the United States. Dr. Scobie. Dr. Mancho, I think we need to uh, allow Dr. Sain to speak from FDA before we... Oh, get to excuse me. I've jumped, I've jumped ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Prabha. Uh, we speak now, we hear next from... Uh, Dr. Sen, she, uh, Dr. Sen was, uh, is going to be telling us why we're here <laughs> and the rules for emergency use authorization. My apologies, Dr. Sen. Uh, good morning, Dr. Monto, and good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, the committee members uh, for your time to convene here this morning uh, to discuss Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted request for emergency use authorization. My name is Gautam Sen. Um, I am from Office of Vaccine at CIVAR FDA. Uh, I'll give you an overview of, of the product and today's agenda. Uh, here is my outline. Uh, I'll discuss about uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, then I'll discuss about Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted and their EUA request for immunization as a primary series, two doses, three weeks apart, considerations for EUA of a COVID-19 vaccine, COVID-19 vaccines available for use in the U.S., overview of today's agenda, voting questions for the committee. Since the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has caused over half a billion confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide, including over 6 million deaths. In the United States, SARS-CoV-2 has caused over 84 million reported COVID-19 cases and over 1 million deaths. Charges in SARS-CoV-2 transmission and COVID-19 cases 
hospitalization, and death have been associated with emergence of SARS-CoV-2 variants, for example, beta, delta, and more recently, the Omicron, that are more infectious, more virulent, and are more resistant to natural or vaccine-elicited immunity than the prototype strain. Each 0.5 ml dose of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted contains 5 microgram of recombinant viral spike protein from SARS-CoV-2-1 strain expressed in SF9 cells co-formulated with Novavax uh, saponin-based matrix and adjuvant 50 microgram. Proposed use under the UA is active immunization to prevent COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 in individuals 18 years of age and older. The dosing regimen is a two series of two doses, 0.5 ml each, administered intramuscularly three weeks apart. Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, also referred to as nvx scope 2373 during clinical development. On February 1st, 2022, IDA received Novavax request for emergency use authorization of their COVID-19 vaccine. EUA of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted would depend on clinical data to inform benefits and risks, manufacturing and product information to ensure the vaccine's quality and consistency. The manufacturing process for Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted has changed over time, and submission to FDA of complete manufacturing and product information to support the vaccine product intended for use under EUA is ongoing. Novavax EUA request clinical package uh, includes safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy data from a phase three study Protocol 2019-NCOV-301 conducted in the U.S. and Mexico with approximately 30,000 participants. FDA will be able to determine comparability of the vaccine product evaluated in this study to the vaccine product intended for use under EUA. Novavax clinical package also includes uh, safety data uh, from approximately 10,000 subjects who received Novavax COVID-19 vaccine across three clinical studies worldwide. Uh, a phase three study, uh, 302, conducted in United Kingdom, a phase two study, 501, which was conducted in South Africa, and a phase one study, 101, conducted in Australia and US. Available manufacturing and product information does not allow for a determination of comparability between the vaccine product used in these three studies and the vaccine product intended for use under EUA. Therefore, FDA's review of these studies was limited to safety evaluation. We would request the committee members to focus the application's uh, clinical package only. Criteria for emergency use authorization, uh, FDA may issue an emergency use authorization of an unapproved medical product following an EUA declaration if the following statutory requirements are met. The agent referred to in the EUA declaration can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. The medical product may be effective to prevent, diagnose, or treat the serious or life-threatening condition caused by the agent. The known and potential benefits of the product outweigh the known and potential risk of the product. There is no adequate, approved, and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or treating the disease or condition. Currently, there are three COVID-19 vaccines available in the U.S. for use in individuals 18 years of age and older. Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine, a mRNA vaccine licensed as Comirnaty. Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine, another mRNA vaccine licensed as Spikevac. 
Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine, not licensed, but available under EUA. Use of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine is limited to individuals for whom other FDA-approved uh, or authorized COVID-19 vaccines are not accessible or clinically appropriate, and individuals who elect to receive the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine because they would otherwise not receive a COVID-19 vaccine. So here is uh, today's agenda. Uh, after my introduction, uh, Dr. Heather Scobie from CDC will give you an overview of current epidemiology of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine-related rates in the United States, followed by Dr. Tom Simabukoro from CDC will give you an overview of COVID-19 vaccine-associated myocarditis, followed by sponsor's presentation, emergency use authorization request by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older. There will be a short break, followed by Dr. Lucia Lee, the lead medical officer from Office of Vaccine at CIBAR FDA, who will present FDA's review of effectiveness and safety of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted in individuals 18 years of age and older. There will be a 45 minutes lunch break, followed by open public hearing. There will be a short break, and then additional question and answering session regarding the sponsor and FDA's presentation, followed by committee's discussion and voting, and then meeting will be adjourned. So here is the voting question for the committee. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, do the benefits of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine adjuvanted when administered as a two-dose primary series outweigh its risk for use in individuals 18 years of age and older under EUA? Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, you've given us a good overview of the entire day's proceedings. We have a few minutes now, uh, and uh, if the committee has any questions about the guidance, uh, about EUAs and the rationale for emergency use authorization, uh, you can raise your hands now. Okay, Dr. Dr. Rubin, is that your hand raised? I'm not seeing it in green here, but uh Yeah, that that's that's me, Dr. Okay. Um go uh, ahead. I, I know that it isn't our um our mission to interpret statute, but I am curious about the EUA um justification. As you stated, uh Dr. San, there are um, three, two approved and one authorized vaccine out there. So I'm curious as to how this meets the criteria for uh, a, a, a product that it, for which there is a necessity given the existing uh, products. Um, Dr. Marks, um, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, or Dr. Oh. Fink can. Uh, I'm trying to get my camera on here. There we go. Um, th th thanks very much for that question, uh, Dr. Rubin. Um, you know, the, the statute uh, says uh, it, it allows us some leeway uh, because it gives us the ability to look uh, to have products that are either um, uh, they, they would fulfill some unmet need. Um, uh, and in this particular case, um, there, although we have mRNA vaccines uh, out there, we have the Janssen vaccine out there. Uh, the uh, Janssen vaccine is currently uh, uh, not uh, being used as a frontline uh, vaccine th the same way as the mRNA vaccines, which leaves uh, the uh, issue of vaccines for those who might not want to take an mRNA vaccine because of concerns they might have with an mRNA vaccine. Uh, uh, as uh, needing potentially an alternative, having uh, a protein-based uh, uh, alternative 
may be more comfortable for some um, uh, in, in terms of their acceptance of vaccine. And I will use this as a moment on the bully pulpit to say that we do have a problem with vaccine uptake that is very serious in the United States. Um, and, and anything we can do to get people more comfortable to be able to accept these potentially life-saving medical products is something that we feel um, we uh, are compelled to do. Does, does that answer your question? That does. That's, that's uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Thank you, Dr. Le Levy. Hello. Um, thank you for that helpful introduction. If I understood correctly, there have been some concerns with the manufacture of the protein that is the basis of this Novavax vaccine. And for that reason, some of the data from some of the other uh, international studies uh, will not be considered with regards to vaccine efficacy and immunogenicity today. Uh, my question is this. Could FDA say a few words about what the of that manufacturing problem was, and also are we as a committee to assume that these issues are completely solved now and that the, the latest version of the way the protein is manufactured uh, will not lead to any manufacturing problem? Dr. Sen, I don't know if you would like to answer those questions now or wait until later on because they are uh, uh, about the substance. So it's your choice. Uh, no, Dr. Mando, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we will discuss that uh, during question and answer session. Um, uh, we can we can discuss a little more uh, about that. So I'll pass it on now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gallen. We can't hear you. Muted. Yeah. Yeah, you're muted, sir, right. on your phone. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Sorry. So um, about about dosing, we're, we're asked to review the the safety and efficacy of a two-dose schedule. If you wind back the clock, that's how this all began. And we learned subsequently that two doses was not really the full, the full need. And then with this confusion about what's a booster versus a third dose. Maybe we're likely to get into this later, but... But how, what, are we, what are we going to be doing about two, more than, more than a, a second dose? And then a related piece is that this is entering a marketplace with other vaccines. And it, while there may be some who have been waiting for this as their, as their only vaccination, there are others who might want to think about how they optimize their own immunity with mixing, matching with other things. So hopefully we can hear something and learn something about that. Thank you. Again, uh, it's up to you whether you want to answer these questions now or later. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Mondo, uh, Novavax has submitted um, um, the booster dose data. Um, and once we uh, complete this primary series, um, FDA is going to review those data and we will discuss that in future. Finally, Dr. Marasco, a very short question. We're run out of time. Yes, um, it's a real question to Dr. Marks and uh, Sieber, really. It's a follow-up to Dr. Rubin's question. So this vaccine that we're going to hear about today is adjuvanted, and, I, and I'm curious uh, in terms of uh, Sieber, have you guys really, you know, you know considered, um, you know, what the public is hearing and seeing, which is waning immunity, and is there – any emphasis in this particular vaccine on the fact that it's adjuvanted and, and um, may change the durability of the uh, of the response. Dr. Marks. <laughs> yeah, no, th thanks for that question. I think that'll be something for the committee to discuss today. And I think the sponsor may be uh, uh, presenting some information on that as well. Um, uh, there's the issue of durability of uh, re response, as well as the breadth of protection, which I think are both things um, uh, that will be open for discussion. Thank you all. Uh, 
We've heard some questions uh, which we need to park, and uh, we can bring these up later on as we get into discussions of the substance uh, that we're going to be handling today. Uh, now let's get back to the background, which I try out, which I jumped to before, and I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Scobie. Dr. Scobie, tell us about uh, COVID vaccination rates in the United States. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Great. The Omicron variant has been shown to have increased transmissibility but decreased severity relative to previous lineages. Omicron has many mutations in the spike gene, including 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain, as shown in the picture on the right. These mutations are associated with a reduction in the efficacy of some monoclonal antibody treatments and a reduction in neutralization by sera from vaccinated or convalescent individuals. individuals. This is a graph of the number of SARS-CoV-2 sequences submitted globally to the GIS-AID public genomic data repository since Omicron was first detected at the end of November 2021. The blue color shows the Delta variant being displaced as the Omicron BA1 sublineages in salmon color quickly rose to predominance, followed by the rise of the Omicron BA2 sublineages in peach. The other Omicron sub, some line, the sublineages like BA4 and BA5 are not readily apparent in the figure because they are still a relatively low proportion of submitted sequences. The total number of submitted sequences globally has shown a declining trend since January of 2022. This stacked bar shows recent U.S. trends in the national weighted estimates of variant proportions and now cast projections of circulating SARS-CoV-2 lineages by week of specimen collection date from CDC's COVID data tracker. Omicron sublineages depicted in different purple and pink shades have been over 99% predominant since late January. The BA1.1 sublineage in dark purple was gradually displaced by the BA2 sublineage shown in lavender and more recently the BA2.12.1 sublineage in pink, which was 59% of circulating lineages as of the week ending May 28th. BA4 and BA5 are not shown in this graph because they were less than 1% for this period, but these sublineages will be shown in the variant proportion estimates released later today. This map shows the relative proportions of BA2.12.1 in pink, BA2 in lavender, and other Omicron sublineages in the darker purple shade across the 10 Health and Human Services subregions. You can see that BA2.12.1 is at least 50% predominant in all regions, except Region 10 in the Northwest. This graph shows the trends in daily numbers of COVID-19 cases reported in the, in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic. The number of cases associated with the Alpha variant were relatively small compared with the Delta variant and then the Omicron variant. Nationally reported cases show increasing trends in April and uh, May, though this trend may be starting to turn in the last week or so. Reported cases still remain relatively high. I note that the number of reported cases is likely underestimated due to the increased use of at-home tests whose reports are mostly unreported uh, to public health departments. As of June 5th, there have been over 84 million cases of COVID-19 reported in the U.S. This is a graph from a recent MMWR on CDC's National Commercial Laboratory Seroprevalence Study and shows trends in infection-induced SARS-CoV-2 antibodies by age group. These results do not include anti-spike antibodies from vaccination, nor do they reflect the percentage of the population that might have sufficient antibodies to be protected from reinfection. 
The percentages of people with previous infection noticeably increased following the rest of the Omicron variant. Greater seroprevalence was noted in younger age groups, likely related to these groups being eligible for vaccination in later months and different exposure risks compared to older age groups. National seroprevalence during February 2022 was 58%. This graph shows the trends in the daily number of reported COVID-19 deaths in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic, including during the waves associated with the Alpha, Delta, and Omicron variants. Even though the Omicron infection is less severe overall relative to Delta, the number of deaths related to Omicron was relatively high because Omicron case numbers were very high. As of June 4th, there have been over 1 million deaths due to COVID-19 reported cumulatively in the U.S. These are the weekly trends in COVID-19 associated mortality rates by age group. The data show that higher mortality rates are consistently observed in older age groups, most notably on this graph among ages 75 plus, 65 to 74, and 50 to 64, as shown in the purple and pink colors. These are the weekly trends in the rates of new COVID-19 inpatient admissions by age group. Similar to the previous graph, you can see higher hospitalization rates in the older age groups, with patients 70 plus in purple, 65 to 74, and 50 to 64 years in the pink colors having the highest admissions rates, followed by other adult age groups in shades of blue. As of June 2nd, more than 221 million people in the U.S. have been vaccinated with a primary vaccine series, which is 71% of the eligible population aged five years and older. There are also over 103 million people, or 49% of the population aged 12 years or older, who have also received the first booster dose. And about 15 million people, or 23% of the population aged 50 years and older, who have also received a second booster dose. This graph shows trends over time and by age group and the percentage of people who have received at least a primary series on the left and a boost booster dose on the right. In both figures, vaccination coverage is higher in older age groups, indicated in the purple and pink colors. We can also see that coverage with the primary series for ages five to 11 years shown with yellow on the dotted line, a yellow dotted line on the left, is still relatively low at 29%. Booster dose coverage on the right remains under 50% for age groups less than 50 years, shown in blues and yellows. From data reported to COVID Data Tracker, over 230 million or 89% of U.S. adults ages 18 years and older have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose. Using these data and census data, we can estimate that uh, there are about 27 million adults who have not yet received a vaccine at this time. I'll also note that most adults aged 65 years and older have already received at least one COVID vaccine dose. This is data from the National Immunization Survey on adults who have not yet received a COVID-19 vaccine by age group, race, and ethnicity. Across the age groups, <clears throat> we can see that people of non-Hispanic, other or multiple races, and non-Hispanic white people have the highest percentages remaining unvaccinated, while Hispanic and non-Hispanic black people have, lowest have the lowest percentages remaining unvaccinated. Next, we're going to shift <clears throat> to consider <clears throat> surveillance monitoring of rates of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by vaccination status. CDC collaborates with 31 public health jurisdictions, representing 70% of the U.S. population. These jurisdictions actively link case surveillance, immunization registry, and vital registration data to monitor rates of COVID-19 cases and deaths by vaccination status. CDC also tracks rates of COVID-19 hospitalizations by vaccination status using COVID, COVID-Net. 
which is a population-based sentinel surveillance system in 99 counties and 14 states, representing 10% of the U.S. population. In addition, CDC's vaccine effectiveness studies allow for more robust analyses as compared with surveillance and a better understanding of how well vaccines are working. We also have detailed data on serious illnesses in vaccinated persons through COVID-NAT, as well as electronic health record and vaccine effectiveness platforms. This slide shows the age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 associated deaths by vaccination status and receipt of booster doses. Unvaccinated people in all age groups have had higher mortality rates than people who received a primary series alone and people who also received a booster dose, including after Omicron became the predominant variant. In March, unvaccinated people ages 12 years and older had 17 times the high uh, the risk of dying from COVID-19 compared with people vaccinated with a primary series and booster dose. This graph shows age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations by vaccination status and receipt of, boost of a booster dose. Hospitalizations for COVID-19 were higher among unvaccinated than vaccinated people over time, including after Omicron became the predominant variant. In March, Unvaccinated adults ages 18 years and older had five, five times higher risk of COVID-19 associated hospitalization compared to those fully vaccinated with a booster dose. This slide shows age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 cases by vaccination status. In April, unvaccinated people ages five years and older had a two times higher risk of testing positive for COVID-19 compared to fully vaccinated people overall. Various studies have shown that severe COVID-19 illness is relatively rare among vaccinated people compared with unvaccinated people. Compared with unvaccinated people, fully vaccinated people with severe COVID-19 illness are more likely to be older, be long-term care facility residents, and have underlying medical conditions, including immunosuppression, diabetes, and chronic kidney, lung, cardiovascular, and neurologic diseases. More than 75% of people who are fully vaccinated and get severe COVID-19 illness have multiple risk factors. In summary, CDC continues to monitor emerging variants like the BA2 sublineage of Omicron, including their prevalence and impact on disease incidence and severity over time. Monitoring trends and rates of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by vaccination status has been helpful for monitoring the impact of different variants. And finally, currently authorized vaccines offer protection against infection, severe illness, and death, so it's important to stay up to date with vaccinations, including receipt of first and second booster doses in eligible populations. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, those people for their contributions. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. We have a few minutes for questions specifically concerning the presentation about uh, where we are with COVID, with the variants, and uh, with vaccination. And uh, let's stick to those topics. Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Um, Commander Scobie, uh, my question is with regard to long COVID and whether you have any data to share with us um, on the impact of the vaccines on long COVID. No, unfortunately, I don't have data on that um, today, but I might ask, um, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Ruth Link Ellis, if she's on the line, um, if she has any data on, uh, from vaccine effectiveness studies or any other related data that she wants to share. Are you there, Dr. Link Ellis? I'm sorry, who are we looking for, My Heather? Ruth Link Dallas, do you see her on the line? Mike, can you uh, ask? No. 
Go ahead, Prabhu. Okay, yeah, but I, I think we'll we'll just move on. I'm sorry, Dr. Chatterjee, but uh, this will probably come up later again. Dr. Perlman. Yeah, I just had a question about one of the first figures that you showed. Um, the, the data showing the high mortality in 70 people over 75 with the Omicron. Uh, were those? Do you know if those people were vaccinated? Would this be justification for different vaccines, or were those people mostly unvaccinated? What do we? Or were they just people who had many, many comorbidities? Do we know about antibody titers in them? Trying to get a sense for how the Novavax vaccine could fit in this. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so the data I showed are actually surveillance data. So we don't have detailed information um, in, in that system on vaccination status. Um, uh, and we don't have like uh, titers like you um, were asking about. There are studies like vaccine effectiveness studies that would have um, more detailed information. And the data that I showed you um, on vaccine breakthrough surveillance, the rates of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by, by, um, by vaccination status, those data are collected by age group. And even in the older age groups, we do see um, a very large disparity in um, unvaccinated people um, having higher rates of, you know, uh, hospitalization and death, um, regardless of age group. So although it may be true that, um, as I was saying, that if you are older, um, old, of older age and you have underlying conditions and you happen to have a breakthrough infection, it may, you will be more likely to have a serious uh, event um, compared to people who don't have those risk factors. Um, it's still very much the case that um, adults are, um, adults and children alike are protected um, against um, serious illness with, the, with these vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Reingold. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks for that, Heather. Uh, Ryan Gold, quick question. So um, I, I know you, the, perhaps the most recent data you don't have quantified yet, but the eyeball test, looking at those graphs of rates of uh, either hospitalizations or deaths by vaccination status would suggest they're converging more recently and that the VE is in fact shrinking um, in the most recent time period. Uh, and I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that. So the eyeball test is challenging in this situation because um, the Omicron peak at the beginning of the year was so high, so it's really throwing um, the y-axis off, um, you know, it's, it's scaling everything down. And then in the data that I showed you on more serious outcomes, that was during a period of relatively low incidence in the U.S. So it's pretty hard to see um, what's going on in those graphs. Um, but um, it is true what you're saying that as different variants have come through, notably the Delta variant and then the Omicron variant, we have seen evidence in our rate data that suggests um, a, um, a decrease in vaccination effectiveness. Um, we don't choose to calculate vaccine effectiveness using those data because of our inability to control for other um, factors besides age. But um, it's definitely true what you're saying that um, vaccine effectiveness has been reduced related to different variants. I don't, Ruth Link Ellis, I don't know if you're able to connect her now, but she uh, was my. Um, expert that I had on about VE, if she wants to say more. Uh, well, let, let, let's, for technical reasons, I think it's very difficult to link other people on. Uh, so okay. let's go on. And uh, uh, at, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Gellin has his hand raised. Heather, thanks for that. Um, can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah. Two, 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 two things. You, you use the term fully vaccinated several times. We want to know how you define that. And maybe this is for later. When we think about uh, epidemiology of COVID infection, uh, will we be hearing either now or later background rates of myocarditis from natural infection? Thanks. We have a talk coming up, Bruce, on myocarditis. <clears throat> Yes, that's the next talk the, um, about myocarditis. Um, let's see. And fully vaccinated is a term that still exists um, that's defined as vaccinated with the primary series. Um, and it's cha challenging to understand, so we make um, attempts to not use it. But um, for whatever, it still exists in the literature and it still exists on my slides, so apologies for that. But it means fully, it means uh, boost, it means vaccinated with a primary series. There's another term called up to date that means um, vaccinated with a primary series and whatever booster doses uh, were uh, indicated for the particular individual uh, according to minimal intervals um, specified in the guidance. That term is challenging to implement uh, from a surveillance and monitoring um, perspective. So it's often not what's used in um, our measurements uh, for surveillance data. Thank you. And Dr. Nelson, final question in this series. Thank you, Commander Scovey, for that great overview and a very informative presentation. One of our considerations for an EUA authorization is the availability of treatments for the disease in which we are trying to prevent with the vaccine. So in scouring the agenda today, I didn't really see the impact of available treatments for disease on the epidemiology of the disease itself. And I wonder if you'd care to comment at this time or save it for later discussion. Thank you. Yeah, so <clears throat> unfortunately, so I plan to, um, I have a variant expert also on the line, but I'm not sure that that person can be connected, Dr. Natalie Thornberg. So I didn't prepare for certain questions because I believe they would be able to, con uh, to be connected. But it's true uh, what you're saying, that this is definitely a concern when we're talking about um, vaccination and these variants whether there are other treatments that um, can be used uh, when people become infected to protect them against serious illness. And it's definitely true that when Omicron um, became predominant, this was a major, um, a major thing that the healthcare system had to deal with because there was essentially only one monoclonal antibody that was effective against Omicron and there wasn't enough of it, and um, it, it was a major problem. And Natalie is, uh, is, is writing me mm -hmm. now. But um, are you Dr. able Martha, to connect her? We have Dr. Natalie speak. Well, yes, if she's uh, available. Yes, she is available. Thank you. And then we'll, then we'll, we'll have to move ahead. And Dr. Nelson, this is an important point, which I think uh, you may wish Dr. Mark's group to weigh in on, but uh, later on this afternoon. Understood, thank you. Is Natalie available? Dr. Thornburg, are you there? Yes, Mike, can you connect Natalie, please? Yeah, this is like, uh, uh, let, me, let me suggest she that we not muted. have too many link-ins. The, the technology is not all that uh, no. able to handle this. No. Let's go ahead. I just, Natalie, hold on a second. I will unmute you right now. Hold on. I just had to know who it was. Thank you. Go ahead, Natalie. Take it away. I believe you may have unmuted Dr. Link Dallas. It's Natalie. No, I, I, I am oh, unmuted there? now. Okay, Thank great. you. Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank yeah. Um, so I believe the question was um, uh, use of therapeutics. How could you sort of summarize the question? It was use of therapeutics in um, in how that has impacted the the variant um, with variants circulating. Is that the correct question? 
Concerns about Omicron probably specifically um, and the use of Mm -hmm. monoclonal antibodies and other treatments. Yeah, um, the monoclonal antibodies, it, it has use of those treatments and those prophylaxis, it's, it's definitely um, uh, Omicron has, because there's so many changes in the receptor binding domain of Omicron, Heather said there's uh, 15 in the receptor binding domain, that's the part of the spike protein that binds to the cell, and therefore that is also the same region that neutralizing monoclonal antibodies bind. Um, so. Omicron has indeed um, lost activity, or the monoclonal antibody therapeutics, several of them have lost uh, potent activity against Omicron, and um, we don't have as many of those available. Those same problems won't exist for um, small molecule inhibitors, fortunately, Um, and new monoclonals can be developed. But when when a variant emerges like Omicron that um, have a lot of changes in the receptor binding domain, it it does um, reduce the toolbox clinicians have um, to use um, when, when people get infected. I guess for committee's consideration and one clarifying question, would it be fair to state that the availability of these various treatments have had little impact on the overall course of the epidemiology of the disease in the U.S. at this time? Um, well, since we know that, I think that the the, the trans, transmission of the transmission of the virus, um, most people are most transmissible in the day or two leading up to symptom onset and the few days after symptom onset, often they can't get access to treatment until um, their transmissibility is already beginning to wane. Um, And therefore, vaccines are, you know, a really key tool in reducing transmission. Um, But we have to use all of the tools in our toolbox. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marks, uh, for a final comment yeah, I, before I, we go on I, I, the next I, I just, presentation. I think it's very important for us to step back here for a moment and just recognize that vaccines are a unique public health tool that is relatively inexpensive. The <laughs> safety of vaccines in terms of the benefit risk is often uh, much better uh, than the safety of some of the therapeutics uh, that might be used post facto after one is infected. And so one of the really important things here about vaccines is they have been wonderful public health interventions, and that's why uh, we uh, use them. Uh, They can give protection to many, many, many more people than we can come up with courses of oral therapies uh, or intravenous therapies. Uh, And the cost of actually and the complexity uh, and the potential complications of delivering Uh, intravenous therapies um, or even some of the oral therapies are much greater uh, than the simplicity of giving uh, vaccines. Um, Not that vaccines have zero risk associated with them. We'll hear about uh, potential side effects uh, of vaccines later today, but uh, that overall the benefit risk um, uh, is quite favorable as a public health intervention. Thank you, Dr. Marks. And now we are moving ahead to the next discussion, which is about myocarditis. And uh, we will hear uh, Captain Shimabokuro from CDC uh, giving us this update. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're fine. All right, um, next slide, please. Or I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll control. So um, today I'm gonna, topics I'm gonna cover is a background on classic myocarditis and myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. And then I'll give an update on myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination with a focus on people ages 18 and older that will include data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, and the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. So uh, (coughs) classic myocarditis usually has an infectious cause, typically viral or presumed to be viral, although although infection with a pathogen is frequently not identified. 
It can be due to direct microbial infection of the myocardial cells. I, I'm having some technical difficulties with the slides. They keep on reversing order here. I don't know if that's on my end or, or your end. Um, we're not touching your slide, so go ahead, no, sir. No, no, we're, we're, we're okay. Okay. Um, it can also be toxin-mediated or in a setting of systemic infection or infection of non-cardiac tissue. Rare causes include autoimmune hypersensitivity or giant cell myocarditis. Incidence is higher in males compared to females starting after age five years. And as I mentioned, it's, not, it's common to not identify a pathogen or possible infectious etiology for myocarditis. Um, in some studies, when they do testing, um, in a minority of cases, do they find a possible infectious etiology. So these are graphs showing the epidemiology of myocarditis with children on the, the right-hand side and adults on the left-hand side. This is from the published literature. If you focus on, on the left-hand side, with the exception of very early in childhood when there may be factors like genetic factors um, in play, um, incidence is relatively low in early childhood and then begins to increase in adolescence. And if you move over to the right graph, you can see um, peaking in adolescence and then gradually decreasing uh, incidence with age. And most of these cases are male, and by the time you hit um, uh, middle age, the, the male to female um, predominance uh, goes away. So this is a table um, showing the characteristics of myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in a comparison with viral myocarditis. So for vaccine-associated myocarditis, um, mRNA COVID-19 vaccination is the inciting exposure. And then for viral myocarditis, it, it's viral, although many of these uh, cases can be asymptomatic. For vaccine-associated myocarditis, most cases have been in adolescents and young adults with, with more cases in males compared to females. Then for my, viral myocarditis, incidence in males greater than females, a male incidence peaking in adolescence and then gradually declining. Onset for vaccine-associated myocarditis has j typically been within a few days after vaccination, with most cases occurring within a week. And then for viral myocarditis, onset is, is typically one to four weeks after viral illness. The next set of characteristics um, get at clinical severity, um, but just in general, um, the vaccine-associated myocarditis uh, following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination has been relatively mild when compared to viral myocarditis, which can uh, frequently be severe. So now I'm going to move on to uh, data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is the national spontaneous reporting system that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Um, the key limitation, VAERS is a passive surveillance system. We generally cannot determine cause and effect from VAERS data alone. So this is a flow diagram showing U.S. reports to VAERS of myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination among people 18 and older following primary series and first booster. Um, we, observe, we have observed 1,836 reports in this age group. 11 remain under review, 504 did not meet case definition, and that leaves us with 1,321 reports in this age group that met CDC case definition. To put that number in context, there's been an estimated 491.9 million primary series and first booster doses administered in this age group. Uh, this is a, 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 a this is a, a figure showing time to onset of these cases, and you'll notice that um, uh, there is appears to be clustering within a few days after vaccination. Um, many of these cases occurring in the one to four day period. Um, when we get to the vaccine safety data link, I'll show you some additional data that also supports this clustering within a few days of on, onset within a few days of vaccination. So of these 1,321 reports, verified reports that met CDC case definition, the median age in this, in this age group, 18 and older, was 28 years. Median time to onset uh, of symptoms after vaccination is three days. Most of these occurred after dose two, 
and most occurred in males. This is a table of VAERS reporting rates of myocarditis per million doses administered after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in the 0 to 7 and 8 to 21 days post-vaccination. I know this is a busy slide, but there's a few key uh, takeaway points from this. If you look, these, the peach-colored slides are where the, the observed reporting rates to VAERS exceed the expected background rates based on um, the published, what's in the published literature. Um, so you can use that as a proxy of risk. That's where the O to E um, ratio um, expe exceeds background. Um, if you look in the uh, 8 to 21 days, you'll see that there are no, uh, there are no peach shaded cells, um, and that reinforces that, that the risk is concentrated primarily in the 0 to 7 days. Um, if you look at males versus females, you see that reporting rates are generally higher in females. Um, and reporting rates for both males and females are higher after dose two compared to dose one. I have the, the children in there for reference, but if you start at the 18 to 24 year old age group, you see that the reporting rates decrease with time and at least for males by the time you hit 50 years old, we do not see an increased risk. So of these 1,321 reports, um, uh, where we had information on, on uh, healthcare utilization, most were hospitalized. And most of these reports that were hospitalized had a known outcome at the time of the report, and 73% of these had recovered from symptoms at the time of the last follow up, according to the VAERS report. There were 21 reports of death involving myocarditis when, when we evaluated the reports and accompanying records. Uh, in one report, myocarditis was attributed to causes other than vaccination. Um, in four, potential alternate etiologies were present. In 15, cause of death was not attributed to myocarditis. And then one, adequate information was not available to fully evaluate the case. So I just want to give a, a, a spend a, a little bit of time talking about CDC's enhanced surveillance of myocarditis outcomes, and, and this is currently in an age group 12 to 29 years. The purpose was to assess functional status and clinical outcomes among individuals reported to have developed myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, and it's a two-component survey conducted at least 90 days after the onset of symptoms. It included a patient survey and a healthcare provider survey. Um, when the analytic period closed in November 2021, VAERS had received 852 reports in this age group that were at least 90 days, that met case definition, that were at least 90 days post-myocarditis diagnosis. We were able to complete 360 patient surveys and 398 cardiologist or other healthcare provider surveys um, that these patients were seeing in aftercare. Um, the main finding from the cardiologist or healthcare provider survey was that based on the provider assessment, most patients appeared to have fully or probably fully recovered from their myocarditis. Um, roughly 82% of patients, um, according to the cardiologist, were classified as fully recovered or probably fully recovered, but pending more information. Um, and the, the, the majority of the remainder had improved uh, but did not report being fully recovered. So some key findings from this enhanced surveillance activity, um, on patient, patient follow-up with the patient surveys, at least 90 days after diagnosis, most patients uh, who were reached reported no impact on their quality of life, and most did not report missing school or work. As I mentioned, 82% of healthcare providers um, indicated that the patient was fully recovered or probably fully recovered. Notably, there was substantial heterogeneity in the initial and follow-up treatment and testing of these patients, and there did not appear to be a single test that was indicative of recovery. Some additional next steps we're doing is we're going to follow up on patients who are not yet fully recovered at the time of the survey and further to further assess the recovery status at, 12, at, at least 12 months um, after, uh, after uh, myocarditis. And we're also following up on children on, uh, on, and evaluating myocarditis cases in children ages 5 to 11 years. So now I'm going to move on to data from our Vaccine Safety Data Link system, which is our electronic health record-based system for surveillance and research. 
Uh, we conduct rapid cycle analysis in the vaccine safety data link. The aims are to monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes and to describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time among eligible VSD members. Here's a table of the pre-specified outcomes that we are monitoring in VSD and the settings in which we are monitoring them. So I'm not going to go through this slide. This is uh, methods. I'll just mention that the primary um, analytic method for VSD rapid cycle analysis is a vaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. It basically compares vaccinated individuals to other vaccinated individuals, looking at uh, looking at cases in a uh, a risk interval compared to cases in a comparison interval. Um, for the outcome of myocarditis and pericarditis, all cases were chart confirmed and verified using the CDC case definition. So here's the uh, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine doses administered in VSD in the age group 18 to 39 years old, which is the, the age group that I'm, I'll be presenting data for. Um, there were about 950 patients who received a primary series, dose one and dose two for Moderna, and about 1.5 million who received a primary Pfizer series. There's about 574 million uh, people who received a Moderna booster dose one, and about 812,000 people who received a Pfizer booster dose one. Uh, this is the uh, uh, figure showing the day of onset of verified myocarditis and pericarditis cases in the age group. And you can see, similar to what I showed in VAERS, these cases following vaccination tend to cluster shortly after vaccination. In this case, statistically significant clustering in the days 0 to 3 and 0 to 4, um, reinforcing the, uh, what, the biological plausibility of this 0 to 7 day risk interval that we use um, for our main analyses for myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. So this is a table showing verified myocarditis and pericarditis cases in the zero to seven day risk interval um, compared to outcome events and vaccinated comparators and, and um, risk. Uh, this is basically looking at the risk in the risk interval compared uh, the risk in the in the risk interval compared to the comparison interval. The statistic is the adjusted rate ratio, and this table is for males 18 to 39 years old. And you can see um, whether, whether it's a combined analysis of both vaccines or looking at the Pfizer vaccine or looking at the Moderna vaccine, the adjusted rate ratios um, are all elevated, um, many of them statistically significantly elevated, um, with the dose two rate ratios tending to be the highest. Um, and then you see on the far right-hand side there how that translates into the excess cases uh, in the risk period per million doses, which depending on the analysis range from about 40 to 60 additional cases in the risk period per million doses administered. So this is the same table, but for females. Um, and you can see that uh, there are, uh, the, the, the case counts are, are substantially lower. Um, there, the, the adjusted rate ratios tend to be elevated, some statistically significantly elevated, and um, some of these adjusted rate ratios are, are, are comparable um, to those observed for males, um, but I want to caution you this is based on relatively small numbers, and so these can be impacted by those small number effects. And then you see the excess cases in the risk period on the right-hand side there. I want to go back to the previous slide. You'll see that um, the excess uh, cases in the risk period there, um, you know, like I said, in the, in the, the, in the highest risk um, strata ranging from about 40 to 60, and you'll see they're substantially lower here um, for females. So even though some of the, the, the adjusted rate ratios may be elevated in females, because of the, the lower case counts, the excess risk tends to be quite lower in females compared to males. So uh, this is a, a, a table showing the level of care and status of, of, these, of the cases in VSD, and these are the cases after the primary, a primary series dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Um, most of these cases are admitted to the hospital. 
uh, a, re a relatively small minority are treated in the emergency department. The length of stays tends to be short. Um, the median length of stay is, is, is one, and uh, the overwhelming majority of these cases have, have stays of three days or less, and 100% of these uh, case patients were discharged home. This is the same slide, but it's a similar uh, table, but it's showing the cases um, following the first booster dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, this, I think, just demonstrates that, that the, uh, the, the level of care status uh, and status is similar um, for, for the cases following the booster dose compared to the cases following the primary series. So to, uh, just to sum up, the current evidence supports a causal association between mRNA COVID-19 vaccination and myocarditis and pericarditis. Cases following vaccination cluster within the first week of vaccination. The risk is greatest in adolescents and young adults, higher after dose two compared to dose one of the primary series, and higher in males compared to females. Some risk estimates for females in VSD are comparable to males but case counts are small and excess risk in females is substantially lower than for males. The risk appears to decrease with age and the male to female predominance of cases attenuates with age. Reporting rates in VAERS are highest following dose two. Reporting rates following dose one and first booster dose tend to be lower. Incidence rates in VSD of verified myocarditis and pericarditis zero to seven days following vaccination are generally highest following dose two. In a minority of age and sex strata, notably males aged 16 to 17 years, the incidence is highest following the booster dose. And based on our follow-up of VAERS case reports, available information suggests that most persons with myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination recover from myocarditis by three to eight months after diagnosis. I'd like to acknowledge the following groups for their contributions. And I'll be happy to answer questions. We have only a few minutes for questions right now. I'm sure that the topic will come back. Remember uh, to our committee that this is background information on mRNA vaccines in basically observational studies. And I see a lot of hands raised, and we're not going to be able to uh, get all of them. I'm going to have a, lot of, a couple of questions, maybe two or three, and then we're going to be going on to the sponsor presentation. So uh, if you are disappointed, uh, my apologies, Dr. Rubin. Hi, sorry about that. Thanks, Dr. Um, uh, the Is there, you know, one of the hypotheses is that it is the antigen itself uh, and cross-reactivity that's leading to myocarditis. Is there any evidence, um, and I realize a lot of it might be international, of an association between myocarditis and the viral vectored vaccines? Um, I don't know if anyone could hear me. No, I couldn't. Oh. Yeah, Tom just disconnected his audio uh, inadvertently, so I'm just going to reconnect Tom's audio here. Um, okay. Here he comes. The there he comes. There you go, Tom. You there? Sorry, I lost I lost audio there for a second and missed it. <laughs> That's <all> okay. <laughs> go ahead, Eric. Can you repeat that quick? The quick version. Um, the, um, is this is there evidence that this is the antigen rather than the method of delivery? In other words, do you see the same thing with uh, viral vector vaccines? So uh, th there, there are, have been case reports after the Janssen vaccine, um, but the, the data are, 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 are pretty sparse. There, there has been, hasn't been much vaccine administered and there hasn't been much vaccine administered in these high-risk groups, namely adolescents and and, and young adults. So I don't think we have sufficient evidence to rule out or establish uh, a risk. Um, and I'm not aware of, of, of any surveillance or, or epi data from the, 
the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine that would indicate a risk. But I, I think right now the, the data are really not sufficient for Janssen to, um, to draw hard conclusions on that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Galen. We can't hear you. You have your phone muted again, Sorry. Dr. Gallen. But so, about, so this is about natural history of myocarditis uh, and recovery from it. You talked about recovery and this in the, uh, the the vaccine associated cases. Does that mean in 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 the natural history is fully recovered, meaning people don't have to worry about it ever again, or are there long term consequences that might come up later? Over. I, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to. Um, to, to talk about the, the, the natural history of myocarditis, um, I, I, I think that there, there can be um, long-term effects, residual effects uh, of, of myocarditis. Uh, there is not, um, as, as I said, there, there does not appear to be, there appears to be a lot of heterogeneity both in the treatment and in the follow-up care. And, and um, and, and not really a standard to determine whether a patient has has recovered. I'll say that's a bit of a lack of a, of standardization. Um, what I what I can say about the cases that we have followed up on is that um, overwhelmingly, either when you survey the patient or you survey the healthcare provider, um, they report report generally having favorable outcomes. Um, there's a, a small number um, which have recovered or which have improved but have not fully recovered and that's why we're going to follow up on these case patients at 12 months or more um, to try to get a better idea of the recovery status of these vaccine associated cases. Thank you. Dr. Meisner. Dr. Shimabukuro, thank you so much. Um, for your uh, work in this area it, uh, o over the past year or two, it's been it's been very helpful. The question I have for you first is a follow-up to Dr. Gallen's question, and that is uh, gadolinium uptake of <clears throat> children or adolescents who have had uh, myocarditis uh, has has been a helpful marker to address this question of longer term inflammation in in the heart muscle and do you have any more data regarding in in the groups that you're following regarding uh, the results of, of, of studies to look at gadolinium uptake if I may a very quick question um, the numbers from Israel uh, regarding myocarditis following the mRNA vaccines is, is a, a little bit different than from theirs probably reflecting the means by which the data is collected. Um, can you comment on that? Over. I, I'm. I'm not. I don't think I'm going to be able to comment on the comparison between the Israeli data and the U.S. data because I'm not, at least off the top of my head, not that as familiar with the Israeli data. Um, to get to your question on the recovery status um, for for patients that we followed up on that did receive an, an MRI. Um, and, and during outpatient follow-up, some of those patients did have this late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI. And from speaking to our cardiologist consultants, um, the, uh, the, 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 the clinical significance of, of the late gadolinium enhancement, especially in patients who um, report, you know, having uh, Recovered, uh, having recovered their, their cardiac function and are otherwise feeling well um, is is unclear. So I think there still needs to be some more work in that area about what what is the significance of that of that finding in these in these uh, in these patients. You know, months after the uh, the initial diagnosis. It has it been possible Thank you. to collect the figures? Uh, uh, let, let's we're we're going to have to move ahead, Cody. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, the final question. Yeah, Tom, a very clear presentation as always, and I was interested to know whether the I, the number of cases following booster doses appeared to be notably lower 
then after uh, dose two. Can you comment about the length of interval between doses as possibly further lowering the rate of myocarditis in patients? Uh, in in many cases, the rate of of myocarditis after the booster dose is lower. I mean, after the booster dose is lower than after dose two. Although I would say not in in all uh, age and sex strata. Um, I think I believe there is some evidence in other countries where they have had um, some different uh, recommendations or at least operationalized the vaccination program. So there were. Uh, longer spacing between vaccines, maybe not necessarily the, the booster, but maybe the primary series, um, and some evidence uh, that that the, the space uh, that, that that spacing may may mitigate the risk of myocarditis. Um, in the United States, uh, in the United States, there tends to be a fairly close following of the immunization schedule. Um, so we, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of data. But uh, I mean, it's, it, it is an interesting finding um, that that when you when you have that 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 longer um, interval between that that booster dose, we we tend to see lower reporting rates or, or lower risk. I would just caution that there, it's possible that there could be some self-selecting um, out of the the population. For example, if a, if a person uh, got myocarditis after dose two, they may not get a, a booster dose. Um, so that may also be impacting the findings as well. Yeah. I just mentioned it because of the 21 days between the dose of Novavax as well. Right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to move ahead. Uh, Dr. Shimabukur, I'm sure we're going to be coming back to these issues and ascertainment and rates uh, later on. So, uh, uh, please stick with us to the afternoon. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, the sponsor, uh, to Dr. Dubofsky, who is going to take the lead in the presentations on the emergency use authorization by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older. Over to you. Thank you, and I'll just wait for the slides to load up. Are you sharing on your end? Um, it should be coming from. Yep. Yep. We 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 gave the share to Justin. Justin. There you go, sir. I'm still seeing a lag here. Um, they're up on our answer. Excellent. Um, good morning. After that delay, my name is Philip Dubofsky, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Novavax. Uh, we're pleased to have this opportunity to present our data for NBX 2373. Our vaccine provides an important new approach in the fight against COVID-19. We believe its authorization will improve vaccine availability and accessibility with the ultimate goal of increasing vaccination rates in the U.S. and throughout the world. As we will show you today, NVX 2373 leverages a well-defined platform offering a different vaccine option to fulfill an unmet need within the U.S. and globally. Our vaccine is a recombinant protein subunit vaccine formulated with a natural, novel adjuvant. It induces robust immune responses and provides high levels of protection against mild, moderate, and severe COVID-19. The vaccine is proven to be generally well-tolerated and has a positive benefit-risk profile across a large and diverse patient population. Our COVID-19 vaccine is based on Novavax's platform technology, a common protein antigen formulated as a particle in our matrix M adjuvant, which is a saponin-based adjuvant. Our recombinant proteins represent a tested and well-understood vaccine technology. 
Currently approved examples uh, include influenza, Hep B, HPV, MEN B, and shingles. There are also approved vaccines for malaria and shingles that include saponin-based adjuvants. Here's a brief overview of our vaccine. The NVX 2373 antigen is a recombinant SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The spike protein is based on the following sequence from the original strain, including the transmembrane domain. We've engineered changes into the sequence to inactivate the purine cleavage site and stabilize its structure. It's manufactured in the Bacchial virus SF9 insect cell expression system, a well-defined approach which has been used for decades. And then the full length protein is expressed and self-assembles into a trimer which is locked into its native conformation. These recombinant protein trimers are purified and further processed to form nanoparticles around a polysorbate co core shown uh, on the slide in blue. The adjuvant matrix M is purified from the soap bark tree grown in South America. During processing and purification, the saponin forms cage-like structures the antigen and adjuvant are co-dispensed into a vial where they form a ready-to-use suspension. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about the mechanism of action of the matrix and adjuvant. The mechanism of action of saponin-based adjuvants have been evaluated in a number of animal models. Matrix M exerts a transient effect at the injection site and a more sustained immunostimulatory effect in the draining lymph nodes. It does not contain alum, it does not form a depot at the injection site, nor does it engage the toll-like receptor pathway. Injection of matrix M increases the magnitude and breadth of the immune response. It induces a rapid transient activation of innate immune cells and increases cytokine and chemokine production at the injection site. This peaks at 5 to 48 hours after injection and rapidly drops by 72 hours. This results in a local influx of, of activated antigen-presenting cells to which the antigen is delivered and triggers an antigen-specific immune response. Subsequently, there's enhanced antigen presentation by MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules in the draining lymph nodes. The result is the induction of high levels of neutralizing antibody, polyfunctional CD4 T cells, and a TH1-biased cell-mediated immune response. Now let's shift to the vaccine's presentation and profile. Our vaccine has key attributes that support the increased access and ease of use. It's dispensed in a 10 dose vial as a preservative free, ready to use liquid suspension. It can be transported and stored to refrigerator temperatures, making it easy to ship, store, and administer. Each dose contains five micrograms of antigen and 50 micrograms of matrix and adjuvant. Two doses are administered 21 days apart as a 0.5 mil intramuscular injection using standard needles and syringes. The proposed indication under discussion for today's meeting is for adults 18 years of age and older. Our clinical development program includes four studies. These studies constitute the body of data used for global regulatory approvals. The initial phase one, phase two study established the five microgram dose level, confirmed the utility of the adjuvant, and a two dose schedule in both younger and older adults. The study also defined the immunologic phenotype and described the preliminary safety profile. Subsequently, our phase two study in South Africa that included a small subset of medically stable participants living with HIV evaluated preliminary efficacy and safety. Pivotal safety and efficacy was initially evaluated in a phase three study in the UK, followed by an even larger study in the US and Mexico to enable life insurance within the US. As part of the US Mexico phase three study, effect effectiveness and clinical efficacy was established in adolescents 12 to 17 years of age. Now, after discussion with the FDA, today's efficacy presentation will focus on our largest study, the U.S.-Mexico Phase three study, Study 301. Study 301 is most relevant for today's discussion because it was conducted in a diverse U.S. population, and the vaccine used in the study was manufactured at the commercial scale that is consistent with the vaccine we are distributing globally. Relevant safety data from all studies will be discussed. Okay, let's briefly review the 301 top-line results. Our U.S.-Mexico Phase three study uh, met its pre-specified primary efficacy endpoint. Study 301 demonstrated an overall efficacy of 90.4% against protocol-defined symptomatic disease and achieved 92% efficacy in high-risk populations with medical comorbidities and 100% efficacy against moderate and severe disease. 
All events of moderate and severe disease and hospitalizations occurred in the placebo group. Additionally, match strain efficacy was 97%. Match strains are strains that are considered genetically similar to the original virus in which the vaccine is based. As far as variants go, our vaccine demonstrated high levels of protection against the alpha variant, as well as against all of the variants of interest and concern that circulated at that time. A number of variants circulated and caused disease during our study. In fact, the majority of cases were caused by variants of concern and variants of interest. The most commonly observed were alpha, epsilon, and iota. Displayed here are our global regulatory approvals. As of today, our vaccine has been granted authorization for use in over 40 countries for individuals 18 years of age and older, including those over 65. In December 2021, we uh, received our first authorization in the European Union, granting access to all 27 countries. This was followed by the World Health Organization, granting emergency use listing for global use. Subsequently, approval was achieved in the countries listed on the slide. I should note that the indication in India and Thailand includes adolescents, and adults, and our vaccine has been approved uh, as a booster dose in Japan. Our clinical development plans are ongoing. We will continue uh, and, and will continue following EUA. We've submitted the results uh, from the adolescent expansion of study 301 and are completing safety follow-up in our phase two and phase three studies to support a full BLA. And we have additional ongoing studies in adolescents, and soon we will initiate a pediatric age de-escalation study uh, beginning in school-aged children. We believe one approach to optimizing protective efficacy may include the use of vaccines engineered against emerging variants. We're collecting data on homologous and heterologous boosting to support continued vaccine use. And finally, we have post-authorization plans, which include additional studies for real-world effectiveness and safety monitoring. Here's the agenda uh, for the remainder of our presentation. Dr. Rayburn Mallory will review the immunogenicity and efficacy data Dr. Denny Kim will present the safety data, followed by Dr. Gregory Poland of the Mayo Clinic to provide his clinical perspective for NVX 2373. I will then return to conclude the presentation, and my colleagues and I will be available to answer questions from the committee. We also have additional experts with us today. All outside experts have been compensated for the time to prepare for today's meeting. Thank you. I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Mallory to review the immunogenicity and efficacy data. Thank you, Dr. Dubofsky. I'm the Senior Vice President and Head of Clinical Development at Novavax, and I'm pleased to review our efficacy data for the EUA application today. As we'll share with you, our data demonstrates that the vaccine induced high levels of neutralizing antibodies in both younger and older adults. The vaccine was highly efficacious in preventing COVID-19 illness and showed a high level of efficacy for the variants of concern and variants of interest that circulated during our phase three study. The vaccine also completely prevented moderate and severe COVID-19 in the study. Before I describe our clinical data, I'd like to briefly summarize our non-clinical results. We conducted a number of non-clinical studies during the development of the vaccine. In immunogenicity studies, the vaccine induced high levels of functional antibodies and induced a strong TH1 biased cellular immune response. In animal challenge studies, the vaccine effectively suppressed viral replication in both the upper and lower airways. And this was an important milestone, as it suggested that the vaccine could be highly protective in humans. In addition, reassuringly, there was no evidence of enhanced disease in these studies. We performed a comprehensive toxicology program, and there were no adverse findings seen in these studies. There were also no adverse findings in our developmental and reproductive toxicity study. So these results, combined with the absence of safety findings in all of the studies, supported moving the vaccine into clinical development. Turning next to the results from our US-Mexico 301 study, which is also called PREVENT-19. This was a randomized, observer-blinded, placebo-controlled study. We randomized participants in a two-to-one ratio to receive vaccine or placebo. And we did this so that we could gather additional safety data on the vaccine from a larger number of participants. The study initially enrolled adults 18 years of age and older, 
And we then amended it to also include adolescents 12 through 17 years of age. About four months after the initial vaccination period, participants remained blinded and were crossed over to the opposite treatment arm. And we did this so that all participants in the study could receive active vaccine. Participants are now being followed for up to two years following primary vaccination. The primary endpoint for the study was mild, moderate, or severe disease occurring seven days or more after the second dose of vaccine. In terms of the definition of success, in order to meet the primary endpoint for vaccine efficacy, the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval needed to be greater than 30%. One of the main secondary endpoints we were interested in was how effective the vaccine would be in preventing the more concerning cases of moderate and severe COVID-19. As Dr. DeBosk mentioned, a large number of variants of interest and variants of concern circulated during the study. Sequence data were available for 75 of the endpoint cases, and 61 of these, or about 80%, were due to variants of concern or variants of interest, with the alpha variant being the most common one isolated. These strains are now classified as variants being monitored, as they aren't circulating to a large extent. However, efficacy for these variants remains relevant as some of them contained escape mutations, like the L4452R, seen in the Omicron subvariants, that could also be seen in future variants. Turning now to the results. Demographics and baseline characteristics were well balanced between the two arms, as shown. 13% of participants were 65 or older. It's important to note that enrollment in older adults was somewhat limited. This is because COVID-19 vaccines became authorized and recommended for those over 65 while we were enrolling. Black or African-American participants made up about 12% of the study population. 7% were American Indian and 22% were Hispanic or Latina, representative of the overall U.S. population. In line with one of our study goals, about 95% of participants were considered at increased risk of COVID-19, either due to underlying medical conditions, their occupations, or living conditions. About 7% were seropositive at baseline, and we excluded these individuals from the immunogenicity and efficacy analyses. In terms of immunogenicity, in study 301, there was a robust neutralizing antibody response at day 35, 14 days after the second dose of vaccine. As you can see, this was true for both younger and older adults. In fact, there was a 123-fold increase for younger adults and an 87-fold increase in older adults from baseline. Turning to the efficacy results. Looking at the... Dr. Raban, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. I appear to have been muted. I'll start this slide again. So looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve, we can see that cases began to diverge between the placebo and vaccine arms at around the time of the second dose, at day 21, and that there were very few cases in the vaccine arm through day 98. We achieved our primary efficacy endpoint in the study with 90% protection from mild, moderate, and severe disease. In fact, there were only 17 cases in the 17,000 or so vaccine recipients compared to 79 cases in the 8,000 or so placebo recipients. And as a reminder, we randomized participants two to one to receive vaccine. We also observed 100% protection against moderate or severe illness a key secondary endpoint. As I showed previously, a number of different variants of interest and variants of concern were circulating during the study and were responsible for about 80% of the cases for sequence data are available. Our vaccine showed 93% efficacy against these PCR-confirmed 
variants of interest and variants of concern, including the alpha variant. And all of the cases that did occur in the vaccine arm were mild in severity. Notably, efficacy was 97% for strains that would be considered more closely matched to the vaccine. When we looked at vaccine efficacy based on race, the vaccine provided a consistently high level of protection across all groups. The efficacy estimate for Hispanic or Latina participants was somewhat lower than that seen for the overall study, though with broad confidence intervals. In order to evaluate this in more detail, we looked to see if lower immune responses might have contributed to this finding. However, what we found was that IgG and neutralizing antibodies in Hispanic and Latina participants were actually slightly higher than those seen in non-Hispanic Latina participants. As a result, this efficacy estimate may reflect the chance finding. However, we will continue to gather additional information about the effectiveness of our vaccine in this subgroup in our planned U.S. post-marketing effectiveness study. The vaccine also provided a very high level of protection against severe disease and for individuals who had baseline comorbidities that put them at increased risk from COVID-19. As you can see, the number of cases in older adults was limited. As you may recall, older adults made up 13% of the overall study enrollment, but they were clearly practicing social distancing measures during this time, as they only made up 6% of the cases in the study. The estimate for vaccine efficacy in older adults was 79%, so this was based on a total of six cases, and we believe this estimate is likely attributable to the very small number of cases that occurred. On the next slide, I'll provide some additional data on vaccine immunogenicity and efficacy by age that indicates that the vaccine continues to be immunogenic and efficacious in older adults. On this slide, I'm showing the relationship between geometric mean neutralizing antibody titers, efficacy, and age. When we look at adults 18 to 64 years of age, they had a neutralizing antibody titer of approximately 1,300, and this was associated with 91% efficacy. Within this group, we then evaluated whether vaccine efficacy might be decreasing with age. However, this did not appear to be the case, as vaccine efficacy remained high at 91% for the 50 to 64 year olds, even though their antibody titer was somewhat lower at 979. We also saw an efficacy estimate of 89% for adults 50 or older with a corresponding neutralizing antibody titer of 922. Finally, for those 65 or older, the efficacy estimate was 79%, but with a broad confidence interval that overlaps with the primary efficacy endpoint. When we looked at the neutralizing antibody titer for this group, which was 900, it is quite similar to, and in fact, non-inferior to, the titers for the 50 to 64-year-olds and for those 50 or older that were associated with around 89 to 90% efficacy. These data, along with supportive efficacy data in older adults from a large phase three study conducted in the US, in the UK, not presented today, provide assurance the vaccine is efficacious in older adults, supporting this indication in all countries in which the vaccine has been approved to date. So to conclude, our vaccine was highly efficacious in preventing COVID-19 in a large phase three study. This efficacy was demonstrated against all the variants that circulated during the study. The vaccine also provided complete protection from moderate or severe COVID-19 in our pivotal study. Our vaccine also demonstrated consistently high efficacy across subgroups, including race, gender, and in individuals with comorbidities. I'll now turn the presentation to my colleague, Dr. Kim, to present the safety results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mallory. I'm the Chief Safety Officer at Novavax, and it really is a pleasure for me to be able to present the safety results for our Novavax COVID vaccine. 
while our presentation will focus on the U.S.-Mexico Phase 3 Study 301. We will also take into consideration the other studies from our clinical development when there are safety data that adds additional insight. The total safety database includes nearly 50,000 people enrolled across four studies. More than 30,000 received our vaccine, and more than 19,000 of these individuals received the vaccine in our Phase 3 U.S. and Mexico Study 301 in the pre-crossover portion of the study. This is a large data set that can provide us confidence that we have a well-characterized safety profile that supports positive benefit risk and a favorable reactogenicity profile across the diverse populations that Dr. Mallory described. Now, taking into account follow-up time, during the placebo control period of study 301, we have more than 5,500 person years of follow-up in the vaccine arm alone. The median follow-up was 89 to 92 days. And study compliance was high. Actually, more than 96% of study participants received two doses. I'd like to briefly review now how a safety follow-up was conducted. Beginning in the pre-crossover phase, participants received two doses 21 days apart at day zero and day 21. On the day of each vaccination in the pre-crossover phase, participants recorded local and systemic reactions using an electronic diary for seven days. Unsolicited adverse events were collected through day 49. Approximately four months after the initial vaccination, participants entered a blinded crossover and received two doses, 21 days apart. Local and systemic solicited reactions were not recorded post-crossover. However, unsolicited adverse events were collected through day 49. Participants were then followed by visits occurring at six-month intervals, in person or by phone, until the end of study. In addition to the nasal swab that was collected prior to each vaccination, continued monitoring for COVID-19 is ongoing with active and passive surveillance and prompt PCR testing when warranted. This study includes long-term follow-up with SAEs and AEs of special interest collected through two years following initial vaccination. Let me begin with a summary of our solicited adverse events collected through e-diary entries for seven days following each vaccination. Shown here are the local reactogenicity events after the first dose. Participants 18 to 64 years of age are represented in the top panel and those 65 and older in the bottom panel. Within each event column, on the left are vaccinated participants and placebo participants are on the right. Pain and tenderness were the most commonly reported events. And those 65 years of age and older experienced fewer local events compared to those 18 to 64 years of age. While many participants did not report reactogenicity events, those who did mostly reported events that were grade one or two, which is mild to moderate in severity shown in blue. Grade three and higher shown in yellow occurred at low rates. Overall, these events resolved quickly with a median duration of one to two days. As expected, events occurred more frequently following the second dose. And again, as expected, more participants in the vaccine groups experienced these symptoms. And most events remain grade one or two in severity with low numbers of grade three and higher events. Now, I'd like to turn to systemic reactogenicity. On this slide, are systemic events after the first dose. Malaise, fatigue, muscle pain, and headache were the most commonly reported. And, and as well for systemic events, we also see lower frequencies in those 65 years of age and older. Again, events were reported as grade one or two and resolved quickly with a median duration of one to two days. Notably, the rates of fever were quite low in less than 1% of participants. Following the second dose, while higher overall, most systemic events remained mild to moderate in severity as grade one or two. Rates of grade three and higher events were low and occurred in relatively few participants. And even after the second dose, participants reporting fever continued to remain low. Moving to an overview of unsolicited adverse events. Overall, the frequency of unsolicited adverse events was comparable between vaccine and placebo groups 
and severe adverse events were reported in few participants, both pre- and post-crossover. Medically attended adverse events, as well as potential immune-mediated conditions were similar between groups. SAEs were also balanced across vaccine and placebo groups. And uh, as you can see in the last row, deaths also occurred at similar rates between treatment arms. This figure shows pre-crossover unsolicited AEs by system organ class occurring at a frequency of at least 1% through day 49. This was our primary safety collection window through four weeks after receiving the second dose. Frequency between treatment groups was similar and the overall percentage of participants reporting adverse events remained low. Here, we see more data on potential immune-mediated conditions. These all occurred with low frequency. Individual events occurred with less than 1% incidence and without any obvious patterns that would suggest associations with vaccinations. There's a lot of data on this slide, so let me give you a moment to review the table. And as you'll note, overall, events were balanced between both vaccine and placebo arms. Shown here are pre-crossover serious adverse events by system organ class with frequency of at least 0.1%. SAEs by system organ class were infrequent and comparable between vaccine and placebo groups. With the exception of the infection system organ class due to COVID-19 cases in the placebo arm. When we looked at individual preferred terms, there was a numerical imbalance driven by events reported as cholecystitis. And I'd like to provide you a little more of our analysis on this topic. Because we saw an imbalance in cholecystitis cases, we looked at the totality of the data, including a deep dive into individual cases. We do believe that the weight of evidence does not suggest a causal link. In study 301, the overall frequency of COVID cystitis in the vaccine group is low, 0.05%, which is consistent with the expected background rate. In the UK study 302, there was one additional event in the vaccine arm as well as another in the placebo arm. No events occurred in studies 501 and 101. All these events occurred in participants with known risk factors for cholecystitis. And all participants had gallstones at the time of event onset. A broader look at related terms with a standard MEDRA search did not reveal any additional findings. Importantly, there was no clustering or temporal relation to treatment. And we have not received any post-authorization reports with more than 740,000 doses administered. On this slide, we've plotted time to onset of cholecystitis following vaccination. The y-axis is the patient's age, and the x-axis represents the number of days from the first dose to when the event was reported. As you can see, we did not observe any temporal patterns and see a pretty random spread over a long period following vaccination. Because of the importance of myocarditis, pericarditis, we wanted to provide you a complete summary of our clinical data. For this analysis, we will be presenting from our entire pooled safety database. For a little context, and as uh, Dr. Shimabukuro reviewed in detail, with the numerous investigations into the myocarditis findings of the past year with messenger RNA vaccines, I think we've learned that we can expect to see natural background events of myocarditis in any sufficiently large database. We've also learned that young males are at higher risk for both vaccine-induced myocarditis and other forms of myocarditis, most often caused by nonspecific infections. COVID infections can also cause myocarditis. It's important to note that our studies were largely conducted during this time of heightened awareness for myocarditis. And so for our data, overall in our placebo controlled phase of our clinical development program, the rates of myocarditis were balanced between the vaccine and placebo arms at 0.007% for vaccine and 0.005% for placebo no pericarditis was reported. In study 301, 
one case occurred in the active arm and one case in the placebo arm. As a reminder, there was a two-to-one randomization in study 301 in order to increase the sample size of vaccinees. And one case occurred in the active arm of study 302. Of the two cases in vaccine recipients, one 67-year-old male also had a concurrent severe COVID infection after dose one. The other case from study 302 occurred in a 19-year-old male three days after the second dose of vaccine and was without a definitive alternative cause. In the post-crossover portion of studies 301 and 302, where all participants had been exposed to our vaccine, events of myocarditis or pericarditis occurred within the expected background rates as determined by the EMA access study. This study was specifically designed to, to determine background rates of interest for COVID vaccine. There were three reports of myocarditis or pericarditis, and all had plausible infectious alternative causes. One notable case occurred in a 16-year-old male two days after the second crossover dose of vaccine with a viral diagnosis uh, uh, that was diagnosed by a healthcare provider. One 20-year-old male had strep throat preceding the events of pericarditis diagnosed by EKG findings and normal troponin levels. While the cases in the two teenage males, one during the placebo-controlled phase and one post-crossover, have characteristics of vaccine-induced myocarditis, we believe that the totality of the clinical evidence here is not enough to establish an overall causal relationship with the vaccine. I wanted to mention that we did not include here a case that the FDA has included in their briefing document of a 28-year-old male who had features of myocarditis but was diagnosed by a cardiologist with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. We also, a few days ago, received a follow-up report of a cardiac MRI that did not show evidence of a recent episode of myocarditis. Our latest monthly summary safety report with post-authorization data includes more than 740,000 doses administered and was submitted in May with a data cutoff of April 30th. We analyzed the cumulative 35 spontaneous reports of potential myocarditis or pericarditis received from passive surveillance systems. These reports often come with very limited information. Because of the general limitations of spontaneous reports, we carefully adjudicated these reports and applied the Brighton Collaboration case definition. Out of the 35 potential reports, non-meta-definitive case definition, one report was a probable case of myocarditis in a 47-year-old male with an unknown time to onset. There were 10 reports of probable pericarditis. Of these, seven were in males and three were females with a median age of 42 years. The time to onset was two to 14 days from vaccination. One of the 10 probable cases of pericarditis was in a participant with a history of messenger RNA vaccines and pericarditis. Illustrating the limitations of this type of spontaneously reported data, we just recently received confirmation by the Australian Health Authority that two pairs of the pericarditis cases are duplicate reports, bringing the 10 reports of probable pericarditis down to eight. It's worth noting that as of April 30th, all of the probable cases were reported from Australia, despite the fact that the doses administered in Australia account for only 17% of global administration of the 744,000 doses administered worldwide. No reports of probable cases had been received from other regions, including the EU and South Korea, which also have robust surveillance systems. And those regions also account for the majority of doses administered. We take all reports of adverse events seriously. As we examine the accumulating data and continue our collaborations and discussions with global regulators, we will get a better understanding of the nature of the cases and a more precise and stable estimate of the rates. We then expect to have more clarity on whether or not this important safety risk is related to the vaccine. We do consider myocarditis an important potential risk 
and we are very carefully monitoring our post-authorization data. Additionally, we attempt to follow up each reported case with targeted questionnaires, and these data are being communicated in our analyses and our monthly summary safety reports. Our close monitoring will also include safety studies, which will cover large populations in administrative claims databases and electronic health records. For these other specific events of interest in our clinical development program, there were no reports of anaphylactic reactions or TTS in our integrated safety data. While our integrated safety data from our EUA submission did not have any cases of Guillain-Barre, a recent update to an SAE of neuropathy from study 302 has provided information that meets the Brighton Collaboration case definition for Guillain-Barre syndrome. We will, of course, continue to carefully monitor for these events in our post-authorization surveillance activities. Because pregnant women ex were excluded from all our studies, there is limited information on pregnancy. For all women of childbearing potential, a negative urine pregnancy test was required at screening and prior to vaccination. But as it occurs for all large studies with long follow-up, we did have some reports of pregnancies. As of March 15, 2022, a total of 147 pregnancies were reported across the entire clinical program. 56 of the pregnancies were still ongoing and 41 resulted in live birth. 25 experienced miscarriages, 13 women elected to have voluntary terminations, and one had an ectopic pregnancy. There were no fetal deaths or stillbirths reported. Because pregnancy data was not systematically collected and there are inherent reporting and ascertainment biases, you can't make direct comparisons to background rates and draw definitive conclusions. But overall, this data does not indicate a potential risk for the mother or fetus, and there are no specific restrictions for pregnant women in our global labels. In order to continue safety surveillance for very rare events that may not have been seen in clinical development, we also have plans and strategies in place to address potential safety concerns following emergency use authorization. Our post-authorization pharmacovigilance investigates potential risks such as vaccine-associated enhanced disease and myocarditis. Novavax supplements are routine monitoring with monthly summary safety reports and targeted follow-up questionnaires. Qualitative and quantitative reviews using multiple data sources for signal detection are conducted on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. Additionally, we plan to conduct five post-authorization studies. They include two effectiveness studies and two safety studies using administ administrative claims and electronic health record databases to robustly characterize the safety profile in the post-marketing setting. And study 405 is a global registry that will provide us with important data in pregnant women who receive our vaccine. So in summary, the Novavax COVID vaccine safety data supports positive benefit risk and a favorable reactogenicity profile. Our vaccine is well characterized with exposure in more than 30,000 recipients across the entire clinical program in the pre-crossover placebo-controlled portion of the studies. Local and systemic reactogenicity events were generally grade one to two in severity and resolved within one to two days. Grade three and higher events were infrequent. Importantly, we saw low rates of fever post-vaccination, and most AEs were mild to moderate in severity. When we look at our long-term post-crossover follow-up, where more than 40,000 recipients received the vaccine, rates of SAEs were low and comparable to placebo. And for the important potential risks, we will continue to monitor for these events with our ongoing and future safety studies. Thank you. I'd like to invite now Dr. Greg Poland to share his clinical perspective on the Novavax COVID vaccine. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here to provide my clinical perspective on the Novavax vaccine. I've been a practicing internist for 40 years and have served as a PI 
of over 40 vaccine clinical trials, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the journal Vaccine. I've spoken to this committee before about the need for COVID vaccines, and I'm here today to discuss why the Novavax vaccine is an important addition to what is already authorized. As we are all well aware, two years into this pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 variants continue to challenge and re-challenge us. And a major reason for the continuing pandemic is that despite the availability of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and the constant efforts of our public health officials to increase vaccination rates, millions of Americans today are still unvaccinated, as we've heard. While I expected some of the challenges we're seeing today with this pandemic, I'm still surprised to see how this virus continues to unfold and what we're learning about the long-term and multidimensional impact the virus is having on individuals and the public health. There's no question that our ability to quickly develop vaccines has been impressive. However, the complexity and dynamic nature of this virus emphasizes the need to have multiple vaccine platforms to fight it. For those individuals who are not fully vaccinated and are waiting for another option, having a vaccine platform that multiple stakeholders, including regulators, physicians, and the public are familiar with, can help mitigate some of the challenges we're facing today. Indeed, a recent Occugen Harris poll found that 73% of Americans would like additional COVID-19 vaccines developed from a more traditional method. Perhaps this is no surprise considering what we've witnessed during the pandemic when people become concerned about vaccine safety or tolerability. The latest CDC data reports that 89% of the U.S. population over the age of 18 have received one dose. And then we see the uptake of a second dose and booster shot fall precipitously. Only 77% have gotten a second dose and only 50% the first booster. There are many indications that decrease is linked in part to concerns people have about vaccine safety, reactogenicity, and efficacy. I certainly see that in my own practice. In the last year, I've received innumerable requests from physicians asking how to treat patients who've had a reaction to one of the currently available COVID-19 vaccines. Reactogenicity is a real problem and one that prevents a significant number of people from being fully vaccinated. So what is the benefit of the Novavax vaccine platform? The data show that combining the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein with an immune-enhancing adjuvant stimulates robust antigen-specific immune responses and provi provides high efficacy. Importantly, the vaccine is not highly reactogenic and compares favorably with other vaccines. We saw that borne out in the sponsor's clinical trials, where most events were mild to moderate and resolved in just a day or two. And as a reminder, the vaccine was able to deliver 90% efficacy with this favorable reactogenicity profile. This well-defined recombinant protein platform demonstrated safety and efficacy in two large phase three clinical trials against numerous variants. The combination of the immunogenicity data showing robust antibody responses across multiple variants with clinical efficacy data from the phase three trials signals broad cross protection. This will be vital as we head into an era where we simply don't know what the next variant will be. Simply put, it's important to have choices in vaccine platforms in a pandemic that is constantly evolving. It's also important to make it as easy as possible to get vaccines to the people who need them. While many of us think of logistics in the cold chain and increased access as an issue in the developing world, there are also many healthcare providers in the United States 
who will find the ease of storage and administration of the Novavax vaccine to be a significant benefit over current vaccines. Every day we're learning more about just how important it is to remain vigilant about trying to control this pandemic in the longer term for both the individual and the public health. Someone who is unvaccinated has a fourfold greater chance of getting infected, is 23 times more likely to be hospitalized, and has a 20-fold higher chance of dying than a vaccinated person. The fact that we're still seeing more than 300 people die every day in America from COVID-19 is simply unfathomable to me. In fact, there are far more than the 100,000 new cases being reported each day. This is clearly an undercount due to the amount of home testing. These cases are resulting in almost 3,000 new hospitalizations per day. And this represents a significant opportunity to protect health with vaccines. And this is just the impact from the immediate acute infection. One aspect of this pandemic that is just starting to be understood is the long-term impact. And this includes both the individual and our healthcare system. A study published in Nature this February showed that one year after recovery, people with COVID, whether mild or not, had a substantially higher risk of 20 different cardiovascular conditions than those who did not have COVID. These conditions like heart disease, vascular disease, and heart failure are likely to negatively affect the health and life expectancy of people for years, if not decades to come. In addition to physical ailments, the new research is also documenting the mental toll COVID is having on people. A study also published this February, this one in the BMJ, reported that people who had COVID and were hospitalized were more likely to experience anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and to experience opioid disorders. And these physical and mental health issues due to COVID are preventable if we get a handle on this pandemic and offer people choices that they may be more likely to use, thereby encouraging them to get vaccinated. In summary, as a clinician, I believe the Novavax vaccine offers benefits to multiple stakeholders. <clears throat> Patients and providers will find the Novavax vaccine an easy and logical option based on its efficacy, safety, and tolerability, especially the millions of Americans who say they are waiting for another option. Pharmacies and distributors will find this an easy and logical option for logistical reasons, because as we've heard, it's easier to ship, store, and administer. Employers will find this an easy and logical option to encourage people to get vaccinated. And finally, policymakers will find this an easy and logical option because it's a vaccine that's easy for people to access, easy to explain, and a choice that people want. One last note, while we're here today to discuss only the COVID vaccine, the clinician in me is also hopeful about the continued potential of this vaccine platform. By design, it's inherently amenable to combination vaccines, including influenza, RSV, and other respiratory illnesses. We've had remarkable success increasing vaccine compliance utilizing combination vaccines in children. And ultimately, this can be true in adolescents and adults. As I conclude, I want you to understand that speaking today, speaking to you today is both personal and professional for me. I've dedicated my career to researching and fighting infectious diseases. I've taken care of patients for over 40 years, and I've seen firsthand the miracle of what vaccines can do. We have an opportunity and a need to be proactive and continuously vigilant as the challenge and the fight against COVID is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. Authorizing an effective vaccine with a different mechanism of action is not only important for Americans, but will have an impact on global health. 
Our goal should be to have the right vaccine for the right person, for the right purpose, at the right time. And having more vaccine options with different platforms is a key component of achieving just that. Thank you for your attention. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Dubofsky to conclude. Thank you, Dr. Poland. The results from our clinical development program strongly support the emergency use authorization for people 18 years of age and older. Our vaccine is based on a differentiated platform that is well understood. The common protein vaccines have been used globally for decades. Our adjuvant, Matrix M, is a natural saponin product, and saponin-based adjuvants are used globally. Importantly, our vaccine achieved 90% efficacy in our phase three study in the US and Mexico, despite the majority of cases being attributed to variants. Our vaccine offers a favorable reactogenicity profile with most symptoms resolving after one or two days. And our safety data that was collected in a diverse American population supports a positive benefit risk profile. In summary, NVX 2373 can be a useful tool in addressing the ongoing pandemic, providing a different option that may be helpful in increasing the incomplete vaccination rates in the U.S. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Monto. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes for some specific questions. I want to remind uh, the committee that we will have a much more uh, time, uh, less time constrained uh, discussion after we hear the FDA presentation. And I want to remind you that yes, we do know there have been other variants. Yes, we know there are booster shots being given uh, and there are mix and match strategies, but that's not what we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes of questions. We're going to be talking about the presentation of uh, of the data on the clinical trial that is being considered uh, for our evaluation right now. Dr. Levy. Hello, uh, thank you for that presentation, which was very interesting. I had two quick questions. One is regarding the apparent lower vaccine efficacy or VE in Hispanic or Latino individuals. The presentation pointed out that this was puzzling because the immunogenicity appeared to be similar to other groups uh, and that maybe this was a chance observation. Another interpretation may be that we don't understand the correlative protection well enough and that what's being measured for the immune response doesn't capture what is protecting. So does Novavax have a comment on that? The other question regarding safety, are there any lessons to be learned from looking at safety data of other studies with other saponin-based uh, adjuvants? Thank you. Yeah, so, so as far as your first question goes, there's emerging data now from um, uh, our phase three study, 301 study, uh, that was supported by the uh, U.S. government. And there's a correlate of protection analysis that's, that's emerging now. And uh, the best correlate that was, in fact, identified appears to be linking it to neutralization, neutralizing antibody. Uh, now, we looked at those uh, patients, the Hispanic participants, uh, very closely. Uh, we were uh, interested to know if they were uh, from the U.S. or Mexico. And in fact, all the cases were, were in the U.S. And when we looked carefully at the other risk factors, we didn't identify anything specifically, which uh, seemed to ha have pointed toward an increased risk. Uh, so right now, our, our best um, estimate is that it may be a chance finding alone. Now, as far as other saponin-based uh, vaccines, the, the largest uh, database uh, for our particular version of saponin is clearly the studies we presented today. Uh, we have data from um, multiple antigens that we've tested previously in pre-licensure studies, and that includes uh, influenza, which we took through a phase three study, and the reactivity profile looks, looks comparable. And, and certainly, we didn't uh, see anything that looks like any of the um, uh, events of concern that we talked about previously. The other saponin-based vaccines uh, are largely, um, well, they're distributed both in the U.S. as well as globally. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure that uh, there's anything specific we can learn from them because clearly they are uh, given with different antigens. Uh, so, so that um, leads to a different biological profile. Thank you. Dr. Pergen.
Okay. I think I was unmuting and somebody unmuted me. I apologize. Um, so I had a question just about the the instance of COVID. It seemed as though um, the benefit was primarily after the second dose of the vaccine, um, which was around three weeks that second dose was given. Does the company have any data on antibody responses following the first dose, um, knowing that uh, the, the data that Dr. Poland presented, um, not everyone does get a second dose of vaccine, and is there evidence or do they have additional data on those who only received one dose of vaccine and the antibody responses in those? Yeah, so so uh, the Kaplan-Meier that Dr. Mallory showed showed the uh, showed the rates diverging at day 21, which was the day the second dose was administered. So obviously, it takes time for that second dose immune response to mature. Mm -hmm. So we we uh, we uh, would posit that some of that benefit we're seeing is really from from the first dose. Um, we have looked at efficacy following. The first dose, um, and I, I think I'll need to bring that data to you after the lunch break. Uh, I don't seem to have it readily available right now. That's okay. perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to uh, Dr. Berger. You don't have to wait till your camera pops up to speak. Go ahead, Dr. Berger. <laughs> we see you. Dr. Berger, did you mute your phone? Yeah, did you mute your own phone? There you go, sir. Okay, sorry. I, I just wanted to come back to the uh, question around vaccine efficacy in Hispanic populations again and just see if you've, if you've been able to conduct any subgroup analyses to look at the 18 to 64 range and the 65 plus to, to uh, evaluate vaccine efficacy in, in each of those subpopulations by themselves. Yeah, there, there, were, there were very few number of cases, if, if you remember. There were a total of uh, 27 cases. And um, I, and, and in, the, in, the, in the elderly, there were really very few cases. As Dr. Mallory presented, there, there were only six cases total. So I'm not sure that would be an informative analysis to, to look at. But we, we can try to do a two-by-two two table over the break. Thank you. Dr. Meisner. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Monto. I uh, have, have one uh, comment which will lead into my question. That is, there's an interesting editorial this week in the New England Journal about whether the world needs additional um, vaccines. And the, and the article points out that there have been 11.5 billion doses of COVID vaccines that have been distributed, which sounds like a big number, until you remember there are almost 8 billion people on the planet that we need to uh, vaccinate. And the distribution, obviously, of, that, of those vaccines have been unequal between high-income, middle-income, and, and low-income countries. Um, so clearly, there's a need for additional vaccines. And furthermore, it may be that a, pro that a protein uh, platform vaccine, such as the one you're using, offers advantages over the messenger RNA vaccine, which is what leads to my question. And that is, Dr. Mallory mentioned that there was a reduction in upper airway um, viral numbers among people who had uh, received the vaccine, suggesting that there may be some mucosal impact um, from this vaccine, and it might have perhaps a, a, a better effectiveness at reducing infection in addition to severe illness. Um, can you quantify that? Have you looked at IG, mucosal IgA, or do you have a sense of how well uh, this vaccine might protect against infection versus severe disease? Over. Yeah, the, the data that Dr. Mallory referenced was um, primate work, and, and there what we demonstrated and is published now is that the vaccine is capable of uh, generating sterile uh, immunity in the upper and lower airway. We, we, we don't have IgA uh, data 
uh, from the studies. Those are difficult to collect, uh, and during the pandemic, uh, we, we weren't actually able to do that. Uh, what, we, what we do know uh, is um, the vaccine is capable of preventing uh, infection uh, from our clinical studies. Uh, and, and we measure this by looking at, at uh, seroconversion to N, uh, to N protein, as well as being PCR positive. Um, and perhaps I'll be able to, to briefly share that data with you. But what, what we saw uh, is that in the UK study, uh, we were able to prevent um, infection in 82% of the uh, people who, who were vaccinated. And obviously, if you don't get infected, you, you can't transmit, you can develop emergency variants, and, and you can't, um, um, can't have long COVID because you're not infected. Thank you. Finally, Dr. Marasco. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Mallory. So I have a, um, uh, Dr. Mallory's, I have a comment on Dr. Mallory's uh, presentation and a question on, on study 301. So if I have the data right, you looked at neutralizing antibody responses 35 days after um, their second boost, and you followed the patients for you know, roughly 50 days. Is there a time dependent? Um, uh, is there a time dependence for breakthrough infection? Do you have enough data to know that? Because with your high uh, neutralizing antibody titers that were measured at day 35, and then your follow-up period, is there a time dependent um, risk in, in acquired infection? Um, All right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, as, as we described for all of our studies, we had to institute a crossover into the design. And that's because emergency use uh, vaccines became available. And to maintain integrity of the study, we, we had to uh, provide everyone a vaccine. What that did is it took away our ability to have placebo control data beyond the crossover period. Uh, the issue with uh, looking at the breakthrough cases for our, for our specific vaccine in study 301 is there were very, very few cases. So, uh, you know, you could see from the Kaplan-Meier curve kind of where they fell out. Uh, and, and there wasn't a specific um, uh, uptick uh, as time went on. It was relatively flat, if you remember the, the data that Dr. Mallory showed. Thank you. We're going to be trying to catch up by taking a break now. Uh, why don't we see, uh, stick with the... Uh, the 15 minutes we had before, so we will reconvene at 11.30 Eastern time. And then we're going to shorten our lunch to half an hour so that we can fully catch up and uh, start the uh, oral public hearings on schedule. So break until 11.30 Eastern, 15 minutes.
All right, and welcome back from that quick break. And just to keep us on time, I'm going to hand it over to our chair. Uh, uh, Dr. Monto, are you ready? I am ready. And we have one presentation before our lunch break from the FDA presenting the review of effectiveness and safety of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine in individuals 18 years of age and older. And Dr. Lucia Lee will be our presenter. Dr. Lee. Um, good morning. I'll now present the FDA review of clinical data submitted in the Novavax COVID-19 emergency use authorization request. I'll start with the, the regulatory background and the overview of clinical studies, followed by the design of Study 301, the main source of efficacy and safety data to support the EUA request, additional safety data from other studies, and then a summary of risks and benefits and the first five questions. The Novavax COVID-19 vaccine contains five micrograms of recombinant spike protein and 50 micrograms of matrix M adjuvant. The proposed primary series is two doses given three weeks apart. This slide presents an overview of clinical studies and the number of vaccine recipients in the safety population during the pre-crossover period. The primary source of clinical data to support the EUA request is study 301 which provides the safety and efficacy data in approximately 20,000 vaccine recipients who were initially randomized to receive the vaccine. Additional safety data from approximately 10,000 additional vaccine recipients were provided from three studies conducted with the vaccine produced by an earlier manufacturing process than the vaccine evaluated in study 301. In study 301, an ongoing randomized observer-blind placebo-controlled phase three efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity study, a total of approximately 30,000 participants, 18 years and older in the US and Mexico, included adults who by virtue of age, race, ethnicity, or life circumstances were considered at substantial risk for exposure to SARS-CoV-2. These participants were stratified by age groups 18 to 64 and 65 years and older. During the course of study, of the study, COVID-19 vaccines authorized for emergency use became available, and participants when eligible for vaccination per national and local public health prioritization recommendations were offered the opportunity to cross over from the originally assigned study treatment to the other study treatments, the vaccine to placebo and placebo to vaccine. The primary efficacy endpoint was assessed until the participant received the first blinded crossover vaccination or until the data cutoff of September 27, 2021, whichever came first. And there was also a humoral assessment of humoral antibody responses assessed in a subset of participants. The safety assessments included uh, the following. The solicited systemic, local and systemic adverse reactions during the seven days after each vaccination, unsolicited adverse events and medically attended adverse events through 28 days following the uh, second vaccination in both the pre-crossover and the post-crossover period. And through the duration of the study, medically attended adverse events attributed to study vaccines, serious adverse events, and adverse events of clinical interest. Efficacy was assessed through daily surveillance of symptoms suggested of COVID-19 throughout the study follow-up. Symptoms of COVID-19 experienced by participants during the post-vaccination follow-up prompted an unscheduled illness visit in person. A nasal pharyngeal swab was collected and sent to the central lab for processing. Additionally, participants were also given a, a kit to begin self, uh, daily self-nasal uh, swabbing within three days of symptom onset and collected for a total of three days. 
the swabs were also sent to the central labs for processing. Molecular confirmation of SARS-CoV-2 infection by the central laboratory was required to meet primary and secondary efficacy endpoint case definition. The primary efficacy objective was to prevent PCR-confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 illness diagnosed seven or more days after completion of the primary series. Primary efficacy endpoint was the first episode of PCR-confirmed mild, moderate, or severe COVID-19 assessed up until the blinded crossover period. The primary objective would be met if the point estimate of the vaccine efficacy was 50% or more and the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval was greater than 30%. And below, some of the secondary and exploratory efficacy objectives are also shown on this slide. These are the case definitions for mild, moderate, and severe COVID-19. And the data sets to support the EUA the FDA conducted independent analyses of data sets with different cutoffs and extraction dates. And these included data efficacy and safety data with the cutoff, data cutoff of September 27, 2021. These were clean data sets. And then safety data was requested um, from FDA to review clinically important safety events. And this was an extraction date of February 17, 2022. And these were from data sets that were not fully cleaned. This slide presents disposition of all randomized participants as of the data cutoff of September 27, 2021. A total of 29,945 participants were initially randomized in a two to one ratio, with 19,963 vaccine participants and 9,882. Uh, placebo persi persi um, persi participants who received saline. 96.8% of the vaccine group and 95.7% of, of the placebo group completed the two-dose primary series. Then 77.7% of participants who were initially randomized to the vaccine group and 64.8% in the placebo group elected to participate in the crossover portion of the study. This slide presents the efficacy analysis population. The protocol population for efficacy was comprised of participants who received two doses of the vaccine or placebo at the pre-specified time points and had no major protocol deviations prior to the first COVID-19 positive episode no confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection during the surveillance period or prior infection due to SARS-CoV-2 at baseline, and were not censored prior to the start of the observational period. 78% of vaccine participants recipients and 73.1% of placebo recipients completed at least two months of follow-up after this two. And then the second per protocol efficacy set included all participants regardless of baseline SARS-CoV-2 status. Here's the per protocol efficacy population. And they were balanced in terms of male percentage of male and females. The median age was 40, uh, 47 years with 12% of participants uh, 65 years and older. In terms of race and ethnicity, 11% of participants were African American, 6% were American Indian or Alaska Native, 4% were Asian, and 22% were Hispanic. The main comorbidities were obesity and chronic lung disease. The primary efficacy endpoint was assessed until the participant received the first blinded crossover vaccination or until the data cutoff of September 27, 2021, whichever came first. In the pro-protocol efficacy set during the pre-crossover period, 21.7% of participants who received the placebo were unblinded with the intention to receive a COVID-19 vaccine under EUA as 
compared to 13.2% of participants who received the vaccine. And these participants were censored uh, for the primary efficacy analysis at the time of unblinding. So the results, uh, the primary endpoint for 18 years and older as a whole was met. The vaccine efficacy for the first episode of PCR confirmed mild, moderate, or severe COVID-19 was 90.4%. And of the 17 cases of COVID-19 in the vaccine group, all were mild in severity. And there were, in the placebo group, there were 60 cent, 66 cases which were mild, nine which were moderate, and four cases that were severe. There were no hospitalizations or deaths due to, death due to COVID-19 among the 96 primary endpoint cases. In an analysis of the primary efficacy endpoint provided for participants who were SARS-CoV-2 positive at baseline, among the 300 participants who were SARS-CoV-2 positive at baseline, there were no COVID-19 cases that occurred at least seven days after the second dose. So the vaccine efficacy, regardless of baseline SARS-CoV-2 status, was 89.8%. And in the age group 65 years and older, the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval for the vaccine efficacy, the vaccine efficacy estimate was 16, negative 16.6. Uh, there were six cases, uh, two in the vaccine group and four in the placebo group. And the vaccine efficacy, or the 95% confidence interval for the estimate was wide. To provide supportive data, for the effectiveness in adults 65 years and older, a postdoc analysis of the vaccine efficacy among participants 65, uh, 50 to 64 years of age was conducted at FDA's request. And the neutralizing antibody titers in this age group was compared descriptively to those participants 65 years of age and older. And the table on the left summarizes the results of the immunogenicity comparison between the two age groups. The GMT uh, for uh, the participants 65 years of age and older was uh, a little lower than the GMT for the age group 50 to 64 years of age. And, uh, but the GMT ratio was 0.91 with the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval that would have met FDA's usual success criterion for immunobridging. And on the right, the vaccine efficacy estimate for age groups 50 to 64 years of age was 90.7%, which was comparable to the overall vaccine efficacy for ages 18 years and older, which was 90.4%, and for the age group 18 to 64 years of age, which was 90.1%. These are the results of the secondary and exploratory efficacy analyses. First, the efficacy against um, COVID-19 among, uh, among for variants of the 96% cases of in the primary efficacy analysis, 75 cases had sequencing data available, which were mainly the alpha variant. And these were classified uh, in the sponsor's presentation according to the CDC classification uh, during May 2021. So currently, as of June 2022, none of the variants identified in the primary efficacy analyses were considered variants of concern or variants of interest. The second analysis was vaccine efficacy against mild to moderate, uh, sorry, moderate to severe COVID-19. Of the 13 cases, uh, there was a total of 13 cases in placebo arm and none in the vaccine arm, resulting in the vaccine efficacy estimate of 100%. Third, the vaccine efficacy by race was comparable uh, to the overall study population, and as discussed previously, there was a lower vaccine efficacy estimate for participants of Hispanic ethnicity. 
For the participants in the safety analysis set, these participants were enrolled from a total of 19, 119 sites in the U.S. and Mexico. In the pre-crossover period, as of the cutoff date, September 27, 2021, the median duration of follow-up during the pre-crossover period was 2.5 months. And the safety analysis set included uh, 19,111 participants in the vaccine group and 9,416 participants in the placebo group. And 77.8% in the vaccine group and 72.8% of placebo recipients completed at least two months of the safety follow-up after the second dose. In the post-crossover period, the median duration of follow-up after the fourth dose was 4.4 months, and 99% of participants in each study group were followed for at least two months after the second crossover dose. Third, the sponsor provided, at FDA's request, additional safety data through the extraction date of February 17, 2022, to assess the clinical uh, assess clinically important adverse events. And at the time of the extraction date, the median duration of follow-up was 8.4 months after the completion of the crossover series. So the demographics of the safety uh, analysis population in the vaccine group and the placebo group were similar. And uh, the demo The conference call is now ending. Now joining your meeting. You are muted by the host. 27 other participants. Or go ahead with your microphone. I think I can. We did not detect any digits. Yeah. Can you still hear me now? Yep, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. So the safety analysis population. Okay, um, so this, the baseline and so the demographic and baseline characteristics. I think I'm hearing an echo. Yeah, go ahead and turn off your speaker. Uh, turn down your speaker. Again, if you want to just reconnect your audio, ma'am, right now you're on speaker but on your microphone, on your computer. If you want to dial back in, it's up to you. Otherwise, you can continue, but uh, just turn your volume down. I'll help you. Okay. We were not able to automatically recognize you. Please enter your assigned code. Yeah, let me... Ma'am, I'm going to dial you in a different way real quick. Uh, 
If you could look at the chat pod, just give us a quick momentary break, and I'm going to help uh, our speaker here. Um, Again, just give us a minute while we help out Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, you with us? Dr. Lee. Yeah, can you hear me now, Mike? Yes, I can. Just go ahead and mute your speakers and then continue, okay? On the top of your screen, just go ahead and mute the speaker symbol and you can continue, okay, ma'am? Okay. Um, All right, take it away. Okay. Um, so the demographic and ca baseline characteristics in the safety analysis population in the vaccine group and the placebo group were similar in the pre-crossover period and uh, also the pre-crossover period, uh, the demographic and baseline characteristics were similar to the post-crossover period, and the safety analysis that was similar to the for protocol efficacy. Says. This slide shows the uh, overall rates of reactogenicity. Still there, ma'am? Lucia, are you still there? Ma'am, did you mute your own phone? Oh, oh you, you dialed back in. Here we go. Okay. There you go. There you go, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead. So the solicited adverse reaction, um, Reported were reported in higher proportion of the, the vaccine recipients than the placebo recipients, and more frequent after vaccine dose two than dose one. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details of this, but in general, uh, the vaccine, the local um, and systemic adverse reactions um, lasted, were mild to moderate, and lasted about one to three days. So this slide shows unsolicited adverse events and the frequency of non-serious unsolicited adverse events occurring through 28 days after dose two by time period are shown here. In the pre-crossover period, the percentages of participants reporting at least one non-serious unsolicited adverse event were comparable between the vaccine and the placebo group. And in the post-crossover period, the percentage of participants reporting at least one unsolicited adverse event was lower than the pre-crossover period, but slightly and slightly higher in the vaccine group than the placebo group. In terms of grade three reactions and grade three reactions considered by the investigator uh, as related to the study product, all those percentages in both the vaccine group and the placebo group were low. The key findings in the pre-crossover period included that there were no adverse events by preferred term reported by more than 1% of participants in either study group. There were imbalances in the system organ class of general disorders and administrative site conditions and blood and lymphatic system disorders, which were largely due to reactogenicity and lymphadenopathy, respectively. Lymphadenopathy was reported by a higher proportion of participants in the vaccine arm for dose one and dose two. 
which was 0.06% and 0.2% respectively, than in the placebo group. The most commonly reported severe unsolicited adverse event in the vaccine group was fatigue. The percentage of participants reporting serious adverse events was similar in the placebo group and the, and the vaccine group in both the pre-crossover and the post-crossover period and ranged from 1% to 1.4% across study groups. The percentage of participants reporting SAEs related to study vaccination was 0.1% in both the vaccine group and the placebo group in both and in both time periods. The percentage of deaths reported in the vaccine and placebo groups was less than 0.1% in both time periods. This slide shows the number and percentage of deaths reported in the pre and post crossover periods by study group and the causes of death. For participants with fatal cardiac arrest, there were five in the vaccine group during the pre-crossover period uh, compared to three in the placebo group and one in the post-crossover post period in the vaccine group. Um, for most of these participants, they had underlying factors, <clears throat> conditions with, which were risk factors for cardiac arrest. However, at this time, there was limited information available to assess the cause of death as uh, the, some of the autopsy data were not available. And participants in this study was randomized, were randomized in a two-to-one ratio, which could account for more vaccines, for more events in the vaccine group. Additional data presented uh, through uh, the February 17, 2022 extraction date, all of these deaths had a time to onset of 140 days or more following the dose four in the crossover period. None of these deaths were considered by the investigator or FDA as related to vaccination. In the pre-crossover period, the most common serious adverse events that occurred at higher rates in the vaccine group than the placebo group were cerebral vascular accident, acute cholecystitis, atrial fibrillation, pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia, and spontaneous abortion. In the post-crossover period, the most common SAEs occurring at higher rates in the vaccine group uh, versus the placebo group were ischemic cardiac events, which included myocardial infarction, uh, cholecystitis, both chronic and acute, and pneumonia. In terms of uh, events of clinical interest, which included um, potential immune-mediated medical conditions, there were uh, numerical imbalances observed in the following categories of cardiac, neurovascular, embolic and thrombotic, and biliary events. In terms of cardiac events, there was an imbalance of events of cardiac failure and cardiomyopathy with 0.5% in the vaccine group and 0.02% in the placebo group. Almost all of these participants had underlying conditions that were risk factors, and the time to onset was comparable between the two groups. In the post-crossover period, there was an imbalance in events consistent with myocardial infarction, and the time to onset was comparable between the two groups. In terms of neurovascular events, in the pre-crossover period, there was an imbalance in events consistent with stroke, and three of the events occurred within 15 days of the most recent vaccine dose, and both events in the placebo group occurred within 15 days of the most recent placebo dose. Cumulatively, through February 17, 2022, there were a total of 19 neurovascular events consistent with stroke that were reported in the vaccine group in the pre- and post-crossover period. The time to onset from the last vaccine dose uh, for 11 of the 19 cases that occurred greater than 61 days after the last vaccination. In terms of thrombotic and embolic events, in the pre- 
and post crossover period. Uh, the non cardiac, non neurovascular, thrombotic, and embolic events were balanced in the pre and post crossover periods. However, there were eight, eight participants in the vaccine group that is, uh, experienced events within 21 days of the most recent vaccine dose without plausible alternative etiologies. And cumulatively, through February 17, 2022, there was an imbalance of pulmonary embolisms that, were, that occurred during the post-crossover period. Um, however, most of the events in both study groups had an onset of greater than 90 days after the most recent dose and the proportion of events with onset less than two weeks were comparable. In terms of biliary events, in the pre- and post-crossover period, there was an imbalance in cholecystitis, and the 18 events in the vaccine recipients in both time periods, uh, six of those had an onset within 30 days of the vaccine dose. In terms of other uh, events of clinical interest. Uh, those included Bell's palsy, uh, and these were all in the pre-crossover period. There was Bell's, one case of Bell's palsy uh, within 30 days of uh, vaccination in each of the placebo and vaccine groups. In terms of uveitis, there were three participants in the vaccine group. Uh, with new onset uveitis within three weeks of vaccination, one of which recurred with rechallenge. And in the placebo group, there were two events of uveitis, one of which had onset within one week of placebo and a participant that had a history of uveitis. And lastly, there was one case of one event of angioedema and urticaria that occurred two days after dose two uh, in the vaccine group, which was potentially related, um, but the participant also started antibiotic uh, and antibiotic concomitantly. And a uh, review of additional safety data from studies 101, 301, and 501, which were conducted in Australia and the U.S., uh, 302 was in the United Kingdom and 501 was in South Africa. Um, the FDA reviewed serious adverse events and adverse events of clinical interest. These studies were conducted um, with the vaccine produced by an earlier manufacturing process than the vaccine evaluated in 301. So out of the three studies, there was one event, Gambare syndrome, that was reported by a 65-year-old female in the vaccine group who experienced progressive neuropathy starting at nine days after dose one. And other than this event, there were no new serious adverse events, adverse events of special interests, or potentially immune-mediated conditions in these studies that were considered at least possibly related by FDA that were not already previously identified in study 301. So in a total clinical safety database of about 40,000 vaccine participants to date, six vaccine recipients reported myocarditis and or pericarditis, including five events that occurred within 20 days after um, the Novavax vaccine. So these are the cases that a uh, little bit more detail. And these cases were concerning for the following reasons. Um, the temporal relationship for five out of the cases occurred within 20 days after vaccination, and the event was, um, and only one of the event among the vaccine group had a clearly identified alternative etiology associated with myocarditis, and the other events had only circumstantial evidence of potentially plausible alternative etiologies. Four of the events occurred in young men, which is a subject population known to be at higher risk for mRNA COVID vaccine-associated myocarditis. Now, uh, continuing to the, um, 
subset of the sponsor-submitted post-marketing safety data. And as of April 30th, 2022, there were about um, 7,500 uh, 700,500 doses administered in Australia, Canada, Euro the European Union, New Zealand, and South Korea. The sponsor reported a, p a potential safety signal for myocarditis and pericarditis listed here. And the observed to expected rate ratio for all doses was 4.95. So in summary, the known risks uh, the known and potential benefits include that the vaccine was efficacious uh, with an estimate of 90.4%, and the efficacy estimates from Study 301 were generally consistent among subgroups stratified by demographic variables and uh, for the risk of severe COVID-19. The uncertainty in the benefits include um, vaccine effectiveness against currently circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants, long-term effects of COVID-19 disease, effectiveness in certain populations at higher risk of severe COVID-19, uh, and the duration of protection. The known and potential risks associated with vaccination include local and systemic reactogenicity, myocarditis and pericarditis, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. And there are uncertainties in the risk in certain populations and uh, for adverse reactions that are uncommon and re that require uh, longer follow-up, which include biliary events, neurovascular events, cardiac events, and UVI. Sponsors submitted a post uh, pharmacovigilance plan to monitor safety concerns that could be associated with the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. The FDA recommended adding myocarditis and pericarditis as an important identified risk, and the sponsor um, considered as important potential risk vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease, myocarditis and pericarditis, and anaphylaxis. The sponsor will conduct um, several post-marketing um, activities, which include active and passive surveillance activities, uh, periodic aggregate safety review of safety data, and five planned surveillance studies. So the pharmacovigilance activities include adverse event reporting, um, which come from vaccine recipients, vaccine providers, or the sponsor themselves. First, the vaccine participants will be notified that adverse events can be reported to VAERS through the, va the fact sheets for recipients and healthcare providers or from the vSAFE program. Adverse event and these events, uh, this reporting is voluntary. For the vaccine provider and the sponsor, uh, these adverse event reporting is mandatory. For both the vaccine providers and the sponsor, they report to VAERS the following information. Serious adverse events, irrespective of attribution to vaccination, cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in adults, and cases of COVID-19 that result in hospitalization or death. In addition, the sponsor will also conduct periodic aggregate safety review of safety data and report newly identified safety concerns. Both the FDA and CDC take a collaborative and complementary approach to reviewing adverse events. In the initial stage of post-authorization post surveillance, FDA will individually review all serious adverse events on a daily basis. FDA will also examine other sources of AE, such as in the literature, and perform data mining to determine if the adverse events are disproportionately re reported for the candidate vaccine compared to other vaccines and VAERS. And other potential safety signals will also be investigated. In addition to passive um, surveillance, FDA will also perform active surveillance studies for safety outcomes. These studies will be conducted using the Biologics Effectiveness and Safety System, which obtains safety outcomes from various healthcare settings. 
and active surveillance will also be performed using data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The sponsor also proposed five post-authorization surveillance studies. The first is the Pregnancy Exposure Registry, and uh, the second and third are two active follow-up safety studies, one in the U.S. and one in the U.K. And the last two are real-world effectiveness studies, one in the U.S. and one in Europe. Lastly, the sponsor was requested to include certain safety outcomes in active safety surveillance studies, which includes the assessment of cardiac, neurovascular, embolic and thrombotic, and biliary events. The sponsor will also perform enhanced pharmacovigilance activities for safety outcomes of GBS and uveitis. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and uh, apologies for the uh, interruption. You did very well, <laughs> considering. Uh, we do have a few minutes uh, for questions now before the lunch break. And uh, I don't see any hands raised. Is that the system's fault or? No, no, there's no hands raised at the moment. <laughs> I was looking to. No hand raised. I can't believe it. No. Oh, wait, wait, here we go. We got our first one. Here we go. Okay, Dr. Gallen. I also wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Brandon Day will uh, answer questions pertaining to the pharmacovigilance plan. Thank you. Dr. Gallen. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we're going to get into it later, but the th thank you for that great presentation. There's a lot of detail and you had to deal with the system. So none of that is easy. So thanks for that. Are, are we going to get into sort of the real world part of this? This is that we heard the study uh, data is through the end of September. A lot has happened since then. I'm guessing study participants had had real lives and done other things, like gotten other vaccines from whomever, uh, maybe had other experiences. Is that going to come into play at, this, at, at some point? Uh, Dr. Day, do you want to take that question? Uh, who did you want to take that question again? Um, Brandon Day. Brandon, go ahead and unmute yourself. Or anybody else who wants to answer that question. I don't see Brandon in here right now. I'll call Brandon back in just to be safe. So uh, go ahead. Let's go to the next question real quickly. I don't see another question. Can't believe it. If you give us a moment, we'll bring um, uh, Mr. Day back in here. So, or anybody else who can answer that question it might be yep. uh, Dr. Fink or Dr. Marks. Here we go. There's Brandon. Brandon, you there? Make sure you're not bring uh, uh, Mr. Day back in here. So, Brand Brandon, uh, go ahead and can answer that question. Hey, I'm, re I'm reconnected. Can you restate the question? Please? Hi, we hear you. Go ahead. Want me to go again, Bruce? Why don't you go, sure. go again, Doc? Yeah, no, Doctor Fink. Um, Doctor Fink. All right. Here thank you. Well. So, uh, all right. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes. I also wanted to yes, we hear you. We did review okay. data through the safety data through February 2022. So that that's so so that's the good news is that you somebody's continue to follow these patients as you said for safety past the mm -hmm. end of the study. The question is, what else are we going to learn about the vaccine recipient about the the, the trial participants since the study? Durability, other vaccines that they may have received. Did they get boosters of Novavax or, or, as well? Um, and and so, because that's it, so this is entering into the real world of other vaccines. And while it's not our purview to figure out how they're going to be used, if and when they're available, 
that's going to be our, that's going to be an important consideration. And so any data about that, and including any data about Omicron, which is missing from this uh, discussion because it wasn't surface, it wasn't a, it wasn't present in September, but it's quite present now. And hopefully, people are still being followed in an Omicron environment. Thank you. So the study was conducted uh, quite a while ago, and so there were. Uh, the cases that accrued were not during the time that Omicron was circulating. And in terms of, uh, we tried to focus mainly on the primary series, which is the, the topic of this conversation, of this VERPEC. So, uh, we were not prepared to uh, further discuss the topics of uh, participants who um, got boosters uh, and those related topics. Dr. Fink, are you in the position to straighten things out? I, I, I will try, although I, I have to admit I'm, I'm having a lot of problems on my end with, with the system here, figuring here. out on or, or not. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes. Okay. Great. So I, I think that the main points, as, as Dr. Lee summarized, are that we do have um, rather long-term uh, safety follow-up that we were able to review in, in detail for, for all of these study participants. Um, there has been, uh, you know, some use of the vaccine uh, worldwide in post-authorization settings, although we really don't have uh, much data to report uh, on that beyond uh, what is been summarized in the slide. Uh, if this vaccine is authorized for use in the U.S., clearly we will need to um, have the same uh, intense level of, of post-authorization safety surveillance as we, as we have had for the uh, other COVID-19 vaccines that have uh, been authorized, uh, some of which have, have gone on to be uh, approved uh, and, and, uh, and fully licensed. Um, and uh, again, I, I just have to reiterate, I, I know that there is uh, intense interest in the potential for, for using this vaccine um, as a booster dose in individuals who might have received a, a primary vaccination with some other uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we, we don't have uh, the, the capacity to discuss uh, that potential use today uh, or uh, data uh, related to that use, but if if this vaccine were to be authorized for use as a uh, as a uh, primary series, uh, we could take an approach similar to what we have uh, for the other authorized COVID vaccines for considering use um, as a booster dose, and we would uh, evaluate uh, study data to inform the, the safety and effectiveness of, of a booster dose uh, as it comes to us. Over. Okay. Thank you. And we have Brendan and we have Brendan Day also on as well. Brendan, do you have anything to add? No, I think they covered it. Thanks. Okay, this will be a persistent uh item of discussion as we go through the rest of the day is my um, humble prediction. Uh Dr. Lee Um, yeah, thank you for that presentation. I think one of the questions that I have, and I don't know if you're exactly the person to ask, um, this actually was designed as a crossover so that um, individuals were randomized to either receive the vaccine first followed by placebo and then placebo followed by vaccine. Um, so far, obviously, the primary endpoint was based on the original um, randomization to vaccine versus placebo before the crossover, um, although we have seen some safety data after the crossover period. Is there any plan to analyze I mean, typically the crossover, you have a washout period and then you do this, the second comparison. And the reason I ask that is it would seem as though those that had started with a vaccine and then went to placebo, that there might actually be a carryover effect that might actually have give us some indication as to waning immunity or not. And I didn't know if there were any plans for that analysis to be done to separate the pre and post uh, crossover in terms of efficacy, not, not just safety. Uh, I think the sponsor can can add, but the study since the study is still ongoing, there are um, 
provisions to collect samples to look at the duration of protection. Okay. Right. Why, don't we park, why don't we park that question, Dr. Lee, and this is something we can come back to when we have a broader discussion with the sponsor online as well after lunch. Okay. Uh, Dr. Meisner. Um, Dr. Lee, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you um, about the FDA's experience with uh, baculovirus uh, insect cell protein expression systems. I don't think it's been used very often. Do you have any other other specific issues uh, regarding safety um, with that? eukaryotic protein expression system that 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 the FDA worries about? Uh, I'd have to defer this question to Dr. Fink or others from the FDA. Yeah, hi. So we, we do have uh, an example of a recombinant protein-based uh, seasonal influenza vaccine, flu block. Uh, that uh, has been approved and is manufactured using a, a similar uh, expression system. We, we don't have any safety uh, concerns uh, attached to that vaccine, uh, you know, specific to that, that manufacturing platform. Thank you. Not seeing any ha further hands raised to my amazement. Uh, we will be able to start lunch a few minutes early. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for your careful presentation and uh, handling the uh, technical issues in the middle. Uh, so back for the open public hearing at 1 o'clock. Thank you. All right. So everyone, just give us a moment as we pull up the lunch and uh, and nobody log off and take break yet. So let me.
Okay, tell us when we're live. <laughs> All right, and welcome back to the 173rd uh, meeting for Vaccines Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. I will now hand the meeting over to our chair, uh, Dr. Monto, and our DFO, uh, Dr. Prabha Atreya. Take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome to everybody to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in, trans in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, the product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses in connection with your presentation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to devise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address the issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your state statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. Prabha, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monto. Uh, before I begin calling on the registered speakers, I would like to add the following FTA guidance. FTA encourages participation from all public stakeholders in its decision-making processes. Every advisory committee meeting includes an open public hearing session during which interested persons may present relevant information or views. Participants during the OPH session are not FTA employees or members of this advisory committee. FTA recognizes that the speakers may represent a range of viewpoints. The statements made during this open public hearing session reflect the viewpoints of the individual speakers and are their organizations only and are not meant to indicate agencies' agreement with the statements made. With that uh, uh, guidance provided, I'm going to first call on the first OPH registered speaker, uh, Mr. Benjamin Newton. You have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, so the, the question we have here, right, and this is always the question, is how can we save the most lives? This is the question that constantly faces this committee and all of the FDA. The question before VRFPAC today is easy to answer. Authorize Novavax as vaccine. It's highly effective, something we knew more than a year ago. Plus, it hurts less than the mRNA vaccines. It appears from the limited data that the FDA has shared the myocarditis issues are likely a result of data mining errors, but we will only know with more data. From my view, there's a clear benefit to a vaccine that hurts less. For example, I have an acquaintance who recently got sick with COVID because he didn't want to get boosted because the mRNA vaccines hurt too much. All of this is really an aside to, to the rest of my presentation. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so really the, the thrust here is, is about how we can better protect people, right? The question we have to ask ourselves as a regulatory body is how best do we serve the people of this nation? Should we provide people with options or should we stand in the way of pr people protecting themselves? Today, children under five still have no access to vaccine nearly a year after the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended approval using zero bridging data. Today, Omicron-specific boosters have not yet been approved six months after we knew that they were required. Today, we all suspect that antibody half-life long-term will be about 90 days. So we will need boosters about every six months. However, it's very challenging for people to get access to needed boosters. The question we are trying to answer is not if these vaccines are safe, but rather, are they safer than the alternative? They are clearly safer than COVID. Next slide. So why was Novavax delayed? 
Novavax's vaccine demonstrated efficacy superior to J&J's vaccine before J&J was approved. Instead of approving Novavax in January 2021, the FDA required a second phase three trial for one of the best vaccines, delaying approval. At this point, Novavax's vaccine has been authorized for use in more than 100 countries, courtesy of the WHO. Like all approved vaccines, this could have been approved sooner. What went wrong at the FDA? What can we do better next time? These are questions that only the FDA can answer. Next slide. The FDA prevents access to life-saving medicines. Why? In fact, that is the entire point of the FDA, block access to drugs to prevent dangerous drugs from entering the marketplace. This is a constant balancing act, one that is impossible to get right, but that the FDA must constantly work to improve. Some reasons for delayed approval are likely to be incentives. No one gets fired for being conservative with drug approval. FDA committee members derive revenue from illness and or clinical trials. This is to be expected as it's populated by doctors. You are all likely familiar with the trolley problem. People feel differently about having agency in an outcome versus just letting people die by preventing access to medicines. The FDA does not quantify the mortality and morbidity associated with both action and inaction. We count the people injured taking bad medicines. We don't count the people injured by lack of access to good medicines. Diversity matters and it's highly important for effective decision making. There's almost no diversity on VRVPAC, partially by design. <clears throat> and someone is not on mute. Uh, so we know that there are problems. It would be surprising if there were not. So what can the FDA do to improve? You can set clear guidelines for approval of vaccines for all known pathogens today. You can create data standards and automated data feeds for clinical trials. You can publish this data in real time, redacted of personally identifiable information, allowing for real time analysis. You can quantify and assess the risks of both action as well as the cost of inaction. You can increase diversity on FDA committees. You can create a process to authorize vaccines in 30 days for all ages. Then name a pathogen and let the FDA and the industry practice. We are going to have another pandemic. It's only a matter of time. And this group is the group that can best prepare us for that eventuality. Next slide. On slide six, our future is bright. So this may have seemed like all doom and gloom, but it's not. We have this bright future. There are a few hundred viruses that cause disease in humans. It's a tractable problem. What is nice is that vaccine development is actually very cheap, less than a million dollars per vaccine. Unfortunately, clinical trials cost hundreds of millions of dollars with most of the cost occurring during phase three. With modern statistics and a highly effective vaccine, phase three trials are a measure of how effective and safe a vaccine is, not if it is safe and effective. This allows regulators the ability to streamline and standardize trials and data flows, reducing costs, increasing the speed of innovation. If we want people to stop getting sick and dying from viruses, the safest course of action today is vaccination, a process impeded by a current regulatory environment. I really thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Uh, you, you've done so much work over the last couple of years um, getting these vaccines approved. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Kathy Kaveny. My name is Kathy Kaveny. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. East Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, India, Switzerland, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, the United Arab Emirates, four countries of the United Kingdom, 27 countries of the European Union, Canada, and the World Health Organization have all approved the Novavax vaccine. A vaccine developed by a company in Maryland funded with $1.8 billion of United States citizens' hard-earned taxpayer money, and yet it has still not been approved for the American citizens who paid for it. Why not? Why in the United States, bastion of freedom and personal choice, are Americans served up only one type of vaccine option, mRNA, while the rest of the world gets choice? When Operation Warp Speed was initiated, it funded seven companies. Practically speaking, we are now down to two, Moderna and Pfizer, and both are mRNA platforms. The FDA's response to the delay in approving Novavax has seemingly been two issues, the amount of trial data to be reviewed and the need to inspect Novavax's manufacturing. I question both. Your contemporaries and review boards across the world have managed to review Novavax's trial manufacturing data and expeditiously approved this vaccine. 
what is it about this data that is somehow more onerous for the FDA to interpret? A Wall Street Journal article attributed the delay to manufacturing inspections, quoting a source as saying, pandemic safety protocols made it more difficult for FDA inspectors to get to Novavax's overseas manufacturing site. I failed to see why, in the midst of a global pandemic, with millions dying, the FDA couldn't put on a mask, get on a military plane, and fly to India to inspect Novavax's one manufacturing site. Certainly, many inspectors from other countries did. Throughout the last two years, I've learned a great deal about why others want Novavax. I've learned that there are American citizens who, after two years, still haven't left their homes because they have medical reasons that won't allow them to take mRNA vaccines. I've learned that many Americans have been fired or quit their jobs rather than be forced to take the one type of vaccine that their employers mandate. I've learned that many have had adverse reactions to mRNA vaccines. At this same meeting two months ago, there's a very committee heard from American citizens, many in tears, who described their adverse reactions to mRNA and pleaded with you to help. I've learned that Americans with dual citizenship have resorted to going to other countries in hopes of receiving the Novavax vaccine where it has been approved. Americans paying to go to other countries to get a vaccine that's headquartered 20 minutes from your office. I've learned that while we deny our own citizens the Novavax Novavax vaccine, we allow citizens from other countries who have been vaccinated with Novavax there to freely travel here. I've learned that Americans who want Novavax choice are not vaccine hesitant or anti-vax or afraid or whatever other terms the media likes to use to marginalize us. We're simply informed Americans who believe that this is a better, safer vaccine and we want what our $1.8 billion paid for. And where is America's leadership on this? Full disclosure, I voted for President Biden, but I don't understand how a country can invoke the Defense Production Act to manufacture and import baby formula, yet in a time when millions are dying, can't figure out how to get Novavax from India, or better yet, help them produce it in the United States. A year ago, President Biden was quoted as saying, the problem right now is that we have to make sure we have other vaccines like Novavax and others coming on. Also a year ago, she showed Biden's COVID czar had this to say about Novavax. Quote, I realize that the Novavax vaccine results won't get the same attention as we heard from Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. But for vaccinating the world, this is huge. Very, very good news. Novavax is essential to vaccinating the globe. The fact that Novavax has 90% efficacy is awesome. And yet, still nothing. Awesome news for the globe, just not for the United States. An emergency use authorization based on today's meeting will certainly be a step in the right direction, but it would be largely meaningless if you do not follow quickly behind that with an EUA to allow people to choose Novavax as a booster to the Moderna, Pfizer, mRNA vaccine they have already received. A week from now on June 14th and 15th, the same committee will review Moderna and Pfizer's applications for immunizing six months to four-year-old children. Byzantine reason Novavax can't advertise in any of the countries where it's already been approved until it's approved by the FDA. Without advertising or marketing or media coverage or governmental promotion, parents aren't informed. Many don't know that elsewhere in the world vaccine choice exists, and they should exist for they and their children. Parents don't have the time or energy to sit around and read up on what this and do it. Instead, they will rely on your recommendation. Because they are scared and wanting to protect their kids, they will rush to vaccinate our most vulnerable with the only option you've allowed them. You won't put the brakes on this, but you should, until they're given a choice. Parents should be able to make informed decisions about their children's health, and you should inform them. Which brings me to the media. You are complicit. I'm a mother, not an investigative reporter. I'm tired of the battle and have eighth grade math homework to focus on. Do your job. Ask questions. Quit regurgitating what you were said. I challenge you to verify or discount every detail of what I've said here today. You have one week until this committee meets again to determine approval for mRNA in infants and toddlers. Again, parents should be informed. You should inform them. Members of this committee, you were charged with evaluating the benefits of this vaccine, but you also have the awesome responsibility of ensuring American citizens continue to have freedom of choice. Thank you for allowing this mom for Novavax to speak. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mitchell uh, Goldstein. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Dr. Mitchell Goldstein. I'm a uh, professor of pediatrics at Loma Linda University Children's Hospital. The emergency use authorization request by Novavax for a vaccine to prevent 
COVID-19 in individuals 18 years of age and older should be granted. As reported by Dunkel et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine, data from two separate studies involving over 30,000 participants demonstrated a composite efficacy of approximately 90% in preventing significant effect infection. Although this data was collected prior to the presence of Omicron and other subvariants, this vaccine product is the first traditional protein-based vaccine to achieve this level of protection. The vaccine has been authorized for emergency use by the World Health Organization and can be used in over 170 countries worldwide. Current mainstream United States immunization regimens for COVID-19 involve the use of mRNA technologies. These immunizations have resulted in decreased morbidity and mortality when measured against the demographic considerations of an unprotected population. However, the frequent need for boosters and the broad public perception of these technologies as untested and thus untrusted demonstrates the need for a traditional protein-based technology that mirrors those of the more trusted traditional vaccine products currently on the market for other viral diseases. Further, the need to provide effective protection to pregnant women and their particular concerns regarding the use of mRNA immunizations and potential consequences to their unborn babies, as described by Hageman and Goldstein in Neonatology Today, provides further corroboration of the need for an effective traditional protein-based vaccine product. Please make this vaccine available to provide additional protection for those most at risk groups. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is David Charles. David, you're unmuted. I'll make sure your own phone isn't muted. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to, direct, to address today's Food and Drug Administration Vaccines and Related Biologics Product Advisory Committee. My name is David Charles. I'm a practicing physician in Tennessee, and I'm here today on behalf of my role as founding member and chief medical officer of the Alliance for Patient Access. The Alliance for Patient Access is a national network of policy-minded healthcare providers who advocate for patient-centered care. The Alliance is supported through associate memberships, grants, and donations from a diverse group of organizations, including Novavax and other vaccine manufacturers. The Alliance supports health policies that reinforce clinical decision-making, promote personalized care, and protect the physician-patient relationship. Motivated by these principles, Alliance members participate in clinical working groups, advocacy initiatives, stakeholder coalitions, and the creation of educational materials. On behalf of the Alliance for Patient Access, we would like to commend the FDA and the Advisory Committee on the important work that you have done in ensuring safety and the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines throughout the pandemic. As we know, access to FDA-approved vaccines has slowed the spread of COVID and undoubtedly saved the lives of untold numbers of Americans. However, despite the work that the FDA and the emergency use, use authorization process um, has, has done in approving COVID-19 vaccines, there continues to be vaccine hesitancy among the American population. The World Health Organization has listed vaccine hesitancy as one of the top threats to global health. They further noted that the reasons some are choosing not to vaccinate are complex, but a lack of confidence in the vaccine is a concern. This lack of confidence can stem from a lack of understanding about the newer or unknown vaccine designs and technologies. While the mRNA and viral vector vaccine designs are available, they're still not well known to the general population, which makes additional vaccine options valuable. Having another vaccine design introduced, such as a recombinant-based design, may encourage those who are vaccine-hesitant to finally become vaccinated. 
There continues to be many unknowns about the virus, variants, and long-term effects of contracting COVID-19. It is imperative that Americans have access to a variety of safe and effective vaccines to ensure greater uptake and to protect individuals and the public. As the virus evolves, additional vaccine options are important to meet the needs in keeping the Americans safe. The benefits of more COVID-19 vaccine availability, especially, especially with those who are vaccine hesitant, greatly outweighs the risk of declining to authorize the use of safe and effective vaccines. We're asking the committee to strongly consider emergency use authorization of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine applic applicants that use different, historically well understood vaccine designs. It is to the benefit of every American to have additional vaccine options other than mRNA, including protein-based vaccines if available. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is uh, uh, Charles Vittel, Chad Vittel. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Chad Rittle. I am a professor of nursing at Chatham University in Pittsburgh and have been promoting public health and universal vaccination of adults for many years. Thank you for this opportunity to address the Vaccines-Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting today to discuss the issuance of our emergency use, author use authorization request for the Novavax vaccine to prevent COVID infection in individuals 18 years of age and over. I would like to put forward three reasons to support this EUA. First, there are currently approximately 258 American million Americans who have received at least one dose of vaccine and two-thirds of the population can be considered fully vaccinated. That's 221 million. Accepting these statistics at approximately one-third of the population is still skeptical of the COVID-19 vaccine. How can we persuade those reluctant Americans to get vaccinated? The Novavax vaccine produces an exact replica of the spike protein of the COVID-19 virus that prompts our immune system to produce antibodies against the virus. This may help those who are hesitant, who are not supported of the messenger RNA technology that comprised the first two vaccines currently under EUA. This vaccine does not involve utilizing any of the genetic functions in the human cell. Specifically, there is no production of messenger RNA to make new proteins within the cell. The vaccine uses proven technology by presenting antigens to the immune system, resulting in production of antibodies. Additionally, the, Co the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine includes a special adjuvant, Matrix-M1, bonded to the particles in the vaccine. This matrix very strongly boosts immune responses similar to the adjuvant used in the Shingrix doctor vaccine. With this boost, even people over 80 years of age who typically have weak immune, immune responses to vaccines can respond. Secondly, I have been actively working to promote vaccines to enhance public health in America for close to 20 years. My first publication promoted universal vaccination against pertussis was the result of my doctoral research project addressing an outbreak within a school district with, that resulted in over 70 cases in multiple age groups. The paper was published in 2010. Vaccines have been proven to help to prevent disease in all age groups, and the meta-analysis described the effectiveness of pertussis vaccine, showing that patients were more than twice as likely to contract pertussis. The vaccine doses containing pertussis antigen were missed or administered late. Third, during the past two years, I have been closely monitoring the COVID-19 pandemic 
while attending ACIP meetings as the ANA liaison representative and conducting research doing an academic sabbatical in fall of 2021. One result of that study was publication of an article titled COVID-19 Vaccine Hesitancy and How to Address It, published early this year. Points discussed included vaccine hesitancy describes an unwillingness of citizens to accept vaccines that are accessible and available. Currently, one-third of the population has not received any dose of vaccine and are at risk for significant disease, hospitalization, and death. We need another tool in the arsenal to address the concerns of this significant segment of the population. Secondly, not all health care workers are accepting our acceptance of COVID vaccine. A reliable media report documents that 20% of nurses refused the initial vaccines due to questions about safety and efficacy. A proportion of the population, a third point, are grouped as in-betweeners, those adults who have taken a wait-and-see attitude. This group typically includes women, younger adults, and an ethnic minority background with less education. Common concerns include vaccine safety, skepticism about the risk of COVID-19, belief they are already immunized from prior exposure, and reservations about efficacy. There are many approaches to educating this hesitant population. It is key that we make another, vac another effective vaccine available that may be more acceptable to this broad and complex population. Hesitancy crosses many boundaries between gender, ethnic, ethnic groups, and socioeconomic classification. Let's not forget that social determinants of health can also influence vaccine acceptance. Some of those factors include political beliefs, education, low trust in scientists, where they live, where they work, where they get their news information, and how they evaluate health risks. Just because someone in the family had COVID would not necessarily influence acceptance of the vaccine. I strongly urge the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee to approve this emergency use authorization to make another vaccine tool available to help achieve universal vaccination against COVID. With another choice available to doctors and nurses, we will have a better chance of convincing adult citizens to accept COVID-19 vaccine more readily. The Novavax COVID-19 vaccine could help break down some of those barriers of which many of us are aware and help achieve the World Health Organization's achievement of 70, goal of, excuse me, of 70% coverage with COVID-19 vaccine throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Ms. Sophia Phillips. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the National Center for Health Research. My name is Sophia Phillips, and I am a fellow at the center. We analyze scientific data to provide objective health information to patients, health professionals, and policymakers. We do not accept funding from drug or medical device companies, so I have no conflicts of interest. Today, the panelists are asked to evaluate if the benefits of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine outweigh its risk for use in individuals 18 years of age and older. While this vaccine demonstrates similar levels of efficacy as compared to vaccines approved for COVID-19, the data suggests additional safety risks. As was stated in the FDA materials, there was an elevated risk of myocarditis and pericarditis demonstrated in Study 301. Further, this risk could be higher in the Novavax vaccine compared with mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. There were six cases identified pre-authorization of Novavax, while no cases were identified before the authorization of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Although these serious complications were also identified for mRNA vaccines, that was only when the much larger numbers of people were vaccinated. 
not the original mRNA study participants. Data from passive surveillance in other countries where the Novavax vaccine is authorized also indicate a higher than expected rate of myocarditis and pericarditis associated with the vaccine. As a result, the FDA requested that the sponsor change myocarditis and pericarditis to an important identified risk on the pharmacovigilance plan. The design of Study 301, which is the basis for today's discussion, initially resembled that of the three COVID-19 vaccines granted in EOA. They were similarly phase three randomized placebo-controlled trials with a similar number of vaccinated participants. However, when the study design transitioned to a blinded crossover due to the availability of EUA vaccines for certain populations, it weakened the value of the data. Efficacy of the drug compared to placebo could only be determined in the pre-crossover period after dose two for approximately two months before the opposite treatment was given to each participant. Therefore, it is not possible to assess sustained efficacy over a longer period of time. It remains unclear how long protection lasts. And while the FDA remains hopeful that Novavax will provide some meaningful protection against Omicron, that is also uncertain, since the vaccine was primarily studied on the alpha variant. Additionally, very few of study participants were immunocompromised, pregnant or lactating, or at risk of severe COVID because of cardiovascular, chronic renal, and chronic liver disease. That made it impossible to meaningfully evaluate the vaccine's efficacy for those populations. Few cases of PCR-confirmed COVID-19 were analyzed for participants over 65 years of age, limiting the value of the efficacy data for that age subgroup. For those that were studied, there was a 12.5% dip in vaccine efficacy for individuals 65 or older which is also typical for the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. What would be the value of this vaccine compared to the three COVID vaccines that have already been approved? If it is less safe than the other three vaccines, it does not provide additional benefit to make up for that. Even if it is not proven to be less effective than the other COVID vaccines, it lacks long-term placebo-controlled efficacy data, and there's very little safety or efficacy data for the most at-risk patients. When we already have vaccines on the market that are FDA approved and based on much better data, why would the FDA authorize this vaccine? Wouldn't it just add to the controversy surrounding COVID-19 vaccines? Thank you. Thank you uh, for your comments. The next speaker is Martha Dawson. Ms. Dawson. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. I'm here today to support another technology to fight COVID-19 and the many growing variants. When one is at war, many different approaches are used by land, air, and water. Although the public is exhausted and ready for this pandemic to end, there really is no light at the end of the tunnel. As a nurse for 45 years and the current president and CEO of the National Black Nursing Association, representing over 500,000 registered nurses, licensed practical and vocational nurses, and nursing students nationwide, I am also fatigued from educating, testing, vaccinating, and addressing other health and social determinants that place black and brown population at risk during this pandemic. And we know that more of them have died. In addition, NBNA nurses have been on the front line. We have been serving every day. From March the 20th, when this first variant of the COVID hit our nation. Therefore, I encourage the FDA to give us another more traditional medical intervention in this fight and approve this vaccine. African Americans and black nurses that I represent and give voice to are on the front line of this pandemic. And they continue to watch more of our population die. They have lost colleagues, spouses, partners, parents, children, and other relatives and friends. Let us be very clear, COVID-19 is a public health crisis. 
However, it has been politicized with myths and disinformation. Therefore, some people will never become vaccinated, put its other at risk, and unfortunately, people are not following public health policies and best practices. It appears that the world is just tired of wearing masks and washing their hands, isolated and being social distant. However, through the lens of public health, this is exactly what is still needed today. But again, since the majority of the population is not leaning in that preventive and health promotion direction, we have to look for other measures. And I do believe that having another vaccine will give people options. Maybe some of those that are still sitting on the sideline say, well, let's just wait until a few more are vaccinated. But that put us at risk. And it brings to mind of me talking to a close friend this week. I mean, just this week. With another under 40-year-old relative ended up with COVID pneumonia. How many of our young people are we going to allow to die or are we going to allow to become sick? So, again, it's unfortunate that people are not following public health policies and best practices. So we have to look for other options and give people more options. Many believe that these measures uh, did not work and are not going to work. However, we see cases still increasing. Yes, again, we have a breather. It's now summertime. We can be out. We can have more fresh air. But make no mistake, within another 8 to 10 weeks, we're going to move back into our kids going into the school system, and we will probably see another spike if we don't do something. So as I stated, I represent nurses and nursing students, and the future workforce for this profession is not good. It is projected that over 1 million nurses will be needed in the United States, and over 6 million will be needed worldwide by 2030. My colleague, it takes three to four years just to educate one nurse. So if we continue to use, lose nurses because they are fatigued and they're tired and they just can't see one more patient expire from this COVID pandemic, then we're going to continue to have them leave the occupation and look for other things to do. So I want to just say, let's think about this because, yes, I know nurses and physicians and other in the healthcare space, they are also refusing to be vaccinated. But we need to continue to provide options to reduce excuses and as many excuses as we possibly can. This is why I strongly support and encourage the FDA to approve the Novak uh, vaccine. So I say, and I would like to close with this, in the art of humanity and public safety, since we as a country have not been able to lean in and accept that this is a public health crisis and that we should not only protect ourselves but those around us, then we need to have other options. So let's look at this and say, is it going to do more harm, or does we lean that pendulum towards it could be the next thing that saves your life or your loved one life? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Last but not least, Mr. Kermit Kubit. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a graduate of Caltech, the Harvard Law School, and the Harvard Business School. I have participated in BRB, PAC, and ACIP meetings, including the October 22nd, 2020 uh, BRB, PAC meeting on developing and licensing vaccines, the December 20th, Pfizer EUA meeting and the September 17, 2021 
uh, VRB meeting on boosters, and I have no conflicts and no fiscal interest in the in the company being um, considered. The question to the ACIP is: Do the benefits outweigh the risks of a two-dose series of vaccination for persons 18 years and older for NVX COV 2373? I look at this in the evidence in the form of a structured benefit risk table of the form previously adopted by the FDA. One, the condition to be treated. Two, available alternative therapies. Three, the benefits of the proposed drug, including uncertainty. Four, the risks of the proposed drug, including uncertainty. And five, the summary conclusion in view of all available evidence, including uncertainty, about the benefit risk and is it positive. Point five is similar to the question presented to the ACIP meeting. In my analysis, the condition to be treated is prevention of COVID-19, mild, moderate, or severe, including hospitalization and death. The alternatives are other vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, as well as Janssen and AstraZeneca, and treatments such as Paxlovid. As one of the initial questioners on this panel asked, why EUA if there are other available vaccines? As other speakers before me have discussed, vaccine hesitancy is a serious problem. Some people may not be able to take mRNA vaccines, and um, we need as many tools as we can get to control and eliminate this pandemic. The benefit of the Novavax vaccine is elimination in the treatment arm of 17,000 patients of moderate to severe COVID-19. The risks of the Novavax vaccine are significant adverse events of about 1% for Novavax and 1% for placebo. Uh, the uh, the Novavax vaccine versus the placebo showed about uh, no moderate or severe cases versus uh, 11% moderate cases and 5% severe, or about 16% severe or moderate COVID-19 cases, which were not occurring in, with the Novavax vaccine. This demonstrates significant efficacy. In addition, the Novavax vaccine has now been administered to hundreds of thousands of patients outside the U.S., so there is available data on its effectiveness. See the study published in Cell by the La Jolla Institute of Immunology, uh, Professor Daniel Weisskopf and Shane Crotty, who found antibodies after six months were highest uh, uh, with the Moderna Pfizer and Novavax vaccine. Um, all participants retained a similar percentage of memory CD4 plus helper T cells. It's important to have multiple vaccines ready and approved to fight COVID-19 to provide initial protection, to provide protection against variants, and to provide protection against boosters. As uh, the CDC has noted, heterologous Booster vaccinations may provide significant benefit, even if mixing and maxing vaccines. Finally, I'd like to thank the ACIP and the FDA. You have saved a million lives by your providing vaccination through all the vaccines, despite all the time it's cost you to attend these meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. And uh, thank you uh, for your comments and the presentations. And uh, this uh, concludes the open public hearing session. And uh, we're going to be moving on to the next items on the agenda as we have finished with the pre-registered OPH speakers. Thank you. And I hand over the meeting to Dr. Manto. Manto, take it away, please.
Thank you, Prabha. Question is, do we we have a break scheduled and reconvening at 10 minutes past 2? Uh, is it possible to begin the meeting at 2 instead? Prabha? Dr. Marks? Or should we go to 2.10 as we are scheduled? <laughs> Uh, I, I let me just check with our technical people, but as long as they say that we can move ahead, well, we will move ahead. Yep, we're ready. We can move ahead if you'd like to. I, I believe in that would be wise to do. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Go ahead and proceed. Okay, well, we're moving ahead now to the additional question and answer session, which uh, is uh, regards of both the presentations of the sponsor and the FDA. And Dr. Marks, uh, would you like to say a few comments before we go uh, ahead with this session? Yes, thank. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. So I, there, there have been some questions about uh, how. Uh, the, the Novavax vaccine will fit into the other vaccines. And I, I think what, what we need to say here is that we are here to consider the authorization for the primary series right now. That, uh, that, that means that this is the uh, initial step. There will be additional uh, submissions, I am sure, um, uh, and uh, additional consideration by FDA uh, of uh, both uh, uh, booster doses, additional populations, as well as uh, potentially uh, the activity of this vaccine or variant vaccines um, using this technology uh, right. uh, that will be submitted in the coming, uh, uh, that will be submitted or considered in the coming weeks to months. So I, I think we need to we just just so that the advisory committee meeting uh, members think about this um, uh, there will obviously be some evolution uh, of this uh, I believe uh, it's fair to say that and you can certainly feel free to ask the company that question as well um, uh, over uh, the the coming weeks to months uh, uh, to uh, essentially make it consistent uh, with uh, the vaccine paradigms that we are are, are using now, uh, Dr. Monto, does that I think is that helpful to the committee? Uh, that's very helpful, and uh, perhaps I could start the discussion by asking the sponsor if there's anything further that they would like to tell us, uh, which might help in our deliberations, uh, given the fact that all the testing was done in the era of alpha. And we're now uh, preparing to launch a vaccine in the era of various uh, Omicrons. So uh, does the sponsor want to give us any additional information that might be valuable to us? Sure. And, and then, um, Commando, should I, should I start off? With that topic, or do we to cover some of the questions that we deferred from uh, previously? It's up to you. We have more time than I anticipated, so we can we can have an in-depth discussion. Which this, is very this helpful. Is, can I can I make a suggestion? Why don't we stick to that? This since I just mentioned that, maybe it would be good if you don't mind just to address that that question now, so we we take care of that that issue before okay. moving on. Okay, sounds, sounds, sounds good. So let me parse it apart. So a couple things we talked about. One of them was expanding our, our indication beyond, um, beyond adults greater than 18 years of age. And as we've already talked about, we completed studies in adolescents 12 to 17 years of age. And uh, those studies have been the basis of approvals in other uh, territories. And certainly um, as soon as uh, we achieve EUA in, in the U.S., uh, our intent is to file that and to seek regulatory approval to s expand that indication. We have uh, also have data on boosting, both homologous and heterologous boosting. And once again, that's the sort of data uh, which uh, we are going to bring to the FDA to seek approval for the booster indication as well. So 
it's true that the efficacy studies we conducted uh, were conducted in the era before Omicron emerged. What we do know is the data that we've showed you is that the vaccine works well against the variants that circulated uh, during the conduct of the, uh, of the study. Uh, and there were a broad number of variants. And, uh, you know, this is a feature, we think, of our technology. So the recombinant proteins that are made in insect cells, which, which uh, give benefit to antigenic spread along with the adjuvant system. And this has proved to be true in our influenza vaccine, where it was, uh, the immune responses were shown to recognize a broad uh, array of H3N2 drifts as well as ancestral strains. And it's true in the efficacy data we showed you that showed that the vaccine uh, worked well um, against the variants that circulated. We additionally have data, immunologic data from uh, our uh, studies, uh, which look uh, at how they respond to uh, the Omicron variant. And perhaps uh, we can um, show some of that now. This is data from the um, U.S. adolescent study. Uh, and I bring this up because we don't have the comparable data for the adult data. But what you can see is the immune response against the original prototype on the left-hand side and the immune responses against uh, the uh, various variants that circulated, including Omicron on the far right-hand side, and this is the BA1 version. Now, um, what we can also look at is uh, data from our previous study, our, our uh, 101 study. Uh, once again, what this is looking at is uh, immune responses, IgG, after two doses and after three doses. Two doses in dark blue, three doses is in light blue, and you can see we get a nice boost against all uh, those variants with the third dose. Importantly, if you look at Omicron and look at the values achieved after three doses, uh, it's really comparable to what we saw after two doses to the original, and those were the kinds of uh, immune responses that were comparable with 90% protection in our efficacy study. Now, this is binding. What, well, how about neutralization responses? Here what I'm showing is a comparable graph, original on the left-hand side, Omicron on the right. Uh, and you can see there's a good boost, once again, between two doses and three doses. But importantly, between Omicron, after two doses, there's only 3.6-fold difference than from the original. And this is data generated uh, by the Matt Fryman Lab and the University of Maryland. Uh, and uh, so, so we have good confidence that not only are we generating binding antibody, but at least in this assay, uh, induction of neutralizing responses. So overall, uh, it's, it's factual that we don't have efficacy data against Omicron, but what we do have is a technology that we think uh, generates a broad immune response uh, demonstrated against uh, a broad array of variants. Thank you. And uh, now that we've had that question answered, uh, you have some other information that uh, you wanted to give us. So let's go on to that and then We've, seen, we've got hands raised. We've got questions from the members. Okay. So there was a question asked by uh, Dr. Meisner about uh, IgA responses. And what I'm showing you here now is data from resource macaques. And uh, what we're looking at is IgA titers in the vaccine group versus placebo group. And on the left-hand side uh, of the panel, we're looking at um, – uh, upper airway, so these are nasal uh, IgA, and the right-hand side, lower airway, so bronchial alveolar lavage. And you can see that uh, the vaccine does, in fact, induce IgA in both the upper and air uh, lower airway. And um, this was associated uh, with uh, sterilizing protection in this animal model in both the upper and lower airway uh, system. Now, I mentioned some data uh, earlier about the ability uh, that we have to stop infection, whether it be symptomatic or asympt asymptomatic infection. And I wanted to uh, bring a complete uh, read of that. And what I'm showing you here is the 302 data from the UK on the left-hand side I mentioned, and comparable data uh, in the US on the 301 study. So this is the ability for the vaccine to block all infection, whether it be symptomatic or asymptomatic. And the only difference between the 302 and the 301 study is the, uh, the, the time, the, the median time of surveillance in the UK study was, was longer. It was 100 days versus uh, 60 days uh, in the US study. And the point, once again, being is uh, the um, uh, sterilizing protection uh, and the IgA that we saw in the animal models may be a signal. This is what we're seeing as far as the ability for the vaccine to protect against all infection. And like I mentioned, obviously, if you stop infection, uh, you have the ability to prevent long COVID and transmission. 
Uh, there was a question asked by uh, Dr. Fergan about efficacy after dose one. And what I'm showing here is data from uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, study, the 301 study. And you can see that after dose one, there was a totality of 133 cases in the vaccine group and 156 in the placebo group, two to one randomization. And that gave a efficacy of almost 59%. And after dose two, it was 86% uh, in this analysis. And this is an FAS analysis, so it's like an ITT analysis. So it doesn't take into account uh, the uh, observation window, which starts seven days after post dose two in seronegative alone. Now, the uh, efficacy uh, that you see at 58%, that includes the time frame after dose two. So a lot of that efficacy is attributed to the time period after the second dose is administered. There was a third question asked uh, about uh, by Dr. Brian about the Latinos and in our uh, and the uh, proportion that was in uh, those greater than 65 years of age, and in fact there were no cases uh, in the uh, Latino group uh, in those that were greater than 65 years of age. And I think that's uh, what I, I did did think that perhaps you'd be interested in the immune responses we talked about uh, during the main presentation. On the uh, left-hand side, you see the day zero values. On the right-hand side, you see the day 35 values. In dark blue are the Hispanic Latino participants, and in light blue are the non-Hispanics. And, and you can see that the Hispanic population, in fact, had a, a slightly higher IgG titer than uh, those in the non-Hispanics. And when we uh, look at uh, neutralizing responses, we see a very similar pattern once again, a slight uh, increase in the dark blues that represent the Hispanic population uh, at the peak immune response to day 35. So I, I think those uh, tidy up the questions that were asked prior to the break. Right, and now we're gonna be moving into the discussion. And uh, I wanna remind the members that not only is the sponsor here to answer questions, but also the FDA representatives. So Dr. Offit. You're up next. Um, yeah, thank you, Arnold. Um, this is directed, I guess, to both the FDA and the CDC presenters. The, I agree with the FDA's assessment that that handful of cases um, of myocarditis that occurred within three or four days um, of receipt of the second dose of vaccine in young men is consistent with what was seen with the mRNA-induced myocarditis. So I think that is likely a causal, not coincidental association. It's also interesting in the document that the FDA handed us or handed out to us that they, they referred to a 2020 paper where there was a suspected molecular mimicry between SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the, he, the uh, heavy chain of, of, the, of alpha myelin on cardiac muscle cells. If that's true, then you would argue that really all uh, COVID vaccines, as well as COVID itself, should cause myocarditis. And, and, but that may well not be true. Uh, and this gets to Dr. Rubin's question. We really need to know whether or not this is true for the vector virus vaccines like J&J &J or AstraZeneca. We really need, need to know whether this is true for a, a whole inactivated viral vaccine like Sinopharm's vaccine, which has now been administered to millions of people, or whether it's true, I think most interestingly, for the Corbivax vaccine, which is a, a receptor binding domain vaccine, in other words, a truncated protein vaccine that's been given now to, to many people in India. I, I think it's incumbent upon us to know this, so to know whether it's about the, the protein itself or whether it's about the way the protein is being processed so that we can use that knowledge to make safer vaccines for a disease that is going to be with us for decades, if not longer. So I think this is a real opportunity to learn something. And I hope that it's not lost. We need to get the data, the kind of data that Dr. Rubin was referring to earlier. Thank you. Who's up to answer this rather critical question? Uh, I think uh, the FDA, I think in the briefing document, you raised the issue of mimicry. So it's, uh, why don't you try to answer it first? I'm sorry, who are you calling upon, Andrew? I mean, Arnold? I'm calling on FDA since it was in the briefing document, the uh, reference to the uh, issue of mimicry. There's Donna. Don, I'll, I'll unmute you. There you go. Okay, thank you. 
Um, yeah, so Dr. Offit, I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is, this is a critical question to understand uh, whether uh, vaccine-associated myocarditis is a class effect uh, related to S protein antigen, and, and if so, whether there are uh, other features of, uh, of specific vaccine platforms that mitigate either uh, positively or negatively um, uh, toward a, uh, a risk of, of vaccine-associated myocarditis. I think that the situation is, is clear for mRNA vaccine. Uh, we have some preliminary evidence from uh, the uh, clinical uh, trials of, of this vaccine from Novavax that uh, raises this concern, uh, although I think we need uh, more data from, uh, from post-authorization use in larger numbers of, of individuals uh, to uh, really get at uh, what the, 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 the rate of uh, myocarditis associated with uh, this vaccine is and, and what exactly the risk is. Um, as you heard uh, earlier uh, from Tom Shinovakuro from CDC, as we accumulate uh, more experience with the Janssen vaccine, which has been used uh, uh, to a much uh, lesser extent than the mRNA vaccines here, as well as outside the U.S., we are continuing uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, occurrence of, of myocarditis after that vaccine. Uh, and, and, of course, there's the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine and other uh, platforms that you mentioned as well. I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more that, that we, we really need uh, uh, to look closely at, at these events uh, and also to, to do the work uh, necessary to understand uh, what the, the mechanism might be. And so uh, I guess, you know, from an FDA perspective, we, you know, would, would endorse that, that viewpoint uh, strongly and, and, of course, uh, are um, uh, here to assist uh, vaccine manufacturers and, and the research community uh, in addressing this very important uh, issue. Any further comments from CDC? on this or from the sponsor? Yeah, a, a couple of points uh, to what Dr. Oppet said. Um, I mean, it's curious in the data we saw that the third boosting dose, there wasn't a, as big an increased risk after dose two. And that makes me wonder if there are other mechanisms at play than that that has been proposed. And, and we also know uh, about other vaccines associated myocarditis from the smallpox, monkeypox, and they don't even have the spike antigen. So I think, I think the, um, the story isn't completely written here, and we do need to more fully understand what's going on uh, before we can think about a class. Hi, this is Thank Dr. You. Shiva Pakaro from CDC. Can you hear me? We can. Um, Dr. Offit, I would just reinforce what Dr. Fink said about the importance of <clears throat> getting, um, the, getting the data that you mentioned. and. Um, I, I'm not so familiar with some of the other um, vaccines that are used outside of the outside of the United States, but I'm not aware of a similar association um, observed uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was widely used um, in, in Europe. Uh, similar association as is seen with the mRNA vaccines, um, and with respect to disease, uh, my understanding is that isolated myocarditis. Uh, following COVID disease is, is pretty rare. Um, and the adverse cardiac outcomes that you see after disease are, are, are often in association with MIS, which may be a different mechanism altogether. But, um, but, we're, but, but with respect to um, disease and just pure myocarditis or isolated myocarditis, it's a fairly r rare occurrence after COVID. Thank you, and thank you all for uh a discussion of an important topic that uh, we need more information about. Dr. Levy. Yes, I, I wanted to thank the sponsor for showing the uh, additional data uh, a few moments ago with some slides about antibody responses. Um, and I, I wanted to know, you know, those data were, were elegant, they were helpful, and yet without knowing what uh, 
level or concentration of antibody correlates with protection, it's a little hard to draw any conclusions as to whether this vaccine, how it would perform against Omicron. I mean, it seemed like there were lower responses, uh, lower uh, uh, binding uh, and neutralization uh, of Omicron than the other variants, yet there was some. Uh, but without, maybe I'm stating the obvious, without a correlative protection, it's hard to draw a conclusion one way or another. The sponsor made some comments about their impression of the correlative protection earlier in the day, and I'm wondering if uh, they can make some further comments in terms of where they would see the correlative protection to be on those graphs, and does Omicron reach up? I, I realize there's an element of speculation here, but it is the elephant in the room, isn't it? Yeah. Dr. Dubrovsky, do you care to speculate? I I will always speculate, but I, I agree that without definitive data, we won't know. L listen, we, we, we think that uh, we, we simply don't know if an Omicron-based vaccine is required, right? We, those studies are ongoing. They're, they're ongoing in, in um, the, you know, we sponsor a study in Australia. So we're looking both at an Omicron uh, vaccine as well as a bivalent format to see if that offers any advantage. Uh, what we what we do know is what we've showed you. Is this technology in general does a good job with antigenic spread and, and having a broad uh, response. And we do know that the binding and the new responses we see are, are relatively favorable. And the best I can do to compare, and I understand this is very, very fraught with, with potential error, is to try to compare it back to the levels we saw after dose two to, um, to prototype. And as you saw for prototype in the U.S. study, we had 97% protection. So where is the cutoff isn't clear. Uh, the signals we're getting right now is, 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 in our view, favorable, but we'll know for sure when the study reaches out in Australia. Thank you. Dr. Pergam. Uh, thanks, uh, Arnold. Um, I had a question about the adjuvant in particular. I know that the adjuvant comes from a particular tree, I believe it's in South America. Um, it is pretty, uh, my understanding is that it's a highly regulated um, supply chain. Um, do you guys um, have any comments about um, the ability to get this on a regular basis to make the, the vaccine available? Because I know that's an issue. Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, we took steps early on to secure the supply chain. There is a zero supply problem with the adjuvant. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Um, so thank you for that presentation. I think one of the questions I had earlier, and I think um, this is really for the sponsor, um, had to do with the uh, current design of the protocol, which actually was a crossover. Uh, most of the data we're seeing for efficacy is obviously related to the first random, uh, the, the first part where they randomized, obviously, the vaccine and placebo. Um, and I do understand the study is ongoing for the crossover part for the vaccine to placebo and placebo to vaccine. Um, and I think uh, the comparison of the second part after the, um, after the crossover would be very illustrative in terms of what kind of carryover effect you might have from those that started with a vaccine and then were getting placebo. Um, do you have that data, or when do you anticipate we would be able to see that? Yeah, so so you're you're right. That the crossover complicated or really eliminated our ability to, to look at placebo control data at, at the crossover time. Um, furthermore, uh, we've taken the opportunity to boost those participants with both dose three and some with dose four, which complicates the story even more. Yeah. Now, without a good comparator, and we and with new um, uh, variants emerging and the different forces of infections across time, it becomes extremely difficult to to do anything but make model-based assumptions. Now that work is ongoing, um, and and we'll we'll have that available in due course. I'm not sure how uh, trustworthy it is, uh, because I'm unconvinced we know how to um, guess the efficacy against the variants until we get real data on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galen. Thanks. Um, so th thanks for all of this. I want to start by thanking the public who commented, and then the many, many more of the public who commented in writing that didn't get a chance to speak. This is an important part of these, these conversations. Uh, Philip mentioned a couple of times something that doesn't always get mentioned about sterilizing immunity. So I'd like to hear some more about that. He showed us a little bit of data about it, but to the degree to which you believe this vaccine can lead to sterilizing immunity. And any data that you have from anywhere 
that might have insights about its limited or its um, ability to dampen transmission. And then finally, we hear a lot about its authorization in other countries. It'd be interesting to, if there, if a to know about how much it's being used in other countries and what other data you might have that's relevant to these discussions today from other country experiences. Yeah, the, Very broad um, question. I, I think I got these, so we'll we'll see. Um, so as, as far as the the um, the sterilizing protection data, uh, it's, it's a broadly feature we've seen in the animal models we've tested in. Our best data uh, for for in, what we saw in humans is the data I showed you. So there's no direct measurement that we have in hand of uh, transmission. Um, you need to make that uh, leap of faith or logic that if you don't get infected, you can transmit. Uh, the durability of the uh, of that period where you're protected from infection is also variable. In the UK study, like I mentioned, that was measured across a, a, those cases were accrued over six months with a median of about 101 days uh, observation uh, in, in those groups. So I, I think it's speculative, frankly, uh, but we're hopeful. Um, as far as real-world evidence from the uh, doses that are administered, it's still early days for us. We are shipping doses. They're being used. Right now, you heard from Dr. Kim from the pharmacovigilance side. We, we have good line of sight to about uh, 770,000 doses having been administered. We have imperfect visibility into this. Our customer are the governments. The governments deploy those. So we, uh, we, to a certain degree, rely on the governments to feed that data back to us so we understand how many are, are used. For us to get into real-world effectiveness, which we want to do, uh, and we will do, we're, we're committed to doing it, we need to get the vaccine usage up and up in certain areas where we can do a test and control design. Without adequate doses being deployed, we can't do those studies. Is that, uh, does that answer all your questions, uh, Bruce? It did. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to interject a question of my own uh, for Dr. Dubrovsky, and that is uh, we've heard that there are differences in the vaccines that are be being authorized uh, for use in other countries uh, versus uh, the uh the, the, the vaccine that we're now considering for the United States. Would you speak about that and uh, how different are they? Was it just a question of where they were manufactured? What, what's the story there? Right. Um, so all vaccines that are being distributed globally, commercially, are being made in a single facility in, uh, by our partners in Serum. That includes the vaccines which are being uh, deployed around the world. Is the ones is the ones that will be initially deployed in the U.S. Uh, as far as the previous um, studies that were done, uh, all the clinical and commercial outs were released after being tested to assure they met a set of critical quality attributes. And this includes the lots that were used in the early studies in Australia, U.S., U.K., South Africa, as well as in the U.S.-Mexico study. And it's normal for these specifications to tighten as experience is gained with the manufacturing process. Now, uh, we've completed a comparability program that we believe demonstrates the comparability uh, between the early lots and the lots used in study 301 and the commercial lots. Um, and and I, we acknowledge that FDA has a, has a perspective on this that, that's different from ours. Uh, but the quality of that material and the results of all the studies uh, are really the basis of our global licensure. Uh, so I, I think that's where we stand. But importantly, uh, all the vaccine which is uh, being deployed commercially comes from a single facility. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Matt, uh Thank you, Dr. Dubowski. I feel like uh, you're carrying a heavy load here. You're facing all these questions. But let me, uh, I have a question about um, the adjuvant, two questions about the adjuvant. Um, the first one, and it may be you simply don't know, but what happens if a person gets uh, at the same visit or the same day, uh, two saponin containing adjuvants. For example, if someone were to get the, the uh, shingles vaccine that, ha that contains ASO1 on the same day that um, uh, your vaccine is administered, are you worried about an increased uh, risk of, of adverse events that, that might occur? And then secondly, um, a little bit. <laughs> One of your er earlier uh, studies with respiratory syndrome
syncytial virus that I thought was was very interesting because you really broke uh, new ground with that publication. And um, but during the study with the same platform, I think uh, using RSV, RSV uh, fusion glycoprotein, um, used uh, a different adjuvant. You used um, uh, an aluminum, uh, an adsorbed aluminum adjuvant, and I think that was because there was some concern about uh, uh, using a saponin-based adjuvant in, during during pregnancy in, in a person who might be pregnant. And um, so I'm assuming you've got to, you no longer feel that uh, that's a concern, and that's why uh, you haven't expressed any reservation in, in that setting. Over. Yeah, so, so the RSV maternal program, uh, which was a study done before my time, was also a study done before uh, the company had uh, the matrix of Magellan in, in its portfolio. Uh, the immune responses induced by Allen were thought to be quite good at that time. Um, we don't have any specific concern uh, with uh, saponin. The, the reproductive talk studies and, and have been clean, and certainly in the data that Dr. Kim presented, we didn't see anything that looked concerning to us. Um, and and I'll, I'll remind you that the amounts of, just back to your previous question, the amounts of ad, and adjuvant we were uh, deploying are very low. We have 50 micrograms. We've, we've previously tested doses that are higher, up to 75 micrograms for our quadrivalent influenza vaccine program. Uh, we know that there are a small number of people who received Shingrix in our study, less than 10, but they, they, those probably weren't co-administered. Those were just given uh, close by, but we, certainly we didn't see any concerns with that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yes, so I just had, I had two uh, questions. One, what, what will it take for this to obtain a full licensure as opposed to an EUA? Because we keep hearing about uh, why it should be an EUA instead of a full licensure. But, uh, what, would it, what, what more would be needed for to obtain full licensure? And the other thing is with the uh, adjuvant, I, is there any, I know you looked for uh, things related to autoimmune disease, but was there any hint of exacerbation of pre-existing autoimmune disease with this adjuvant? Okay, I'll handle the first question and uh, perhaps I'll turn to Dr. Kim to, to uh, talk about the second question. Um, the long pole in the tent, the thing that takes the longest to get uh, a BLA is to do a lot-to-lot -lot consistency study. And this is a requirement that's unique uh, in the U.S. Uh, and to do that study, uh, we need to generate um, uh, lots which are, are deemed to be uh, comparable and, and appropriate for such a study uh, by, by the FDA before we do the study. So, so that's really the, the thing which is going to take the longest. We have some additional data requirements uh, for length of follow-up, and those uh, we'll come to terms with uh, in discussions with the FDA before we bring it to them for the full BLA. Dr. Dr. Kim, do you uh, have a perspective on enhancement of autoimmune disease? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. And I, it seems like I, my camera is not on. There, me, there you go. I'll turn it on for you, sir. Right. I'll oh, turn okay. it on for you, sir. There you go. All right, thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so we've seen very low frequencies of potential immune-mediated conditions. And so whether it's new onset or potentiation of existing comorbidities that some participants uh, had in our in our study population, we didn't really see any uh, uh, patterns that that suggested a worsening of conditions. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Uh, the point has been made uh, that one of the main audiences for this are vaccine-hesitant people who, by now, many of whom have been infected with natural disease because of their reluctance to get vaccinated. And we've also discussed the fact that this vaccine has been used in other countries for quite some time. Perhaps I missed it in the presentation, but I don't think we heard much about 
vaccine rea reaction in people who had prior exposure to the natural virus. I think the 301 study specifically was in seronegative individuals. So I'm wondering if you could either remind me or share any information that we have about the experience with the vaccine in people who've already had infection. You might yeah, you, as well you, stay you, on, Dr. Dabrowski. I think you're, you're in the hot seat. Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you remember correctly that 7% of the people in three, study 301 were, were positive at baseline. And while they were excluded from the, um, uh, from the efficacy analysis, we do have data, uh, both in, in logic as well as safety data, on what the vaccine does. And let me see if, uh, if I can get that data pulled up. Uh, but in, in general, if I were to summarize it, what, what we see is we see really qu quite a nice boost of the immune response in people who were previously uh, vaccinated. Let me start with a slide that shows you where the neutralizing responses were by age group uh, in those that were seronegative. And you can see uh, overall um, in, in those that were greater than 18, it's a value of about uh, 1,000. And those um, greater than uh, the younger group, 18 to 64, it was 1,200. When you compare it to the values that we see in those that were seropositive, uh, what you what you see is is an increase of roughly three to fourfold. So uh, they're getting a nice priming response from the natural infection. This vaccine boosts really quite well. Uh, from a safety perspective, we didn't really see any difference in the reactogenicity of the vaccine um, when, when it was delivered in the seropositive versus the seronegatives. Thank you. Doctor. Sorry. Oh, uh, could, could you quickly to tell us how many people, I know it was 7%, but what, what is that total that you had experience with? So in, in this in this particular study, it, it was seven percent in both groups. So seven seven percent of, of uh, thirty thousand. So I can do that. Thank map. you. Thanks. We Dr. we Fuller, have did you additional have your hands we have we have additional exposure data in people who are seropositive in our other studies. Uh, the attack rate was very, very high in South Africa, for instance, where uh, a much larger proportion uh, were seropositive. And we see the same pattern. We don't see any increased uh, safety signals, but we do see an increased uh, immune response. Thank you. Dr. Fuller, did you have your hands raised? I thought you did. Um, hi there. Um, so I have two questions. Um, uh, did, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I have two, two questions. As an allergist, I would be remiss if I didn't ask whether you observed any allergic reactions to the vaccine. After all, it is a protein-based vaccine rather than mRNA, so the risk of having an allergic reaction might be higher. Um, I guess you can answer that one first, and then I have one more question. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a scientific spin to it, and then I'll pass it off to Dr. Kim, actually. So, so our adjuvant uh, gives the TH1 bias. So in a sense, it's slightly anti-allergic as far as that goes. So I think that plays in our favor. Dr. Kim, do you want to uh, review the uh, hypersensitivity and, and, the, and, and we had no anaphylaxis, as has been mentioned in the uh, pre-licensure um, uh, database? Dr. Kim. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, as, as to confirmed anaphylaxis, we had no cases of anaphylaxis in our clinical development program uh, pre-crossover or post-crossover. Certainly, we do a broad search to look for any type of allergic type reactions or hypersensitivity type reactions. And uh, I can show you some of that data here. And so as you can see, the pre-crossover, and the, we use a standard measure query, and that's a very broad search. And so any sort of events that could possibly be related to allergic type reactions. And we saw a, a minor imbalance, a numerical imbalance. And so you can see 0.77% uh, in the active arm compared to 0.57% uh, in the placebo arm. And the most frequent uh, the preferred terms or events was rash, as you can see there. And we, uh, we have that in 
in uh, exposure-adjusted incidents, so 0.93 events per 100 person years uh, versus uh, 0.90 events per 100 person years. That's that's fairly balanced, and the reason we d did that is because there's differential follow-up, uh, oftentimes, especially when you consider post-crossover between placebo and active arms or those who receive vaccines, because everyone will eventually receive will have received vaccines. Um, that small numerical difference is mostly driven by urticaria and dermatitis. And so we didn't see significant, clinically significant sort of patterns and associations here. So presumably uh, the patients would be advised to do the standard 15 minute wait after the vaccine and not a prolonged wait or anything like that. Um, my other question, is uh, we're, you're applying for emergency use authorization. This is kind of a continuation of Dr. Perlman's question, uh, and yet we already have two vaccines available that are highly effective and, and relatively safe. Uh, I haven't seen, your, your vaccine seems to be comparably effective and comparably safe to the other ones, but you didn't show that it was superior in any particular way. Um, and um, since so many of the uh, people in the United States have already been vaccinated, uh, I assume that the large, uh, it's going to be promoted largely to the vaccine hesitant individuals who might adapt a more conventional um, vaccine that's protein based rather than these, um, these other technologies. Do you have any information from vaccine hesitant individuals suggesting that they might be more willing to consider getting this vaccine as opposed to one of the other vaccines? Have you talked to um, vaccine hesitant people or have any, any sense of whether they would be willing or more interested in using this vaccine than one of the others? Yeah, so so I'm going to ask Dr. Poland uh, to uh, step in and give his perspective. But I have to say that one in 10 Americans has yet to be vaccinated, and we haven't given up on them. We heard in the open public comment period that there seems to be a, a desire uh, to use this product, and that's why that's what we want to bring to uh, the U.S. population. It's another option, a choice. Uh, now, whether the proportion that choose to be vaccinated from a primary series, that isn't clear. We'll find out. Uh, we do know that in countries where the vaccine is being deployed, uh, it is being used both as a primary series as well as a booster. And those are choices that people are making in those countries to choose our vaccine. Dr. Paulin, do you have any other perspective? Arnold? Hello? Oops. Yeah. We, are we waiting on somebody? We're waiting on Dr. Poland who was called on. Oh, there we go. No, I, I, I don't know that, that he's not coming on. So maybe, maybe we'll take that as, as the sponsor's answer for the time being. Okay. okay. I see Dr. Dr. Reingold. He's not in my regular list. He's up in among the presenters. So... Uh, I don't know how long he's been waiting. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? We can. Good. So one of the problems of coming late is lots of questions that have been answered, uh, particularly the one Dr. Sawyer asked. But I do have one other question, building on what Dr. Meisner uh, mentioned. Hey, it will be fall soon. We'll be giving a lot of flu vaccine to people. Um, and I, I don't know about other people, but I got my flu shot and my booster dose of COVID in different arms on the same day. And I'm just curious what you know about the administration of this vaccine at the same time people get a flu shot. Yep, that's a, uh, a uh, question that we have also been very curious about. In the UK study, we actually included a cohort of participants who received the first dose, uh, a dose of licensed influenza vaccine. Uh, and what we saw there is that we didn't in, uh, negatively impact the hemagglutinin uh, responses. Uh, however, what we did see is a decrease in the anti-spike uh, responses in that cohort. Now, we still maintain efficacy. Efficacy was maintained at pretty much exactly the same rate as the overall population, but it did drop the anti-spike response. This isn't unique to our platform. There's, uh, there are publications that show um, that uh, with uh, other uh, platforms, when you give um, flu vaccine, it tends to drop those responses, including against mRNA vaccines. 
Uh, we furthermore conducted a, a combination study uh, in, uh, with, with our flu vaccine and, and our COVID vaccine, and this was made public a few months ago. Um, and we, we recapitulated the same finding. We do, in fact, uh, impact uh, the anti-spike uh, response, but you can overcome this response by minimally decreasing the hemagglutinin while increasing the spike antigen. And that's a, that's a combination product that we're taking forward as well. Thank you. Dr. Marasco. Um, this is a question um, for Dr. Dvosky. Um, so I wanted to follow up on a, on a question I've asked before in a different way, and it has to do with your comments about antigenic spread. So, um, you know, your titers look pretty reasonable um, going across the lineages. And... Um, but there is some drop off. So my, my question, it's really two questions. One, do you, do you know that the vaccine is not just because you're adjuvanted and that's gonna have some impact on this. Do you know that you're not getting ep epitope shift? I mean, some of the more conserved regions of the spike are in the ST domain, for example. So do you know that the reason you're getting less of a particular drop off is because there's a difference in the, anti you know, the, the antibody response that you're listening. And related to that, um, you know, the other, when you look at um, the studies that have been published on immune serum from people that have been vaccinated with, um, with the Wuhan strain versus um, hybrid immunity, it's pretty clear that, um, you know, it's both your, and, and Dr. Mark's comment on this, it's both your peak response, uh, your breath of response, and the sort of rate of decay. So do you know, um, for example, that the rate of decay is not lower because you're adjuvanting? I mean, this would be a very important point for the public who recognizes now that the vaccine response is waning. And my real question is, because this is adjuvanted, do you know anything more about your rate of decay? I mean, it would really take you three time points to know that, uh, or antigenic shifts in terms of subdomains of the spike you may be uh, listening to antibodies to. Yep. So um, let me show you the data we have on decay. And, and since it takes time to develop those studies there from our earlier studies, although this is data that we're developing in the 301 study as well. What I'm showing here is, is IgG responses in the first instance. Uh, you see they peak at day 35. They decay over the, first, over the subsequent six months. Uh, and then uh, they take a nice boost uh, up to uh, four or five-fold higher. Um, uh, with 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 the boost, so you know I I'm not when I look at the comparable data, I'm not seeing there's any specific advantage in the length of decay. This is ITG. It seems to be dropping at about the same rate. Um, what we um, just as far as as, as the boosting, uh, what we do know is that those uh, titers that um, were achieved uh, are are quite high. So what I'm showing you here is that same uh, ITG was a third dose and showing you that the, the levels we achieved are much higher than those achieved in the, in the two phase three studies. And that gives us some assurance that a third dose boost is going to be, uh, you know, quite efficacious. And if you prefer NUTs, although our NUTs and IgG uh, correlate extremely well, once again, you can see a 5.5 to 5.6 fold increase in NUTs with a third dose compared to the levels achieved in the two phase three studies. So. That's as far as decay and, and boosting. Um, I, as far as your question about um, about um, what parts of the antigen we see or don't see, so we know we recognize parts of the spike domain that are distant from the RVD. Right? We, we, we've mapped that out, and some of the common uh, epitopes, including the original SARS epitope, are, are found by, by this vaccine and, and are utilized. The extent of that and how that matures is something we're working on right now. Uh, and and um, maybe maybe I'll stop there. And if there are further questions, I'll need to call uh, into my bench and, and perhaps Dr. Uh, well, I'll, I'll call my colleagues if you have further questions. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Who would you like that's to call in? Here we go. Uh,
Thank you, thank you, Arnold. Um, so I just had two two questions. One is, can you remind me uh, of Novavax's study plans uh, in the pediatric population, and specifically, what experience do you have with the use of the adjuvant in the pediatric population in younger age groups? That's our first question. So we've, we've concluded the, the study um, in adolescents, 12 to 17 years of age, and that was in 3,000 adolescents in the U.S., and, and that's the basis of the licensure we're going to be requesting from the FDA subsequent to, to our EUA. Our further plans, we, we have further plans to study this vaccine in, in first school-age children and then HD escalating down to uh, children as young as six months of age in the first study. Our colleagues in uh, Serum have done this study down to two years of age, taking the same adult vaccine dose. And uh, what they found in that study is that the reactogenicity profile stayed very solid. Uh, the only small uptick they saw was in, in fevers, but less than 1% were uh, grade three fevers. Uh, and the immune responses were favorable. They were much higher than were, were seen in adults. This adjuvant is in a phase three study uh, being studied in West Africa for malaria. And in that study, it's the, the doses have been taken down to children as young as five months of age. And once again, they're not seeing a different, they're not seeing a safety problem, although it is a different antigen, obviously, since it's against malaria. But overall, uh, this, this appears to be quite favorable, uh, and we'll know more as we develop more data. Thank you. And, and I should say that we have, a, we have agreed upon a pediatric investigational plan uh, and, and, and a, a pediatric study plan with the FDA as well as the EU. Thank you. My second question you. is, and I may, I may have missed this, but um, can you explain, uh, you, you published the UK data in September of 2021 and the US-Mexico data in February of 2022. Is, is there a reason that we're talking about this in June of 2022 as opposed to uh, earlier uh, Request for uh, EUA. Yeah. So, so our, our first uh, approval was was in December of last year. But when the pandemic started, this company didn't have a manufacturing base, so we had to build it from scratch, build a, a manufacturing network uh, from ground up. What really took the longest time, however, wasn't uh, the manufacturing of the product; it was the uh, generation of the assays to demonstrate that we could make the product over and over again the same way. And to uh, deploy those assays against the um, uh, against the uh, multiple lots, lots, you know, all of them need to need to achieve those um, critical quality attributes. Um, so uh, our approach then was to settle in a single facility uh, in India because they're the world's largest vaccine manufacturer by dose, uh, and that's a single process we've taken forward, and that's the one that's the basis of licensure uh, in uh, globally as well as the EUA request here in the U.S. And do you have a concern about having a single manufacturing plant? There's always a uh, risk there, and uh, we have a network, and the subsequent uh, sites are being brought on now. They're done as variations. So first you need to be approved with one uh, in, the, in the instance, um, the serum, and we're bringing on our sites, uh, one that we own in Europe, and then one of our partners in South Korea. And those, will, those are being uh, now um, applied for in various locations globally. And I, I have you. to say that, that also um, um, Takeda and SK uh, are licensees of ours. Uh, and it, they have a different relationship. They're not manufacturing for us. They're manufacturing for themselves. And uh, they're licensed in Korea and Japan, respectively. Thank you. Thank you. That helps in some of our considerations. Dr. Fuller. Yes, um, thank you. Yes. So a question that I think the public will ask in trying to ask it in a way that the public will understand, uh, for those who have not been vaccinated as well as those who may want to use this in some other way, um, this baclovirus express protein in an adjuvant, we get asked all the time with other vaccines, well, how long does it stay in my system? Could you just share in, in sort of general language for people who may be listening how long this they can expect this particular baclovirus with 
adjuvant of the S protein to be uh, in the system to get the response that we want from the immune system. And secondly, uh, if they get this, how long um, will it take you to make something else if indeed something else is going to be needed? later as far as a, a strain of, um, of SARS virus? And just to be clear, uh, even though we use baclovirus in the manufacturing process, the vaccine contains no virus whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the, the process has been uh, specifically designed to eliminate all virus uh, from, from the final container, from, from the final product we generate, all that's in there is the spike protein, uh, the viral spike protein. Um, now, what we have talked about is, is that the adjuvant effect seems to peak right about 72 hours locally with a, long, with a longer uh, protracted effect in the lymph nodes later on. What we saw from our immunogenicity data is it generally uh, kind of peaks at two weeks and then goes lower after that. Um, I guess as far as the variants uh, question, you know, we're manufacturing uh, Omicron right now. Uh, it isn't clear to us it will be needed. It isn't clear to us what the public health agencies and, and the customers and the people will want. Uh, we just want to be ready uh, to have that vaccine in hand should it be needed. I know there's a, a verb pack coming up uh, later this month uh, to um, decide or help decide on uh, what kinds of vaccines uh, we should be asking for in the fall. So in general, with the side effects, the 72 hours um, uh, expression or not expression, but presence of the vaccine, does that prolong the time of side effects that people see or the appearance of the time of those side effects? You had, you had data on that, but could you just re restate that, please? Yeah, no, it's 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 a uh, it's an excellent question. So the the major side effects, you know, we call, we follow this very very closely for um, for the first seven days, and the vast majority were either mild or moderate. Actually, many people had no side effects whatsoever, and the side effects that did occur uh, really resolved after one or two days. Those are both the local ones, things like pain and tenderness, as well as the uh, broader ones like uh, fatigue. Okay, so those the side effects that can be seen with many vaccines, yeah, uh, uh, are they they're at, they're from the actual injection versus from the 72 long-term hours of antigen being present? What, what it is, it's they're likely to be caused by the immune response uh, against the the vaccine, right? So not not the act of the vaccine being delivered into your arm rather the immune response and inflammation, which comes along with the body reacting to the vaccine and generating the protective immune response. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, thank you very much for a very thorough presentation and lineup this morning. I wanted to follow up a little bit on the durability question. I'm intrigued by the possibility that it may last longer. Uh, to date, the data that has been shown has been with respect to clinical efficacy as well as the humoral immune response. So what I haven't seen is whether you are generating any cellular immune response data with respect to generation of memory B cells and others that might also provide an explanation. And is there anything unique about your vaccine uh, that is inducing a different cellular response that may uh, impact durability and memory response? Yeah, um, let's, let's talk about uh, cellular immune response for a bit. Uh, although I don't have kinetic data on that. So I think I'll disappoint you in being able to look at it over over time. Uh, but this is, um, oops, that's not what I wanted. Let's try this one. This is data that we published in the New England Journal uh, by Keith et al. And what it's looking at is the um, uh, intercellular cytokine profile after vaccination. Um, uh, on day 28. On the left-hand side, we stained against TH1 cytokines. In this case, it's IL-2, TNF-alpha, and interferon gamma. And what you can see is we got a really nice bump at day 28. On the right-hand side, you can see the, the TH2 profiles. We, we looked at IL-5 and IL-13, which is a, a lesser bump. Importantly, at least we think importantly, when we um, 
when we looked at those that were polyfunctional. So those that either stayed for two TH1 cytokines or three uh, TH1 cytokines, comparing to those that stayed for two TH2 cytokines, uh, we saw this polyfunctionality. And, and we think that's important as far as effector memory cells go, although we don't have the kinetic data to uh, demonstrate that uh, fully. Is that being required? And certainly this TH1 skewing may impact on the observation of lower immediate systemic effects with respect to anaphylaxis and other immediate type of responses, which is favorable uh, with your platform. Right. Uh, my second question is related to the distinction between your Hispanic and Latinx uh, efficacy response. So I thought I heard this morning that certainly it's been acknowledged as a difference, uh, no obvious explanation to date. I wondered if you wanted to clarify a little bit more as to what your plans are to tease out whether those differences were indeed due to chance versus something else. Yeah, so so we, we've obviously been very interested in, in understanding what this data is trying to tell us. And you know what's even more interesting is, is when we looked at the uh, the racial profile of the Hispanics. They they were they were all identified as Caucasian and not Black Hispanics. So there there was there's something quirky happening in the data. Well, really, the, our best chance to understand this data is in our effectiveness studies. Those are planned for the U.S., where where we will obviously have the ability to probe that uh, in the Hispanic population to understand if there's a real difference or for this chance finding. I'm Kind of a believer in immune, in immune responses, and the immune responses in the uh, Hispanic population give me a lot of uh, comfort uh, that uh, it's going to be a chance finding. I have to say, you know, there, all the modern severe cases, there weren't any. So even in that population, all the cases were mild. Acknowledged. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. McGinnis. Go ahead, Dr. McGinnis. We can hear you. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Take it away. Hi. Okay. I have a very simple question. It's for Philip. Hi. Um, I searched these briefing documents, but I, I can't seem to find out what the placebo was. And it's important to me because I'm measuring a delta between that and the active agent. Can you please tell me what the placebo is? It was normal saline. Could you hear me? Yeah, normal saline. Normal saline. Okay, thank you. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, Dr. Marta. Um, and again, thanks for your <laughs> persistence, because uh, uh, I, I appreciate it. Question I have is, um, you had there was an earlier study, and I might have missed it this morning during the, some of the clinical trials, but it was done in South Africa, and um, it included HIV-positive uh, subjects, and I think the vaccine efficacy was reported as 50% or something around that in the HIV positive uh, population, which seems pretty good in view of um, their degree of immunocompromise, I guess, depending on their reconstitution. But um, can you provide any further data regarding regarding that group and how uh, this vaccine might work in, in individuals who are immunocompromised for other reasons? Yeah, and, and maybe if I could have the uh, immune responses in people with HIV in study 301, please. Maybe we can start there. Um, yeah, here we go. So what I'm showing you here is IgG responses, uh, and on the left-hand side, you see those that are, are seronegative. Uh, so meaning seronegative, meaning baseline seronegative against uh, SARS. Uh, and you can see the, the HIV levels are uh, higher than those that, that, had, that were living with HIV, although broadly the confidence intervals overlap. Now, in the U.S., 
uh, these are people who are well controlled on, on heart and, and they were immunologically reconstituted. Uh, we had a small number of individuals, that I'm showing the right-hand side, who came in previously exposed, and you can see they boosted extremely well with the vaccine. So they achieved titers many fold higher than was associated with protection in the HIV negative group. Now, uh, our um, data so far on various levels of immunocompromised individuals is somewhat limited. And we're going to be gathering that data uh, in due course. We've completed enrolling a study in South Africa where we looked at giving uh, three doses and giving doses on different schedules to see if we can get an advantage, uh, an immunologic advantage, by delivering it in, uh, uh, in, in that manner. Now, yep. now, as far as the results in South Africa, Dr. Mallory, do you want to um, take a crack at reviewing the South African results? Or what our findings were? Sorry, who would you like to call on? Dr. Mallory. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Take we it away. Can. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to clarify, Dr. Meisner, that um, uh, I'm showing the results of the South Africa study here, and we did show an overall efficacy of around 50%. Remember, this study was conducted when the uh, beta antigenic escape mutation was uh, circulating. Um, the efficacy in individuals without HIV was 55%. However, um, we had a very small number of individuals enrolled in this study who uh, were living with HIV. And in that group, uh, we were not able to demonstrate efficacy. And the study was not powered for it. So um, I think that maybe there's some miscommunication. The 55% is in individuals who are HIV negative in that study. Oh, and thank it, you. It, 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 in all, all cases, again, um, there were no, no severe cases in this study, so the vaccine protected all, all participants enrolled from severe disease in that study. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Thank you. Seeing no further hands raised, we're able to move to our next uh, phase of our discussion, and that is uh, the committee looking at the question that we are going to have to vote on shortly, and that is whether we recommend emergency use authorization for the Novavax vaccine. And there is a voting question. I'm going to be officially reading it later on, but uh, just to remind you, this is for the two-dose series and it's based on whether the risks outweigh the benefits. So any of you who would like to start the discussion, please raise your hands. We don't have to fill the full two hours in if uh, a lot of our uh, questions have already been answered. Dr. Rubin. Um, well, I don't want to fill the two hours, uh, but... Uh Yes, so uh, <laughs> you don't have very, simply, very simply then, um, I, I think that the, uh, the data that were presented looks very similar to the data that were presented for the mRNA vaccines that we approved a long time ago. And in fact, that's in part because those trials were done at the same time. But I think that the efficacy is, efficacy I is quite the same similar. feeling, Dr. Rubin. <laughs> it was I deja agree. vu. It, it, and, and, you know, if we're going to use the same criteria um, that we did then, I think that we, it's not that difficult a decision now. It is disappointing, and we've discussed this already, uh, that we don't have more updated information because we're looking at the efficacy against strains that don't exist any longer. Uh, nevertheless, um, I think that uh, the argument made earlier by Dr. Marks for, uh, for EUA um, if there really is a population of patients who are willing to take this and not willing to take the existing vaccines, I think it's pretty compelling. Thank you. I'm amazed. I see no hands raised. Anybody who doesn't feel that the that this is compelling. Uh, 
Mark Desire. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I'd just like to sort of reiterate the previous comment. It is quite disappointing that we don't have any data in the Omicron era. Clearly, such data could have been presented. But I will follow what I understand is the FDA guidance, which is we're supposed to evaluate this vaccine based on the data presented to date and leave it up to them whether they actually issue the EUA given the lack of uh, data about Omicron effectiveness, at least as presented on the committee. So I do agree with the previous conclusion that the data that was presented is quite similar to what we've approved in the past with other vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Reingold. So I agree with both of those statements, and I, I certainly will support um, uh, recommending to FDA that they approve this vaccine. I'm a little skeptical about how many of the vaccine hesitant are just waiting for this vaccine and are going to be convinced that uh, this is better for them than the vaccines that are currently available. So um, obviously there are individuals who testified to that, but at a population level, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be uh, proven wrong and that there are large numbers of people who sign up for this vaccine who, who wouldn't take an mRNA vaccine, but, but count me as skeptical about that. And I do think that um, uh, it remains to be seen just what the risk of myocarditis uh, is, um, but, but we know that that certainly has dissuaded some individuals from getting the mRNA vaccines, and, and it looks like it's likely to be the case that we'll see at least comparable levels following this vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Gellin. Thanks. So um, having been in these discussions before, I know the FDA selects their words very carefully. Um, and I, could you put it back on the screen? Because I think that the question about the total, totality of the, vac, of the data available, we've only seen a subset of the totality of the available data. And there's a lot of other data that would help to inform this decision in use currently and going forward that we haven't seen. So maybe they want to talk about um, totality of evidence available. I can tell you, Dr. Gellin, that that is the wording that's in the, uh, uh, has been used before and I think is taken from the regulations, but I'll let uh, the FDA respond, please. So we, we we would consider the totality of, of data available to to consist of the data that has been presented and discussed um, at the meeting today, and, and primarily the data that um, have been reviewed and independently verified by FDA, as outlined in in our briefing document. Uh, I think it's it's important to make sure that the committee members and the public understand that in response to uh, some questions by committee members, Novavax has, has presented some additional data that FDA has not uh, covered in, in our briefing document. And, and the reasons uh, for this are, are several. First of all, as uh, has been mentioned uh, several times uh, before, um, uh, we uh, view that there are important uh, manufacturing differences between the product uh, that was studied in the U.S.-Mexico trial and the product that was studied in uh, previous trials and that in, in our assessment due to inherent limitations in uh, product characters, characterization for this platform, we just uh, cannot uh, conclude uh, comparability of those products that would uh, allow us to consider those data. Uh, that being said, I think we have you know, laid out a case in our briefing document uh, to uh, support why we think that the available data from the U.S. and Mexico trial uh, could meet the statutory criteria of uh, may be effective um, uh, that is required to support emergency use uh, authorization. And that you know, rests primarily um, on uh, the, the efficacy observed uh, in uh, clinical trial uh, 301 uh, that was conducted in the U.S. and Mexico. And considering those data in the broader context of what we know 
uh, about other COVID-19 vaccines that were evaluated at the same time and how they have performed in uh, real-world use, uh, including against uh, currently uh, circulating variants. Um, there are additional immunogenicity data uh, that, that Novavax has presented as well that, that we did not uh, review or discuss. Uh, some of these relate to binding assays, uh, IgG uh, G binding assays that we have not used as the basis for regulatory uh, decision making for any of our EUA decisions, um, and also uh, come from from clinical trials outside of uh, the, the the data that we are really considering uh, in support of this two dose series uh, for use in adults 18 years of age and older. And I see that that Dr. Marx is also. Uh, turned on his camera, and he might want to add uh, some additional context. Yeah. I, 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 I think I think that this issue of why we're seeing a limited uh, amount of uh, of the whole picture presented is because we needed to feel comfortable that the process that was used to make the product that was studied uh, was one that we were comfortable with, um, and that it was uh, one where we felt that going forward what you would authorize as a committee would be what we would expect to see. Now, granted, <laughs> it will be in a different, in a, in a different era, perhaps, uh, but it will, that what you're seeing is the product that you're getting, um, uh, and that uh, that is the reason for focusing on the manufacturing process that came uh, from the facility that is producing the product uh, currently. Um, uh, we take manufacturing very seriously. I think it's very important for the public to understand that we don't benchmark ourselves against other countries when it comes to manufacturing. We consider that we have a very high standard, and it's why we're often considered a gold standard for our manufacturing. Uh, and particularly uh, uh, in the area of vaccines, we owe it to the American public to make sure that we have the highest quality of vaccines. And and that means that uh, whether it be in any aspect of this, including uh, whether uh, we will allow release of lots of uh, vaccine to be used, we will need to see uh, the data that supports that uh, before that can actually happen for any vaccine here in the United States. So um, I think it's important to understand that um, I, I fully respect the sovereignty of other countries to release vaccines based on what they see as their benefit risk. Um, but we have uh, certain standards in the United States that we hold to um, because that is the expectation of the American public. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Um, thank you, Dr. Manto. Uh, my question actually is for our FDA colleagues. Uh, with regard to any kind of cautionary language that would be in included were this um, vaccine to be authorized, with regard to the risk for uh, myocarditis, pericarditis, cholecystitis, uh, these um, quite rare uh, ad but serious adverse events <laughs> that seem to be associated um, with this vaccine. Yes, thank you for that question. So that that is something that that, that is a question that we um, are discussing as we have been uh, reviewing the proposed UA fact sheets for this vaccine. And so, um, what, what what I think you might be be hinting at is, you know, do do we include you know something along the lines of a warning statement, uh, similar to what we have in the, the currently authorized and approved. MRNA vaccines, and so the you know the, the regulatory um, uh, criteria for including a warning statement is um, a uh, to have reasonable evidence of a, of a causal relationship. Uh, now, certainly, uh, I think we can all agree that the the extent of evidence for uh, myocarditis being causally related to this vaccine is not at the same level as as for mRNA vaccines, uh, where we have uh, many more cases described among uh, much more extensive 
use of the vaccine. Um, but I, I would actually like to, to get the uh, perspective of committee members to weigh in. What, what do you think, based on the, on the data that, that you've seen presented uh, for these myocarditis cases, uh, is, is your impression about the uh, you know, likelihood of, of a causal relationship uh, and, and whether you, you would uh, see a, a warning statement being, being appropriate in the situation? I Dr. Chatterjee, would. you're there. Please answer. Yes, yes, um, and and you're absolutely correct, Dr. Fink. That is uh, where what I was alluding to. Uh, if we go back and recall um, the data that were presented initially uh, for authorization, we did not have this concern. It really became evident after the mRNA vaccines began to be used much more extensively. So uh, that often happens, as we know, with vaccines. Uh, and, and so in, in this instance, we have an indication that uh, there is a potential um, for this, uh, these uh, adverse events to occur more as these, this vaccine gets utilized. So I would be in favor of that type of language being included uh, so that the public is, is clear, um, vaccine providers are clear about the risks and can speak to them with their patients. And uh, since I'm, my picture is up there right now, I will say that I agree as well. I think there is a question, and uh, there will be some, uh, there will be answers, but we must be aware. Dr. Dabrowski. Yeah, I, I just thought um, to hear our perspective on this. You know, it's important to convey an accurate level of risk uh, for the available data. We, we believe there's insufficient evidence to establish a causal relationship. But we're not really that far from where uh, the FDA is. And uh, as we enter, uh, you know, the final label negotiations, I'm sure we're going to come to closure on this. Each regulatory agency reviews our clinical and our post-marketing data, and, and they come up with their own conclusions. And that's what informs their labels. So we completely respect uh, the approach that they're taking. Any other questions? Uh, I see a number of hands raised. I'd like to settle this question, at least in terms of the committee's opinion, about the myocarditis issue. Dr. Levy, are you, uh, is that what you're going to be talking about? You had your hands raised before. Hi. Hello? Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, I had a question for um, FDA regarding the placement of this vaccine in the broader context of the approval. Dr. Levy, uh, we're, we want to settle the committee's oh. views of the, of, of the... Okay. Did you have anything to say about that? Because then I'll come back to you. Arnold, can I make a comment? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, uh, on this risk, I have such a hard time with this problem, and uh, as we all, do. and I, there has been such variation in reports of the rates of myocarditis following administration of these vaccines. Um, that I think it's very hard to say that it occurs more frequently. It would be, at this stage, difficult to say it occurs more frequently with one vaccine platform than with another. I mean, I think if, if because, you know, if you look at the Israeli data, it's more, it's pretty high. It's higher than the numbers we're seeing here, and they may have better capture of, of rates of myocarditis for the messenger RNA vaccine. So I I don't think we can have enough confidence um, in the rates because it's such a range. And I think that any statement regarding the risk of, of myocarditis should be standard between all of the COVID-19 uh, 
vaccine platforms. I think there is clearly an association, but to try and make a gradation as to whether one platform is more likely to result in myocarditis than another, I, I, I don't think we have the numbers to make that statement. Over. Thank yeah, you, that, Dr. Meissner. Yeah, sorry, I, I I agree with you that at, at this point we don't we don't have enough information to um, really describe relative risk of, of this event uh, between different vaccines. But that's that's not a a requirement uh, or a necessity to to have a warning statement. A warning statement is justified by, uh, and I'm, I'm going to clarify uh, what I said earlier here. A warning statement is justified by reasonable evidence of a causal association. Uh, and there, there does not need to be uh, definitive evidence of, of a causal relationship. It's, it's reasonable evidence of a causal association. Uh, and so that, that really is the question that we're, we're looking for, for input uh, here. Based, based on the information that you've heard today, uh, do you consider there to be a reasonable uh, evidence of a causal association? And of course, it would be ideal if we could describe uh, the the magnitude of the risk for uh, for each vaccine and, and compared to uh, to the others. But but we we don't we don't have the ability to do that at least not for this vaccine just yet. Thank you for that comment, Dr. Fink, and I completely agree with what you've said, but I think my point is, um, okay, is I there, think, uh, there is there be, anyone on the committee, is there anyone on the committee that does not agree with that, co that comment? Dr. Gillen, do you have your hands raised? Do you disagree? Well, my, my, hand up, my, my hand was up before you changed the question, so let me just give you the oh, answer well, I was talking about before. <laughs> I, no, no, on, it's on this topic. You have to be nimble on this committee. I, I got it. On this topic, though, I want to support what Cody raised and what, what Dr. Fink supported. Um, but I think we also have to put this in context that we talked about earlier about um, myocarditis that comes from natural infection as well. So people can look at that and weigh those as well. And then most importantly, what Paul Offit raised earlier, that this is a priority question to answer mechanistically. Over. Okay, I think you've got the message, Dr. Fink, that uh, there is uh, a concern that uh, the topic be further investigated. And it's in your hands in negotiations with the sponsor exactly how that is to be done. But we are, we do agree that there is a concern here. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, okay, do you think do you, Dr. Fink, is, 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 do you, don't you agree that there's a likely association between the messenger RNA vaccine and um, the Novavax vaccine? And shouldn't it shouldn't it be a standard statement? Well, I. What, what we say in, in product labeling, including EUA fact sheets, need, needs to be supported by the available data. And the, the level of evidence um, is, is going to be different for, for different vaccines. I think we're in, a, we're in a different place and can say more uh, for the mRNA vaccines uh, at this point in time than, than what we can say uh, for, for this vaccine. Okay. okay. Moving on. Dr. Levy, I inter uh, interrupted you when you had uh, you were ready to make another point. Yeah, my my question here. Can, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, my question here is to FDA. In my view, uh, you know, we've seen uh, great presentations today establishing reasonable safety, demonstrating efficacy at least against the variants that were circulating at the time this vaccine was evaluated. Um, now, as we vote to potentially recommend uh, authorization of this vaccine, um, where does the whole topic of how we place the vaccine in a public health strategy play into this? In other words, it's a very different landscape now than it was half a year or a year ago. There are the well-established mRNA vaccines, some of which are not just authorized but approved, as this committee knows very well. 
So is there going to be a pecking order in other for the mRNA vaccines where there's much more data about level of vaccine efficacy against Omicron? Are those going to be the preferred uh, first-tier vaccines to use with the Novavax if and when it's authorized? Being, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about people who might not want to trust or, or partake in the mRNA platform. They might want to try a different platform. So don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm a fan of this vaccine. It has a lot of attractive features, doesn't require freezing. Uh, the adjuvant is intriguing. You might get uh, more bang for a buck with that. But where does this get placed in the armamentarium? Because in isolation, this vote would almost imply that it just takes an equal spot on the shelf. But we know that it's more complicated. So, so, Peter, where does that stand, and does FDA speak to that, or is that just a CDC matter? So, so I, I think we speak to making available another option uh, for those who might not otherwise take a vaccine, because uh, right now um, any vaccine, even even one that uh, may need to be updated uh, for the, the, the variants, right now getting that into someone's arm who has no vaccine is probably going to prevent them from having uh, serious outcomes such as hospitalization and death. Um, from uh, COVID-19, even even from uh, Omicron, um, we hope, um, uh, at least for a period of time. Uh, so it's it's having additional choice. That said, um, my guess is that um, CDC will have some discussion here uh, 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 around this as well um, uh, about how they might position this. Um, and yeah. I can't say how they'll come out on this no, from ACI. Of course. Of but course, Peter, from our perspective, it's making available another another option um, to uh, hopefully get uh, some additional people uh, vaccinated. Yeah, it makes sense. But in, in the past, the committee has been asked to take votes on very specifically worded for certain age groups, for certain scenarios. This is a pretty broad statement. Uh, you're not crafting a, a vote question that says for individuals who are reluctant to take mRNA. It's a broader statement. That might be fine. But I'm wondering, did you consider to phrase the question more narrowly or you want this broad uh, phrasing? Now, this, this is the question that we voted on originally back in the uh, a year yeah, and a half. I, I think I think the issue is there were no data for us to suggest that um, there was a reason to narrow this further at this point in time in terms of adverse safety uh, concerns uh, that might want to make one narrow this. Um, and I'd certainly invite uh, Dr. Fink if he wants to add anything to that uh, to to add it. But I I, I think that in the absence of uh, data suggesting that a narrowing was necessary. Um, uh, we have a asked the uh, the broader question here. Yeah, I, I will just um, echo what Dr. Mark said. The the more restricted authorization for the the Osgood vaccine is was precipitated by a specific safety concern uh, related to uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome here. Uh, we have a, a package of data uh, to support uh, broad use in the general population of adults 18 years of age and older. Uh, we did not identify a specific safety concern that would cause us to uh, uh, think about a more restricted use uh, of this vaccine. And so that's why the, the voting question was constructed, so I, I got of course. Prove that all other things being equal, we know more about the efficacy against Omicron of the mRNA than this vaccine. I'm a supporter of this vaccine. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of messaging, it's it's tricky, isn't it? We all agree it is tricky. Dr. Perlman, thank you. Yeah, I, I just have a question about something we actually didn't talk about much. So this vaccine uh, doesn't, for the most part, induce a CD8 T cell response. It's mostly CD4 and antibody, and that's what was discussed. Well, how does the FDA take that laboratory information? Does it uh, does it uh, consider that the, the vaccine clearly works? So maybe it doesn't matter. But I'm just curious how the FDA uh, puts that into its equation and in, uh, going forward. I, I'm not sure there's really a lot a lot to say there. Based, I mean, I think it's something we were aware of, 
Um, but given the clinical data, that's what we're uh, hanging more of the hat on here. Um, Doran, I'll pass it over to you. No, I think we, we really have to look at the at the clinical data here. Um, it's it's interesting to, to see and discuss uh, the this data on cellular mediated immunity to the extent that it is available. We don't have a sufficient enough understanding uh, of those data to uh, use it as the primary basis for uh, making regulatory decisions. Um, and so, uh, really, I would I would ask the committee to focus on on the clinical efficacy data that that has been presented. Right. Thank you. Seeing no further hands raised, I would like to turn the meeting over to Christina Burt, who will start the voting process. I'd like to remind the committee that after the votes are completed and reread, we will allow time for those who wish to explain their vote to do so. You don't have to explain your vote if it's clear to you uh, and to the group, but that time will be made available afterwards. So we move to voting. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Only our 10 regular members and 12 temporary voting members, a total of 22, will be voting in today's meeting. With regards to the voting process, Dr. Monta will read the final voting question for the record, and afterwards, all regular voting members and temporary voting members will cast their vote by selecting one of the voting options, which include yes, no, or abstain. You will have one minute to cast your vote after the question is read. Please note that once you have cast your vote, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. However, once the poll has closed, all votes will be considered final. Once all of the votes have been placed, we will broadcast the results and read the individual votes out loud for the public record. So, uh, and also uh, wait till I say start the vote. Uh, does anyone have any questions related to the voting process before I begin? And also, do you feel you need more than one minute to cast your vote? Uh, if you need more time or if I need more time to check things, we will uh, continue to keep the vote open for the two minutes. Okay, I'll read the question. I'm sure that you will see everybody voting within the, within the minute, and you'll know. Yes, Dr. Monto, please read the voting question. Based on the totality of scientific evidence available, do the benefits of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine when administered as a two-dose series outweigh its risks for use in individuals 18 years of age and older. So there is the pod. Please start voting at this time. And set the time, yes. Okay, I'm just checking the votes. Okay. 
Okay, it looks like all the votes are in. Uh, we can please end the vote, and then we can broadcast the results. We'll close. Okay. What is viewing? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> the majority, uh, so there's 22 uh, total voting members again today, and we have uh, 20, let's see, okay. We have 21 that have voted yes. Zero have voted no, and one has abstained. So the majority have voted yes. And I will read the voting responses of each voting member for the record. Hold on again. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Fuller, yes. Dr. Berger, yes. Dr. Cohn, yes. Okay. Dr. Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Monta, yes. Dr. Rangold, yes. Dr. Jellen, abstain. Dr. Meisner, yes. Dr. Kim, yes. Dr. Rubin, yes. Dr. Bernstein, yes. <clears throat> Dr. Portnoy, yes. Dr. Lee, yes. Dr. Sawyer, yes. Dr. Wharton, yes. Dr. Nelson, yes. Dr. Levy, yes. Dr. McInnes, yes. Dr. Offit, yes. Dr. Perlman, yes. Dr. Pergen, yes. Dr. Morosco, yes. And that is everybody. Yes. Okay. And that concludes the uh, voting portion of today's meeting. And I will now hand the meeting over to Dr. Monto for asking the committee for their voting explanation. Thank you. So that so anybody who would like to explain their vote, please raise your hand now. I do not see can you any can you hear me? My missing I got kicked out of the I want, can you hear me, Arnold? I can hear you. I can't see you. I don't know. Something I got kicked out of the meeting, but you can still hear me. So um, I'm trying to get back in. But do you want me to just, want me to explain mine, or how do you want to proceed? I want to. It's up to you. If you want to explain your vote, yeah. please. No, I'd love to. So let me just say that this is a conditional yes, and I'll explain that. Um, but conditional yes wasn't a, wasn't an option. I will say that this is a case study of perseverance by the company, um, and there's nothing about vaccine development that's, that's easy. And the vaccine in ra race that's inspired by COVID, and it was supported by Warp Speed, and I had nothing to do with that, um, has, has brought us vaccines that we didn't think that would have to have an impact that, that has been impressive. And, and while globally, global inequity remains, for which additional platforms and more user-friendly user presentations will be welcomed, like this vaccine. We're, that's not why we're here. The data that we've heard, present, heard today and seen today has been impressive and support the original vision for this vaccine from its beginning, that it would provide safety and efficacy and a presentation that didn't require extraordinary logistics. Uh, and with attribution to the novel adjuvant, the lower amount of protein appears to make it even less reactogenic. With a focus on safety, as we discussed, myocarditis is a signal that many are paying attention to, and attention to this by the company and the government is critically important. 
uh, as I said before, highlighting doctor office intervention that we need to understand uh, the mechanism here because this this infection and the vaccines against it are going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Um, the question that we're asked is based on the totality of the scientific evidence available. You've already heard me ask about the availability word. Uh, and as Dr. Marks reinforced, in looking at the totality of the evidence presented, we can clearly say that it was, in general, safe, including the long-term safety follow-up in the study, and because of its effectiveness, it helped to prevent serious consequences of the, of the, of the viral infection. But we don't know whether that attribute continues to be relevant today. Dr. Levy's important question about the potential of cross-protecting immunity and the limited data that we've seen in response to that are certainly encouraging. But again, we don't really know whether it's likely to be effective going forward and what the duration of that protection might be. In the flu world, we're always challenged by mismatch. Is the vaccine that's being made and distributed likely to be a good match for the flu virus that's likely to circulate? This vaccine, and that's essentially the question here, this vaccine has, has incredible potential. And a lot has been learned about it that we didn't hear about. That's likely to inform the durability of protection, transmission, the impact of boosting, adjustments to the dosage interval, the impact of mix and match, and it's importantly, in impact against circulating variants. So therefore, I want to be clear that I'm not voting against this vaccine, because I did worry that such a vote would, uh, would be misinterpreted, and hence this, con this conditional vote. Uh, for it, but as, but as an abstention. But as this is a real product that, if authorized, will be used, and it will be important to evaluate whatever data is available that can, can give its incense, insights into its performance, not just voting on the science that tells about its promise. Um, so recognizing we're an advisory committee and we're advising FDA. And we know that FDA, as we heard from Dr. Marks and others, will continue to work with the company on some of the manufacturing issues, and our discussions today are just part of what they will consider going forward in their discussion, in their decisions on authorization. So my conditional vote yes is based on my expectation that the FDA will review the totality of, of the data that will be available to them, including the data that we didn't see today, to inform their authorization decision. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gill and Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Monto. And certainly with the question posed before us, do the benefits outweigh the risk? I'm entirely supportive of a yes there. It does come with a little bit of caveats because included in that question was specific reference to the two-dose primary vaccine. I think this group was in full recognition that this is probably a three-dose series and that they'll need to accumulate data supporting the need for booster doses and subsequent doses to probably make it a three-dose vaccine. But to address the question on the table, certainly the benefits outweigh the risk for a primary series. I also want to make reference to use Dr. Mark's words from this morning that this vaccine does indeed fill some unmet needs. So you didn't ask us specifically how to apply these to the EUA criteria. But I'll offer my humble opinion in that I do feel that it does offer something for fulfilling unmet needs, including those populations who have hesitancy with regards to the messenger RNA vaccines. As an allergist, it offers me an additional tool for individuals who have hypersensitivity responses to initial doses of the messenger RNA vaccines. And there are other advantages that have been referred to today, including storage, uh, who knows, even with supply chain challenges down the road, it will be nice to have these options going forward. I'll offer one other additional word uh, with respect to myopericarditis. I've done some work uh, in the Department of Defense and we'll be publishing our work on long-term outcomes of myopericarditis with the smallpox vaccine shortly. Uh, this is a, an important question and should not be ignored. And I will say, Dr. Fink, with, the, with utmost confidence that it would be a travesty if we didn't mention it in the EUA documentation for the public to show the concern that we have. Is there evidence that it's a true causal link at a significantly high relative risk? I have my own doubts there, as we've heard from the sponsor as well. But to be silent on the matter, I think, would be a travesty. I also think we should be focusing on the mechanism, as has been discussed, but also to put more effort into identifying 
what happens with subclinical uh, appearance of myopericarditis. Our signals are those who get admitted to the emergency room in the hospital. I'm quite convinced that there are others who are experiencing cardiac events of a lesser senior, uh, severity that are worthy of being studied, both from a mechanistic and outcome standpoint. So we have a lot of work to do, and uh, I hope this committee and the focus of the FDA and the NIH remain on uh, myopericarditis with all vaccine platforms. And I appreciate the opportunity to express this opinion, Dr. Monta. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Dr. Portnoy. Ooh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was a little bit uh, torn when I first uh, started this committee this morning. I was a little bit skeptical about the need for an emergency use authorization of this vaccine since we have two other vaccines that are highly effective and uh, relatively safe. Um, and so I was very skeptical about that. We've had those vaccines for a year and a half. If this vaccine had come up for discussion a year and a half ago, there would have been no problem at all getting it approved. Uh, I'm pretty sure the committee would have just voted enthusiastically yes, but now we've got these other vaccines. Is there really a need for an additional vaccine? So that, that's what I was torn about, but I realized that this is a different um, um, uh, technology. It's a more traditional protein-based vaccine. Uh, I'm very skeptical that vaccine-hesitant people will select to get this vaccine because of that. I, I'm good friends with a number of vaccine-hesitant people, and their uh, hesitancy is more ideological than technological. So I don't, I don't, I really doubt that this vaccine is going to crack that nut. But perhaps some individuals would get this when they wouldn't get the other ones. I see this as an opportunity to. Uh, widely vaccinate people with the protein vaccine and to compare it with mRNA vaccines, which are relatively new technologies, because we know how protein-based vaccines work. We don't know how mRNA vaccines work. This is an opportunity to find out how they compare to each other uh, in, over the long term uh, when large numbers of people get vaccinated. So I, I see this as an opportunity. I agree that the benefits definitely outweigh the risks. Whether it meets the needs for emergency use, I'm not totally convinced, but I feel that it's at least uh, it was worth uh, voting yes in this case because um, the vaccine deserves the opportunity to be given and studied and used by individuals who wish to, to use this vaccine. Uh, th thank you for uh, having such a transparent and open meeting, and I do want to thank the organizers of this uh, meeting for uh, holding it the, the way that, that you do. You do an excellent job, so thank you. Thank you. Dr. Meisner. Thank you, uh, Dr. Montel. I just want to note that the messenger RNA vaccines are truly remarkable. I mean, they are a great gift uh, to humanity, and they were the first to cross the finish line. But whether or not they will turn out being the optimal vaccine for these viruses is not clear. And I think it's, I also want to recognize uh, the, the perseverance from the people at Novavax for developing um, this vaccine with a novel uh, platform, because I think it's we still need uh, new vaccines. I don't think we want to rest on just what, what we have at this point, because there's always an opportunity to improve on a vaccine. And we've talked about several of those issues, such as sterilizing immunity and the duration of the immune response and the breadth of uh, the immune response. And so I certainly think we want to continue to encourage the development of uh, new vaccines, despite the, the wonderful spot that, that, that we find ourselves in today with, with the two uh, messenger RNA vaccines. And I would also, just in response to Dr. Nelson's comment, again, I just want to reiterate, I, I agree there does appear to be a causal association with the Novavax vaccine, but there's a causal association with the messenger RNA vaccine also. So I get, my point is I don't want to uh, 
uh, stigmatize this vaccine inappropriately relative to the messenger RNA vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meisner. Dr. Marasco. Yes, yeah, so I think to, to the question posed today, um, you know, I think that the uh, benefits certainly outweigh the risks. My, my sort of, um, you know, I voted yes because I feel that that's really the question that we will pose. I, I remain somewhat concerned um, about, you know, the timing of the rollout of this. Um, I know many of you have to be similar to, to me. Um, the public knows that there is talk amongst the FDA uh, about reformulating the vaccines in the fall to be uh, more Omicron-centric, if you will. And the real question is, for the people that are vaccine hesitant, are they going to say, you know, great, we, we finally have a protein-based vaccine like we're familiar with, or is the question going to be, but should we do it now with an ancestral strain or wait until the fall when um, the company itself has said they're investigating it? So I think, you know, on balance, uh, we need to get these new vaccine platforms out there. I think there's some certain advantages to the adjuvanted vaccine that I'd like to see more about as we get more data. But it is a concern that I have in my mind about, you know, we're rolling this out. We're having a discussion two weeks before we're having another discussion about formulations for the fall. And although no decision has been made, it'll be an active topic of discussion. So, um, you know, overall, I applaud the company for having the perseverance uh, to getting this platform and the vaccine out. But there are some questions I think remain in my mind. Thank you, Dr. Marasco. That's the, that's the last explanation of vote we have. I would like to turn the meeting over to Prabha, who will ask Dr. Marks to give some closing remarks. And thank you all for a very vigorous and uh, productive meeting. So over, over to you. I think you're muted. Uh, yep, probably you double muted. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mancho. Dr. Uh, Mark, do you want to uh, address the committee and uh, uh, make some closing remarks? And then we can adjourn the meeting. Yeah, no, th thank you very much. First, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, the committee members for a, uh, a very uh, good discussion today. Um, also want to thank uh, the sponsor, the open public hearing speakers, again, they all contribute to uh, what is an important open process, um, transparent process here. Um, really appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, we will do our best um, to continue to work towards uh, keeping technical glitches down to a minimum. Thank you for your patience with those. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Atreya and the advisory committee staff, they did a wonderful job preparing things for this meeting. Uh, and then the entire uh, clinical team uh, and, and the uh, others that were involved um, uh, from the various offices in the center preparing for this uh, advisory committee, which took a lot of work. Uh, and uh, as you're aware, there are some coming attractions of additional ones. So there's been um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of work going on. Thank you to everyone for that. Thank you uh, to the, the to those who have tuned in today. Um, we very much appreciate that. Um, we will uh, uh, again lo look forward to uh, working through uh, uh, what's been said today uh, and uh, moving forward. Um, and uh, just appreciate everyone's uh, input today. Um, Prabh, I can turn it back over to you. Thank you again to everyone. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marx, and I would also like to extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Arnal Mancho uh, for, for
for conducting the meeting very smoothly and then also all the members who have been patiently uh, working together and so it's a, such a productive meeting thank you so much and uh, uh, i also thank mike uh, kalinski for facilitating this meeting and christina ward for doing the voting process very effectively so thank you and this me meeting is adjourned now and have a good evening Hold on while we clear.